Age 756. A battle for the ages comes to an end. Piccolo Jr., son of the feared Demon King versus Son Goku, a savior from beyond the stars. As the two combatants lie bloodied and battered, a third figure enters the fray. Kami, mentor to Goku and spiritual other half to Piccolo. He is determined to end the demon's reign permanently, and so raises a hand to blow Piccolo away, even if it will mean his death as well. From the ground, Goku yells at Kami to stop, but the Guardian of Earth's mind is made up, and so with a look back at his pupil, the old Namekian implores Goku to look after the Earth in his stead, then fires his blast. Piccolo screams, but it's already too late and he is promptly disintegrated. Above him, Kami feels himself fading away as well, and so with the last of his strength, he lays a hand on Goku's head, formally transferring the guardianship of Earth before dying in peace, his worst mistake now righted at last. As Kami's cane clatters to the ground, Goku and his friends look on in shock, barely able to believe what had happened. Yajirobe is the first to speak, giving Goku a senzu bean and asking what he plans to do now. Goku sighs that he doesn't have much of a choice. Though he didn't want to become Earth's guardian, he will honor Kami's last wish and take up the position. He then calls down Nimbus, preparing to head back up to the lookout, but is stopped by the feeling of two soft hands in his. It is Chi Chi looking up at him with pleading eyes. She asks what's to become of their plans for marriage, and Goku shrugs that he doesn't know, but nonetheless, he offers for her to come with him while they figure it out. And so the Saiyan and his fiance bid goodbye to their friends, setting off for Kami's lookout, or they suppose now, Goku's lookout. When they arrive, Mr. Popo is saddened to hear of Kami's death, but not entirely surprised considering the former Guardian's feelings towards his evil half. Goku is happy to learn that there is no rule prohibiting Guardians from marrying, and so he and Chi Chi are wed the next day high atop the world. From there they settle into their new life, with Goku undergoing much study and training for his new position as Guardian. The Lookout's library has proven valuable for this, and so Goku comes to know about the secrets of the Earth, as well as the higher realms of the gods. He also learns of his new abilities granted by a modicum of godly key that all Guardians possess, including the ability to create objects out of thin air, and the ability to travel back and forth between other world. Here he meets his direct superiors, King Kai and King Yemma, both of whom greatly excite the hero, as he can sense their strength. However, he is unable to train with them while work on Earth requires his attention. Meanwhile, Chi Chi settles into a similar role to what she does in canon, though with Mr. Popo to assist her, which frees up enough time that she can continue her martial arts training with her husband in the genie, though she is much less judicious about this than Goku is. Gohan is born around the same time as canon, though due to his father being guardian, he is born with some innate traces of god key and a somewhat higher power level. Another key difference is that Chi Chi allows Goku and Mr. Popo to occasionally give Gohan's lesson in martial arts. Her reasoning being that since Kami and Goku are both martial artists, it may be a prerequisite for guardianship. And make no mistake, it is Chi Chi's fondest wish that Gohan one day become guardian, not out of any particular reverence for the position, but rather for the sake of ambition. After all, a son who is a scholar is impressive, but it is nothing compared to a son who is literally God, or at least the God of Earth. Nonetheless, most of Gohan's time is still spent studying, with Chi Chi capitalizing on the Lookout's library and the secrets it holds which no other human would ever know. So, while the boy is more powerful than in canon, he is nowhere near his father or Mr. Popo as of yet. The first major challenge to Goku's reign as Guardian comes roughly five years into his tenure, when a pod comes crashing to Earth. Using his divine sight, Goku is able to see this invader and sense the evil in his heart. But in an attempt to follow Kami's example, he stays up on the lookout, trusting his friends to handle this new threat. Gritting his teeth, Goku watches as this giant of a man with a tail much like his own accosts an innocent farmer, then flies off in search of the highest power level he can find. With Piccolo dead and Goku's power obscured by the magic of the lookout, the source of power that Raditz tracks is none other than Tien. Knowing that Tien is no match for him, Raditz grills the Triclops over the location of his brother Kakarot, but Tien protests that he doesn't know anyone by that name. Raditz snarls that's a shame, since that information was the only thing keeping the human alive, before firing a small key bolt which blows a hole in Tien's side. Tien drops to the ground, and Raditz sneers that he's not even worth finishing off when he can just allow nature to take its course. He then taps his scouter once more, and after confirming that no one stronger or even on par with Tien is in range, Raditz concludes that Kakarot must have died a long time ago. He then declares that he guesses it falls to him to finish his brother's job and clear away the human scum so that Lord Frieza can sell this world, before flying off in search of a population center to destroy. 
This proves too much to Goku. With the Dragon Ball's gone, he cannot afford to allow this monster to go on a rampage. And so even if it's not what Kami would have done, he knows he has to intervene. Silently apologizing to the spirit of the former Guardian, Goku leaps off the lookout, stopping first at Korin's tower, where the cat is happy to provide his new boss with a crop of sensu beans before flying at top speed to Tien's side. Even at his best, Goku is almost too late to save Tien, and as he kneels down to give the fallen warrior a bean, he urges him to gather the others, since if his read on this guy is right, he is stronger than any foe they've ever faced before. Goku doesn't even wait for a reply, flying in pursuit of Raditz, and thankfully catching up to him before he can harm anyone else. The invading sand is struck dumb by this appearance, not sure how his brother could have blindsided him like this. Nonetheless, he hails Goku, calling him Kakarot, but is greeted by hostility as Goku orders him to leave now or face the consequences. Raditz jeers that this is a pathetic bluff, since when they last met his power level was a measly 2, and on a weak backwater world like this, he wouldn't have been able to gain any significant gains. But that doesn't matter, since he promises that once they exterminate this world and meet up with the other Saiyans, he will come to learn the true meaning of power. Or rather, he attempts to promise this, right up until an elbow slams him in the face. Recoiling and clutching his broken nose with one hand, Raditz screams that this was just a lucky hit, and that Kakarot won't get another. Raditz is immediately proved wrong when Goku sheds his training weights and is able to move so fast that the long-haired San cannot even track him as he drives a knee into Raditz's stomach. Hunched over in pain now, Raditz begins to accept the truth and so taps his scatter at once the display comes up 3,322. Now, before we continue the brutal beating of Raditz, I feel it's important to explain this figure, since Goku's power difference between the end of the King Piccolo saga and the Piccolo Jr. saga is never stated, I used the difference in the human's power levels before and after training with Kami for a year. I then averaged this out and multiplied Goku's power level in the Piccolo Jr. saga by that number. I know an argument could be made that Goku should have a higher power level since he trained for five times as long and has greater potential, but considering unlike the humans, Goku wasn't training full time due to his guardian responsibilities, his training was at a more leisurely pace considering there was no threat, and also the fact that he only had Mr. Popo Chi Chi and Toddler Gohan as sparring partners, which would yield diminishing results after a while, I think that number is a fair estimate of his growth. Nonetheless, this is more than twice Raditz's power, so the Saiyan warrior has no chance against the pure-hearted Guardian. Before long, Raditz is on his knees, bloodied and beaten, his scatter and armor in pieces, while Goku readies himself to deliver the killing blow, having internalized Kami's final lesson that some threats to Earth simply cannot be allowed to live. Being well acquainted with trickery as a means of survival, Raditz begs for mercy, crying that they're brothers and he came here to collect him from this world. Goku retorts that he said he was going to exterminate humanity, but Raditz explains that he didn't really want to, that he's nothing but a slave under the heel of the tyrant Frieza, just like all the other Saiyans, including their father. Goku's expression softens fractionally, and he orders Raditz to explain. Raditz, after confirming that his scatter really is destroyed, hastily tells Goku that he and the other two Sans have been plotting for years to overthrow Frieza, but they've never had the strength to do so, even though both Vegeta and Nappa are stronger than the brothers combined. So that was the true purpose of his mission, to collect Kakarot, just like he said, and together they could find a way to defeat Frieza. Goku is excited by the prospect of fighting such a powerful foe, but after witnessing his predecessor give his life to protect the planet, he is not going to be so willing to abandon it at the first chance, and so tells Raditz that he will help, but under two conditions. The first is that he and the other Saiyans give up their evil ways, and the second is that they prepare here on Earth so he can keep up his duties as Guardian. Raditz agrees on both conditions, though with no intention of following the former. He simply plans to use whatever secret Kakarot has found for power growth on himself, and if it's as exponential as it was on his pathetic power level of 2, then Raditz won't need Kakarot or any of the other Saiyans to defeat Frieza. But for now he must bide his time, and so he humbly accepts Goku's offer of mercy. By now the other Z fighters have assembled, with Raditz thinking he's pretty sure he killed the three-eyed one earlier. Funny, he thought he was better at squishing bugs than this, but maybe it's got something to do with Kakarot's insane growth. Based on the looks on the Earthlings' faces, none of them are very happy to see him, with Krillin demanding to know why Goku hasn't finished this guy off yet. Goku explains that Raditz is his brother, and he's only a bad guy because an evil alien dictator forced him to be. Raditz nods along, trying to look penitent, but he can tell at least the Triclops doesn't buy it. 
left. So it makes it mention her to kill him for real before he leaves this mud ball. However, despite their distrust for Raditz, the other Z fighters do trust Goku's judgement. And more than that, they trust that as Guardian he has Earth's best interests at heart, and so ask what they should do now. Goku explains that there are two others like him and Raditz they may need to locate. But Raditz smiles there's no need. Since his scout was destroyed, his comrades will surely assume that he was killed and so come here to avenge him within a year, adding that since they are multiple times stronger than him, it would be wise to increase their power levels as much as possible in case the other Saiyans launch an attack. Raditz grins, as like the fools that they are, Kakarot and the Earthlings agree to this, and offer him to train with them. This is an entirely alien concept to Raditz, but if this is Kakarot's secret he won't turn it down. Goku then looks to his friends, saying he supposes it's time that he trained them like Kami trained him if they're going to be facing off against aliens. The Earthlings agree, and so Goku has them all gather around him as he summons Popo's carpet to bring them home. However, instead of travelling directly to the lookout, Goku makes a stop first in the sacred land of Korin at the base of Korin's tower. He then tells Raditz to climb this pole all the way to the top, but not to cheat by using flying or making use of any key. The elder brother demands to know why, and Goku explains it's good training, which all of them have already done. Grumbling, Raditz agrees, and steps off the flying carpet as Goku and his friends vanish. Meanwhile, Goku and the others arrive back on the lookout, where Mr. Popo and Chi Chi are waiting with shared looks of concern on their face. Goku giggles that they shouldn't look so worried, everything is fine, but Chi Chi, who has learnt to sense energy up here on the lookout, tells him that she can still sense that strong evil key now just below them. Goku replies that it's his brother Raditz, and he's on his way to train with Master Korin before he comes up here to train with all of them. Chi Chi snaps there's no way she's letting some bad guy near her go, Han, even if he is Goku's brother. Which makes Goku snap his fingers like he's had an epiphany, and he says that he remembers that he wants her and Gohan to join them all in training. Chi Chi crosses her arms, saying that some light training with him or Popo is one thing, but to have Gohan train with his friends at their level is way too dangerous. Goku pleads that it's important since they might have to fight two more Saiyans in a year, but this is exactly the wrong thing to say, as Chi Chi swiftly picks up Goku's guardian staff and smacks him over the head with it, reminding him that Gohan is four years old and so will not be fighting any evil spacemen. Tentatively, Goku suggests that he might be five by the time the Saiyans come, but this makes no difference, simply earning Goku another head whack before his wife storms away. As Goku and Mr. Popo get down to business beginning the humans training, Raditz finally reaches the top of Korin's tower, having only taken about ten minutes thanks to his exceptional power by Earth standards. But even power doesn't prepare him for what he finds when he reaches the top, a fluffy white cat and a portly samurai playing shogi. The cat greets Raditz lackadaisically, saying that his name is Master Corrin, and if he heard right, Goku wants him to undertake the same training he and the others did years ago. Raditz nods curtly, and Corrin fills a clay pot with water which he instructs Raditz to take from him, calling it the Divine Water. Unfortunately, this trick doesn't work super well against a person who can fly at the speed of sound. And before Corrin can even move, Raditz is sculling the water, saying it tastes like simple tap water to him. Not wanting this whole thing to be a bust, Corrin sighs that he must have gotten the wrong batch, and so fills up another pot, telling Raditz to take this one as well. Once more, Raditz is able to do this with ease, and so Corrin sees no choice but to send Raditz on his way up to the lookout, telling Yajirobe to go with them to keep their new friend company. Now it's Yajirobe's turn to look miffed, but he does as he's told, and so he and Raditz begin to climb up the power pole. Even for Raditz, this is an arduous climb, and he finds himself quite tired by the time he reaches the top and finds a genie sparring with three of the Earthlings at once, while Kakarot supervises. When he sees his brother, Goku welcomes Raditz over, asking how his training with Korin went. Yajirobe shakes his head that it was a dud since Raditz was too strong already, to which Goku shrugged that it was worth a shot, making Raditz's blood boil this oath sent him on a fool's errand while his friends got to train, even if it was only a brief detour. He then demands that Kakarot spar with him now, which Goku agrees to, creating more weighted clothing to replace his lost set and taking his fighting stance. Weighed down, Goku's power is comparable to Raditz, which causes the older Saiyan to say that he doesn't understand why the other would willingly weaken himself. Goku explains the concept of training weights, and Raditz surmises it must be to counter the weak gravity on this world, explaining how planet Vegeta and many other worlds have much higher gravity, approximately ten times the gravity on Earth. This fascinates Goku, who asks Popo if there's anything they can do to simulate this, and the genie replies that the chamber meets those conditions, all the while never dropping his guard against the human's attacks. The Guardian seems less than pleased by this response, almost pensive, and when Raditz asks what he means, Goku says it's something that won't help them now, and they should stick to training with weights. 
Reddit tries to press the issue, but is stopped by his brother swinging the first punch. Saiyan blood pumping, Reddit pushes the question out of his mind, his thoughts now on this fight, as he throws himself at Kakarot. Later that evening, when all the training is done, Goku and his family along with the humans all sit down for a feast. Raditz is also there, but he hangs back, skulking in the corner and gnawing his drumstick down to the bone. Goku urges him to come join them, citing the old turtle school maxim that eating plenty is part of becoming a great martial artist, but Raditz scoffs this off, merely grabbing out the drumstick then returning to his corner, only to find that someone else is occupying it. A little boy with a tail. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that this must be Kakarot's brat, and so Raditz asks him as much, leering down at Gohan from his considerable height. Gohan, however, is not afraid of his uncle, introducing himself warmly and commenting how nice it is to meet someone else with a tail. Raditz is caught off guard by this innocence, and so tells Gohan that on their homeworld everyone had tails, and they were mighty warriors who conquered the stars. Gohan doesn't seem to care much for this, saying he'd rather be a protector than a conqueror, eliciting a scoff from Raditz that Kakarot and his woman have raised this child to be the opposite of a proud Saiyan warrior. Gohan just smiles that maybe Unki Raditz can teach him about Saiyan sometime, before sauntering off a happy wag in his tail. The next day and every day that follows for the next several months play out in a similar fashion, with Raditz and Goku sparring under increasingly heavy weights while Popo trains the humans. Eventually Gohan and Chi Chi do join in with the humans, Goku having pleaded with Chi Chi that it's beneficial for Gohan's training to one day be guardian, and Chi Chi wanting to stay close to her son in case anything goes wrong. Meanwhile, the nights are often spent relaxing together as a big happy family, that is on the nights where they aren't too exhausted from training to speak. At first, Raditz takes no part in these gatherings, choosing solitude like he did on the first night, but Gohan continues to pester him to tell him stories about the Saiyan race and his adventures in space. Raditz can't help but feel fondly towards the kid who for the first time treats him as neither an enemy nor a slave, and so starts opening up ever so slightly, even if he still thinks he's weird for lacking any semblance of Saiyan pride. By the end of the second month of training, he will occasionally join Gohan for meals, and by the end of the fourth, he doesn't even have to be invited. Around the six month mark, the humans and Gohan reach a point where their power can rival Mr. Popo, and so Goku deems them ready to begin training with himself and Raditz. The group then begins splitting into pairs for sparring, with Gohan often choosing Raditz as his preferred partner. Goku also makes use of the lookout's facilities, having the group use the pendulum room to mentally travel back in time for practice battles. Thanks to Raditz's presence, Goku is able to use his brother's memories to create versions of Vegeta and Nappa for the group to battle in the room, thus allowing themselves to familiarize with the Saiyan's tactics and power. By now Goku has come to trust Raditz, feeling most of the evil fall away from his heart. Though darkness still dwells there, he can feel it lessening with every day, and so when the group finally can hold their own against Phantom Vegeta, Goku finally shares with them the lookout's last secret, the hyperbolic time chamber. Goku explains the time dilution of the room as best he can, though since he's not exactly a mathematician, Popo has to take over midway. The genie also explains the limitation of the room, specifically the lack of food meaning only two people can enter if they wish to make use of a full year, as well as the fact that there is a two year limit for each person. If a person is inside for more than two years, the door will vanish and they will be trapped forever. Goku asks if he can fix these issues, and Popo promises to try, The warns it will take time, probably more time than they have before the Saiyans arrive, so for now they'll have to manage their time in the chamber carefully. Everyone agrees and so begins dividing up in pairs, Chiaotsu decides not to enter, thinking the conditions will likely be too intense, and so decides to work on improving his telekinetic techniques instead. Yajirobe tries to skive off as well, but Chi Chi stops him, saying that if he drops out too there will be an uneven number of training partners. Goku is pleased to see that his wife doesn't even consider pulling Gohan out to even the numbers, which in the past he's certain she would have done, since by now the boy has proven his resilience and deservedness to be a part of this group a hundred times over. The final teams are as follows, Goku and Raditz, Tien and Yamcha, Krillin and Yajirobe, and finally Chi Chi and Gohan. The two fully human teams go first, but neither can stand more than three months apiece in the endless crushing void. Chi Chi at this point begins to reconsider her decision to go in with Gohan, but Goku comes up with an idea that he and Raditz join Gohan and Chi Chi in the chamber with a goal of training for six months. That way their food should last, and he can be there to support his wife and son, a compromise which Chi Chi accepts even if she still is a bit leery about Raditz being near Gohan. 
Tien is then deputized as the interim guardian for a few hours, while the family enter the room of spirit and time. The endless whiteness of the void beyond their living quarters is hard for the four of them to comprehend, while the gravity puts Chi Chi and Gohan on their knees as soon as they step outside. Goku fares a little bit better, having been in here briefly and possessing greater power than back then, but even still it takes him a few hours to really get his bearing, while for Raditz this is normal. Here he is able to earn a few brownie points with Chi Chi, giving Gohan some tips on how to adjust to the increased gravity, recounting how once Frieza sent him and the others to a world with 50 times Earth's natural gravity. Nonetheless, it takes the group about a day to all be up and moving around the time chamber, and another day or two before they can move unencumbered. From here, training resumes, often with Goku and Raditz acting in the place of Vegeta and Nappa to help Chi Chi and Gohan for potential 2v2 combat. But power is not the only thing growing. At night, while Goku and Raditz train as the other two sleep, they begin to bond and share stories of their pasts, with Goku telling his brother about his adventures growing up, while Raditz tells the much sadder story of his life of servitude under Vegeta and Frieza. This allows the pair to truly come to understand each other, and for Raditz to put aside the last of his plans to betray Goku. Honestly, he had known he wasn't going to for a while, but this is where the matter is settled. After all, he couldn't leave the brat fatherless. He knew what that was like all too well. Raditz and Gohan also bond when it's their turns to train together, to the point where Raditz even passes on his signature techniques to the boy. Raditz and Chi Chi never become close, but a mutual respect grows here, to the point where she is comfortable leaving her son in his uncle's care unsupervised. When their six months are up, the family depart the chamber with their bodies exhausted but their spirits and power at an all-time high. From there, training resumes as per normal, though Gohan begins to gravitate more towards the other Saiyans while training, since none of the humans can match him anymore. There is one final preparation Goku makes in the lead up to the invasion of the Saiyans, and that is to offer Raditz to drink the Ultra Divine Water. Unlike the first time with the Divine Water, this is an offer rather than an order, and Goku gives Raditz the full story of how dangerous the water can be, but also the power it can grant him if he survives. He does not offer this to anyone else, having concluded from what Raditz told him about Saiyan physiology that the only reason he was able to survive the water's effects is because of his heritage. Raditz, thanks to his Saiyan pride, agrees, heading back down to Corrin's tower. Goku watches over his brother during the following days as the water takes effect, and it pains him to see someone he has come to care about suffer like this, but nonetheless he has faith in his fellow Saiyan warrior, a faith which is rewarded three days later when Raditz returns to the lookout, his power closing in on Goku's. The day of the Saiyan invasion comes, and then passes, as does the next day, and the next, which becomes a week, and then a month. In this time, Raditz is forced to face a rather difficult truth, that Vegeta and Nappa aren't coming to avenge him, that they literally do not care if he lived or died here on Earth. It is a humbling thought, made more humbling by the realization that the people on the lookout who met him originally as an enemy have treated him better than his own kind ever did. That night, Raditz lays all this out to Goku, confessing his original plan to manipulate him and begging his forgiveness. Goku gives this freely, having seen how Raditz had changed over their 18 months together. However, he is not ready to give up on the idea of recruiting the other Saiyans and ridding the galaxy of Frieza, and so asks Raditz if he has any other way of contacting his allies. Raditz replies that though his scouter was destroyed in their initial battle, his pod still has a transmitter, so perhaps that could be used to contact Vegeta and Nappa's pods, if they are within the quadrant. Goku says it'll have to do, and so the brothers depart for Raditz's landing site. By good fortune, the radio transmitter is still intact, and so Reddit sends out a call to Vegeta and Nappa. For a few hours, they receive no response, but just as they're about to call it quits, the acerbic voice of Vegeta barks through the speaker, growling that he thought Reddit was dead, and demanding to know where the little rat has been hiding for the last year. Raditz replies that he's on a world called Earth, and asks the prince to rendezvous with him ASAP, since he found his brother Kakarot. Vegeta sounds unimpressed, but Raditz cuts him off, an act which incenses the prince, but it's worth it a moment later when Raditz says something Vegeta never would have imagined, that he believes Kakarot to be the legendary Super Saiyan. Though Vegeta doesn't believe this for a second, he is wise enough to know that if Raditz is telling the truth, then this might be the weapon he needs to kill Frieza. Conferring briefly with Nappa, the Prince of All Saiyans tells Raditz to transmit the coordinates, and they should be there within a matter of weeks. Raditz does as he's told, and the two spacefaring Saiyans punch them into their pod's navigation systems, tearing off towards Earth. Little do they know that there are another set of eyes scanning these coordinates as a sinister smile crests a pair of cruel reptilian lips.
A month has passed since Raditz and Goku made contact with the Saiyans, and for every moment since the Z Fighters have awaited their arrival with bated breath. Thanks to Raditz and the power of the Pendulum Room, they have been able to train with a facsimile of Vegeta and Nappa, and so believe that as a group they stand a good chance if the Saiyans prove to be hostile. However, after seeing Goku, Gohan and Raditz's growth in the span of a year, they are also aware that the two incoming aliens may have grown in power beyond their wildest dreams. With this in mind, Goku and Raditz continue to train together, while the others return to their lives, believing they have achieved as much as they will be able to before the arrival of the Saiyans. And here I feel is a good time to talk about power levels. I admit I had a bit of trouble calculating these powers since the training the humans and Sans underwent is unlike anything they did in canon, which I could have used as a reference. Thankfully my friend Plus Ultraman, who is a better and more experienced DBZ whatever than me, came to my rescue, and together we were able to conclude that the power levels would be as follows. The weakest would be Chaozu at 732, since he refused to enter the time chamber and so only gained a little bit more power than in canon thanks to the presence of a stronger teacher and training partners. Next up would be Yajirobe at 1746, then Chi Chi at 1843. After her would be the three main human Z fighters, Yamcha with a power level of 3000, Krillin with 3150, and topping the lot, Tien, with 3300. Though still a child, Gohan would have a power level of 8050, by virtue of his extended stay in the hyperbolic time chamber, as well as his immense hybrid potential. As for Goku and Raditz, well, you'll find out their powers soon in a way much more fun than me just listing off numbers. When the fated day comes, it is Goku, Gohan, Chi Chi and Raditz who sense the Saiyans first from the lookout. Thankfully, they are still roughly on par with Raditz's estimations, but nonetheless, Goku instructs Chi Chi and Gohan to stay behind since the Saiyans are meant to be coming in peace. Gohan protests, but Goku kneels down to look his son in the eye and tells him that Earth needs someone up here to watch over it, and should the worst possible outcome occur, he and his mother will be the planet's last hope. Tears sparkle in the boy's eyes at this thought, and so Raditz steps in, patting him on the head and saying that there probably won't be a fight anyway, so all he's missing out on is boring grown-up talk. In spite of these claims, Goku does reach out telepathically to his friends, urging them to join him and Raditz at the wasteland they gave the Saiyans as coordinates for a landing site, though instructs them to hang back a bit, since they don't want to make the volatile Saiyans think they've walked into an ambush. And so it is that Tien, Chaozu, Yamcha and Krillin land a ways away, while Goku and Raditz touch down directly in front of Vegeta and Nappa's pods. Goku is dressed in full guardian regalia for the meeting, even carrying his old power pole, while Raditz is in a fully restored version of his Saiyan armor, courtesy of Mr. Popo's magic. The pair cut a striking figure, but as an extra precaution, they keep their powers suppressed. Vegeta and Nappa eventually clamber out from their pods, giving the brothers matching haughty expressions, their noses wrinkled in disgust as if a foul smell is filling the air. Nappa growls that he expected the legendary Super Saiyan to be taller and a lot less scrawny, but Vegeta silences him with a scoff, saying that Raditz's claim was obviously a lie to get them here, but unluckily for the runt, they're going to kill him for that deception. Nappa leers menacingly, but Raditz smirks that Vegeta wouldn't be able to if he tried, goading him to take a reading of their power levels with his scouter. Vegeta taps the button, if only to shut the mouthy mid-class up, and it blows up in his face. Literally. The scouter explodes the second Raditz stops concealing his power, and Vegeta staggers backwards, the number he saw just before detonation seemingly burned into his retina. Smirk widening, Raditz tells Vegeta that that's right, his power level is now 31,000 almost double the prince's, making him the strongest thing on this planet. Goku complains that he's only a thousand behind Raditz, and that's because he focused more on building Raditz's power than increasing his own, not to mention those two Zenkais he got from their initial battle and then the Ultra Divine Water. Raditz just chuckles back that that's too bad so sad, but he's still the world's strongest. By now Vegeta has had enough of this posturing, and so orders Nappa to put this blowhard's words to the test. The big brute rushes at Raditz, and the former weakling swats him aside with a single hit, sending him careening into a rock face. 
He then advises Nappa not to get back up, since as it stands, he's nearly ten times the bald man's power, so there'd be no challenge in beating him to a pulp, even if he has it coming for always looking down his nose at him. Nappa snarls that Raditz thinks he's so tough, but he wouldn't stand a chance against the mighty great ape. Raditz says that Nappa may be right, though only because he'd lose his mind if he went into that state. However, he believes Kakarot in his base form could still beat Nappa as a great ape. Nappa cackles darkly that he'd like to see the pipsqueak try, while Goku enthusiastically replies that if the form is as strong as Raditz says, he'd love to try fighting him in it. Nappa says it's Kakarot's funeral, and so implores Vegeta to create an artificial moon to allow him to transform. Vegeta begrudgingly agrees, and so forms the power ball in his hand, but Raditz yells at him to wait, before sitting down in a meditative position and closing his eyes. Vegeta jeers at Raditz, asking if he can't stand to watch Nappa obliterate his little brother, but Raditz just grins that he'll still be watching in ways that Vegeta cannot even imagine, and this is just so he doesn't ape out and cause unnecessary damage to the planet. Vegeta calls such sentimentality pathetic, but throws the orb into the air, allowing himself and Nappa to transform. At the sight of Great Ape Vegeta and Nappa, the humans come rushing in, assuming something has gone terribly wrong, but Goku tells them all to stay back, since this is just a little contest between himself and one of the Saiyans, so they can't interfere. As he takes a seat on a nearby mesa, Great Ape Vegeta lambasts Raditz, saying that he should have known he'd have backup waiting in the wings, since once a coward, always a coward. But Krillin, showing more guts than sense, yells back at the giant simian that they're the cowards if they need to resort to tricks, like becoming giant monkeys in order to challenge Goku. The other humans add their voices to Krillin's, and Raditz feels an overwhelming wave of fondness towards them. The battle is then allowed to begin, with Nappa lumbering towards his much smaller opponent, and swinging a fist downwards to crush him. But even with mental control over the form, the movements are still brutish and obvious, allowing the seasoned martial artist Goku to leap out of the way, before landing on Nappa's hairy forearm and running up it towards his shoulder. As he does so, Goku unsheathes his power pole and swings it in a wide circle, before bringing it down on the crook of Nappa's elbow, making the big monkey scream. He then fires off a pair of eye beams at Goku, causing the younger Saiyan to jump off and fly up towards Nappa's face, extending the power pole until it strikes the big brute between the eyes. As Nappa clutches his face, Goku delivers a swift scissor kick to his snout before following up with a punch that draws blood. Vegeta snarls that this shouldn't be possible. Even if Kakarot's power is roughly equivalent to Raditz's, Nappa in his great ape form should be stronger. But Tien speaks up this time, saying that Goku isn't just a warrior, he's a disciple of martial arts. And all these years of honing his technique have put him well above an artless bruiser. Being spoken down to by human filth really gets under Vegeta and Nappa's skin. Nappa declares he's going to end things with his ultimate technique. He then charges up a brake cannon in his mouth. Knowing that he can't dodge this one, Goku drops down to the ground and begins charging up a Kamehameha, before firing it just as Nappa fires his own attack. The two key blasts meet in the air between them, seeming to be a perfect match in power, until inch by inch, Nappa's begins to push through. This is where the difference in Goku and Nappa's strength becomes most apparent. While the giant cannot match the Guardian in terms of technique, he can overwhelm him with raw power, and so little by little, the break cannon pushes the Kamehameha back. Raditz is awed by the power on display by these two fighters, until another immense power catches his attention. Gohan, thanks to a year and a half spent with his uncle, has developed a slight Saiyanish streak in comparison to his canon counterpart, and so when mixed with his innate good nature and desire to help people, he is very unhappy with the idea of being left behind at the lookout. As a result, when he feels his father's power flare up as well as Nappa's, he does not hesitate to leap into action, rushing off to save Goku before Chi-Chi can stop him. However, one slight problem does present itself, that being the artificial moon. Though Raditz had warned of the dangers a full moon could pose to an untrained Saiyan during one of their many chats, Gohan had not been expecting to see one in the middle of the day, and so is caught unaware when one looms out from over a cliff, hovering just above where Goku and the others are. Blut's waves fill the boy's system, and he feels his mind slipping as an almost feverish delirium takes over him, mixing with an unquenchable fury. His body then begins to stretch and grow fur, that is until a vast shadow falls over Gohan. 
Unky Raditz, having sensed Gohan, puts himself between the boy and the artificial moon, blocking the reception of any further Blotz waves, and thus halting the transformation. The fur begins to dissipate, but the same cannot be said for the blood rage, and so with an incensed roar, Gohan begins to claw at Raditz's chest plate, not sure why he is angry at the big man, but knowing with all his being that he is. Raditz tries to hold the boy close to wait out the transformation, but this just exposes an arm for Gohan to sink his teeth into. Raditz tries to use his gauntlet to deflect this, but Gohan just bites cleanly through it, drawing blood. As the long-haired Saiyan howls in pain, Goku has to force himself not to look back, knowing that even the slightest distraction will surely cost him whatever small resistance he has against Nappa's onslaught. And so the two sons of Bardock continue their individual battles, with Raditz trying to calm Gohan down as he rages, while Goku tries to hold back a blast which could possibly destroy him, and even the planet if he is not careful. However, neither are especially successful, since Nappa seems to only be gaining strength from the pained expressions on Goku's face as he struggles, a sadistic grin splitting his great ape face. While even when the humans come to Raditz's aid, they are unable to completely shield Gohan from the Blotz waves reflecting off the ground and even some of their own bald heads. Raditz tells them to back off, since they'll only wind up getting themselves hurt, knowing the only way to fully purge the trace amounts of Blotz waves in Gohan's system is to destroy the fake moon. That or cut off the boy's tail, though for someone with pride in his Saiyan heritage, this is simply unthinkable. Likewise, Goku knows what he must do, and so drawing on his reserves of strength, powers up his blast, turning it into a Super Kamehameha. The blue beam then doubles in size, and this is enough to blow away the brake cannon and even knock Great Ape Nappa off his feet. As the brute falls, Raditz holds a Saturday crush at the power ball, the pinkish orb shattering the blue one, causing a man, not a monkey, to hit the ground. While at that same moment, Gohan goes limp in his uncle's arms, the blood's fever lifting at last. Vegeta fumes at his lackey being showed up, and declares that Raditz cheated like the coward he is, but Goku stands in defense of his brother, saying that Nap was already beaten. Knowing that this is probably true, the prince turns his vitriol on Goku instead, saying that he is hardly the legendary Super Saiyan, since even if he is strong, he is nothing compared to Frieza, so they're still up a creek without a paddle. Raditz, landing beside Goku, says that this isn't true, since the Earthlings have devised a form of training that allows a warrior to grow far beyond their birth power, citing his own growth as an example. Vegeta is loath to accept this, especially from a former underling, but his hatred for Frieza does manage to outweigh his disdain for Raditz, at least for the moment, and so through gritted teeth, he demands that the brothers explain. Goku and Raditz recount the story of their year of training, though they wisely exclude any mention of the hyperbolic time chamber, and instead put more emphasis on the growth they had by sparring and using training weights. Vegeta and a barely conscious Nappa reluctantly agree to try this, though they mention that increased gravity would likely yield better results than mere weights, since they're going to need to grow hundreds of times stronger if they have any chance against Frieza. Yamcha offers to try and have Bulma manufacture something like that, and Vegeta scoffs that he doubts an Earth Woman could manage such a thing, but orders Yamcha to have her try. Goku tells Vegeta that he can't talk to people like that if they're going to be allies, but Vegeta smirks that if Kakarot has an issue with him, he can settle it with his fists. Goku, however, is too wiped out from his fight with Nap to do anything of the sort, but laughs that even if he wasn't, it wouldn't be much fun, since judging by how the other Saiyans fight, he figures Vegeta wouldn't have any martial arts technique either. He then hits on the bright idea to have the two Saiyans train under Master Roshi while waiting for Bulma to build her gravity thingamajig. The humans give Goku a look, as if asking if he's sure that's such a good idea, but Goku beams that it'll help their growth later on, while also helping them acclimate to Earth. Not wanting to argue with the Guardian, Krillin volunteers to give the Master some forewarning and asks them to give him a few minutes head start. Goku nods and so waits until five minutes after Krillin has departed to begin leading Vegeta and Nappa to Kame House. Raditz comes along too, not trusting his former comrades not to attack Goku while he's weakened then try and conquer the planet, since that's exactly what he would have done when he first arrived. However, the Saiyans are on their best behavior, or at least they don't try to murder anyone on the flight over. And as the group near Kame House, Gohan awakens in his arms. 
Through a pounding headache, Gohan asks his uncle what happened. Reddit smirks that the boy had his first taste of fighting like a true Saiyan warrior. This stirs something in Gohan's mind, and like pieces of a bad dream, he begins to recall his actions during the haze of his cancelled transformation. Looking over at Raditz's arm, he sees that it's still bleeding with his teeth imprints in the gauntlet, and so tries to apologize. The long-haired Saiyan chuckles that it was only a flesh wound, and he's proud of the boy for his strength. But perhaps it would be worth getting some training on how to control his great ape form, so that he doesn't have to continuously double as a chew toy. When the group touch down on the beach outside Kame House, Krillin and Roshi are waiting for them, with the old turtle hermit greeting Goku warmly, having not seen him since he left to become Guardian. Goku in turn beams at his old mentor, asking if he could help train their new allies in martial arts. Roshi agrees, though he doesn't much like the aura coming off of Vegeta and Nappa, and so asks if Goku or one of the others could stay to lend a hand and make sure the two Saiyans don't cause any trouble. Raditz, much more humble than he was when presented with Corrin's training, offers to keep his former comrades in check, saying it would also be good for him to learn from the man who trained Kakarot. Gohan eagerly states that if Anki Raditz is staying, he will too, which Goku approves of, hoping his son will learn, grow, and have as much fun as he did under Master Roshi's tutelage. The Guardian then departs to return to his duties, leaving the three Saiyans, Gohan, and Roshi to begin their training. Roshi attempts to put the group through the same sort of training he put Goku and Krillin through as kids, but Vegeta and Nappa refuse to engage with such foolish activities, with even Raditz finding it embarrassing to deliver milk and scour the countryside for rocks, though he at least does his best for Gohan's sake. Recognizing that this is getting him nowhere fast, Roshi ultimately settles upon instructing them in just the basic forms of martial arts, though warns that until they can truly humble themselves like Goku, they will never become masters of the craft. Speaking of Goku, he is in the doghouse with Chi Chi for leaving their five-year-old son with a pair of untrustworthy space murderers and an old pervert, and so without even her to train with, he is forced to look elsewhere for new ways to improve himself. Thankfully, his status as Guardian provides our hero with just the resource he needs in the form of his ability to commune with King Kai. Though he cannot afford to go to the Kai's planet at this point in time, he is still able to undergo a new stage of training via telepathy while still monitoring the Earth to keep an eye on the Saiyans. Back with them, Vegeta and Nappa have continued to be problematic students for the Turtle Hermit, having the physical aptitude for martial arts, but not the disposition. Both are arrogant beyond belief, but on top of that they each also possess individual flaws that make them difficult to teach. In Nappa's case he is a great brute who fails to grasp the finesse and balance needed, while Vegeta is a roiling cauldron of impatience, who constantly challenges everything, from how this training will help him kill Frieza, to the value of martial arts as a discipline in comparison to raw strength training. Roshi tries his best to be patient with them, appealing to the discipline Nappa learned as a soldier to help him improve, while answering every question and challenge Vegeta hurls at him. Through this, he imparts his history as a martial artist, from his time as a student under Master Mutaito, to the return of Piccolo and the climactic clash with Piccolo Jr. that led to Goku becoming Guardian. Though this has little impact on Vegeta or Nappa beyond the concept of Dragon Balls intriguing them, it does inspire Gohan and Raditz, who have worked continuously to improve themselves under Master Roshi. As a result, Gohan and Reds complete the training that took Goku and Krillin eight months in a fraction of that time, and so return to the lookout well before the other two. This infuriates Vegeta who can see the gap between himself and the family of lowborn trash growing wider by the day, and so he redoubles his efforts, if only to assert his dominance and that he is truly the best of the Saiyans. This forces Nappa to match his liege's pace, and so before long, they reach a point where Roshi has nothing more that he can teach them. At least, not while they refuse to let go of their foolish pride. By this time, Bulma has completed the gravity machine, and Goku and Mr. Popo have combined their efforts to convert the nigh indestructible inside of the lookout into a training area. Finally, the pair of Saiyans are allowed to visit the home of the Guardian of Earth, being escorted by Popo's carpet from Kame House directly to the lookout. Neither are especially impressed, having seen the decadence of the Saiyan royal palace, and some of the Cold family's palaces on various worlds, though Nappa does note with something resembling praise that those flower beds would likely grow some incredible Cybermen. They are then led inside and into the gravity room, where Goku, Gohan, Raditz, Chi Chi, Tien, Yamcha, and Krillin are all waiting. 
Goku tells the group that the nine of them will be working together to prepare for an eventual battle with Frieza. He then adds for the newcomer's benefit that this simply won't be constant sparring, since that's not how Earthlings grow. It will also include exercise, meditation, and practicing techniques, similar to what they did with Roshi, though much more intense and under constantly increasing gravity. The humans then told the Saiyans that thanks to having a head start, they have acclimated to ten times Earth's natural gravity already, though they neglect to mention the time chamber being a factor, and so receive nothing but grunts of amusement from the Saiyans in return. And so a new time of training begins. Naturally, Vegeta and Nappa ignore the humans, and immediately try to challenge Goku and Raditz, but the brothers prove that they are still leagues ahead of the pair, and to add insult to injury, Raditz tells them with heavy disdain in his voice not to challenge him again, since they are not worth his time, and he would rather train with Gohan. Or Kakarot, both of whom are more warriors than the pair could ever hope to be. This stings Nappa, who had always felt at least some camaraderie towards his fellow Sand Warrior, even if he did belittle him to stay on the Prince's good side, while Vegeta is incensed at being looked down upon. As a result, they train the hardest out of anyone there, and try to push the gravity of the chamber higher than what the others can handle at every chance they can get, in pursuit of their own gains. This wins them no fans among the Earthlings, who begin to wonder if Goku and Raditz are stronger than them, why do they need these two at all? As much as he hates to do it, Raditz comes to the pair's defense here, saying that they can't fathom the true horror that is Frieza, and that they need every asset they can get, since even together at full strength, it may not be enough to stop the tyrant. Sadly, the truth of Raditz's words become apparent just a few days later. While resting between gravity training sessions, and planning how they might draw Frieza to Earth when the time comes, the humans, Goku, Gohan and Raditz all feel a sudden chill go down their spines. Among his possessions, Nappa's scouter blares before exploding just like Vegeta's did, and though no one says it, everyone knows what this must mean. Rushing to the lookout courtyard, our heroes can only watch in horror as a giant flying saucer ruptures the cloud cover before coming to a stop on the ground below. Frieza has arrived, and by the feel of things, he is not alone. Frieza is here. His spaceship has touched down in the sacred land of Corrin, and Goku, Gohan, Chi Chi, Raditz, Vegeta, Nappa, Krillin, Tien, and Yamcha can all sense several other evil keys surrounding the Emperors. Looking at the others, Goku tells them that though this is earlier than they may have wanted, they do have a plan for how to deal with Frieza, so they just need to stick to that. With varying levels of confidence, the defenders of Earth nod at Goku, and so the Guardian summons his faithful Nimbus Cloud to carry him down to the surface. On the ground, Goku is greeted by a small army, and at the head is a small reptilian figure with horns and purple Saiyan armor, as well as blood-red eyes that could kill. With his usual informality, Goku demands to know if this is Frieza, causing a muscle to twitch in the horned figure's jaw, as he states that he is Lord Frieza, Emperor of the Universe. Goku, however, ignores these titles, bluntly asking what he's doing on Earth. Frieza, in his usual tones of menace overlaid with a thin veneer of civility, says that he is here for two things that are rightfully his. The corpse for the Super Saiyan, and this planet's Dragon Balls, which he heard about through that oaf Nappa's scouter. Goku can almost hear Vegeta or Raditz lambasting their bald comrade for that slip-up, but the goings-on up at the lookout are not currently his concern, and so he keeps his eyes on the Emperor, telling him there is no Super Saiyan, and the Dragon Balls have been inert for years, so he's afraid that he He's made this trip for nothing. Coolly, Frieza calls this an obvious lie, warning Goku that attempting to deny him what he wants is an unwise course of action which will invariably result in death. However, if Goku is smart, he can profit instead, since he has been known to spare valuable inhabitants of the worlds he annexes, and offer them a place among his soldiers. In fact, if Goku delivers those Dragon Balls to him right now, he is willing to offer him a place in the Frieza Force. Just as informally as before, Goku replies with, No thanks, setting Frieza's jaw muscle to twitch once more. 
He then snarls that this is Goku's last chance to bring him the blasted balls. And knowing that Frieza isn't going to like his answer, Goku telepathically sends the signal up to the lookout. He then repeats his earlier statement that the balls have been inactive for years, earning him an angry tisk from the tyrant, who sighs that if Goku insists on being difficult, he'll just have his men raise this wall to the ground, and then hunt for the Dragon Balls among the ashes. He then makes a hand gesture, and half a dozen Freezer soldiers, followed by Zabon and Dodoria, exit the ship. Freezer casually instructs them to kill Goku as they go since he's become tiresome, but as the grunts approach the Guardian, a series of high-pitched shrieks from above make them look up. Raining down from the clouds are six Cybermen, courtesy of Nappa, and as they fall, each of them wraps around the face of a Freezer soldier before detonating. Thanks to the supernatural nutrients in the lookout soil, these Cybermen are several times stronger than the norm, and as the bodies of the soldiers hit the ground, the rest of our heroes appear behind Goku on Popo's carpet. All except for Krillin, who lands a few moments later, a fresh bag of Senzu beans clutched in his hand. Goku then tells Freezer that this is his last chance. Leave Earth now and give up his evil ways, or die. This makes the Frost Demon sneer before looking back to Zabon and Doria and telling them to do as he said and kill this monkey along with his friends. The right and left hands of the Emperor immediately step in, but before they can challenge Goku or any of the other Saiyans, the four humans step up, declaring that they will be more than a match for these two. Raditz has come to like this group, and so goes to warn them not to do this, since Zabon and Doria tower over everyone else in the Freezer Force power-wise, but Goku puts a hand on his shoulder and says to have a little faith. The humans then split into pairs, Yamcha and Krillin vs Zabon, and Tien and Chi Chi vs Dodoria. Just as with Goku vs Nappa, the martial arts technique that the humans display allowed them to bridge the power gap with ease, and before long, Dodoria in particular is on the back foot. The pink pugilist brutish fighting style simply cannot compare to the skilled warriors, and when Goku tosses his wife the power pole, she extends it right into Dodoria's gut, sending him wobbling backwards and into the range of a lethal tri-beam from Tien. Sabon looks appalled at this, and so lashes out, driving his opponents back and gaining the upper hand for a brief instance. However, Chi Chi and Tien promptly make their way over to assist their friends, and so against this four-person squad, Zabon is overwhelmed as well. Seeing no alternative, the elegant fighter reluctantly transforms, entering his bestial state, and using the newly acquired power to even the odds. But this just makes the humans grin at each other, with Krillin asking if Zabon's using transformations, should they show off theirs too, Yamcha smiles that they might as well, and so in unison the four shout, Kaio Ken. At once, a fiery red aura encases the four human Z fighters, and when they fire off a combined key blast, it is more than enough to disintegrate Zabon even in his beast form. Frieza is left momentarily stunned by this, and so are Vegeta and Nappa, with Vegeta asking what the hell that was. Goku mischievously giggles that it's called Kaioken and after King Kai taught it to him, he shared it with the others while they were waiting for the Saiyans to return from Master Roshi's. Nappa angrily barks that he should have taught it to them as well, but Goku awkwardly admits that he didn't want to, since he wasn't sure if they were really on their side. This infuriates the Saiyans, with Vegeta looking away from the fight for the first time to yell at Goku, while Nappa growls that after this he better teach them or else. By now Frieza has regained his composure, and so casts an appraising eye over the humans, all of whom had dropped back to their base form immediately after killing Zabon. Cackling, the Emperor says that if they didn't carry the same monkey stink as the Saiyans, he would almost be tempted to offer one of them a spot at his side. But alas, they do, so unfortunately the only fate that awaits them now is death at the hands of his soldiers. A mass of soldiers, hundreds, maybe even thousands by the Z-Warriors count then emerge from the ship, as Goku tells the other Saiyans it's time that they stepped in. As one, Goku, Gohan, Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa join the humans, with each of them taking on a dozen Freezer soldiers at once. Here Gohan and Raditz show off the fruits of their teamwork, destroying a large chunk of the oncoming horde with a dual double Sunday, while Vegeta and Nappa are able to demonstrate just how much they have grown as fighters, as their newly internalized martial arts allow them to mow through the grunts like a knife through hot butter. Goku fights alongside the humans, with the trio of Turtle School students performing a joint Kamehameha as Chi Chi uses her kicks and chops to shatter armor and bone alike. Ten utilizes the precision power of the Dodon Ray to pick off individual stronger targets, even daring to fire one at Freezer, though the Tyrant easily leaps out of the way, with his hover chair being the only casualty. However, Freezer is not known for his forgiveness, and so drawing Ki into his palm, the Space Emperor lobs a death saucer back at Tien, 
ordering him to die like the earthling worm that he is. Naturally, Freeze's own attack kills more of his soldiers than the Z fighters combined, and it takes all four humans re-entering Kaioken to deflect this attack, and even so they can only alter its path slightly. By now the majority of the Freeze of Force soldiers are incapacitated if they fought the humans Goku, Gohan or Raditz, or dead if they were unfortunate enough to come against Vegeta or Nappa, and so Nappa launches a mighty break cannon from his mouth to dispose of the rest, and leave an irate Freeze the only invader still standing on the battlefield. Raditz then jeers that it's not too late for the tyrant to run home to daddy with his tail between his legs, but Freezer darkly chuckles that if only Raditz knew what was coming next, he would have held his tongue and kept his usual snivelling ways. Goku chimes in that they've already beaten all his soldiers, what more could Freezer throw at them? But Vegeta, Nappa and Raditz know, and as they feel five horribly familiar powers swell within the ship, they breathe in unison, the Ginyu Force. The five fighters then make themselves known. Guldo, Raccoon, Berta, Jace and the eponymous Captain Ginyu. This leaves the three Saiyans paralysed with fear for a moment, but Goku, who has kept his head, is able to sense that these guys actually aren't that much of a threat after all they've put in to prepare, and so he tells the group not to worry, since they almost outnumber these guys two to one, so they should be fine. Krillin is Goku's biggest supporter as always, and so takes up the cry, with Gohan, Chi Chi and Yamcha joining in soon after. While Tien says nothing, his calm stoicism is an implicit acceptance of Goku's words, and eventually even Raditz calms down enough to sense the Ginyu Force's power, and knows that his brother is right. He then jeers that those posing freaks are going down, a claim which annoys Guldo enough that he calls dibs on the long-haired Saiyan. Raditz sneers that he really has to fight Guldo rather than one of the real fighters in the group, but his mockery is cut short when in literally no time at all, Guldo has appeared directly in front of Raditz, a fist lodged in his stomach. Raditz spits up a little from the unexpected blow, and Guldo begins to taunt that now that he has seen the full might of his time stop technique, he will think twice about mocking him again. Or rather, Guldo gets out the words, now that, before Raditz blows him away with a Saturday crush. The remaining four members of the Force are horrified by this, and even on the side of the heroes, Gohan is stunned, having not seen the side of his uncle up until now. Raditz seems to realise this too, and so turns around with an apologetic look on his face, and tells Gohan that sometimes hard calls like that are necessary to protect the people you love. The boy nods his understanding, and goes to speak until Raccoon yells that he is bored, and so wants to have his turn fighting Raditz. Raditz says he's game, but Nappa snaps that the long-haired Saiyan isn't allowed to have the Ginyu's alter to himself. Reddits asks if Nappa wants to fight Raccoon, but the bald bruiser shakes his head, grinning that he and Vegeta have been talking and they want Berta and Jace. Reddit scowls that if they don't want Raccoon, then why are they causing such a fuss when he could have already beaten him by now? Raccoon calls this big talk from such a wimp, saying that he remembers when Raditz was too scared to even talk back to lower ranked soldiers like a pool, and so he very much doubts it will be a challenge. In fact, he'll even give himself a handicap by killing the vermin fighters first, to see if he can even break a sweat before fighting Raditz. He then Z vanishes, appearing behind the humans and launching a chop to the back of Yamcha's neck which kills him before he even hits the ground. Guffawing with piggish cruelty, Raccoon then reaches out, grabbing the next closest human who happens to be Chi Chi by the throat and lifting her off her feet. Squeezing down, the red-haired oaf giggles that the last neck made a crack sound and he wonders if this one will make a pop. However, the only sound he hears, and will ever hear again, is let go of my mum. Gohan's tiny fist then rockets into his stomach, and Raccoon is forced to relinquish his grip on Chi Chi as he flies backwards into the base of Corrin's tower. Slumping to the ground, the big brute only has time to look up briefly before a giant beam of blue energy consumes him. As Gohan drops his hands to allow the rage-powered Kamehameha to end, he and everyone else see that Raccoon is gone. Shame fills Gohan as he realises what he's done, but something else is there, something far more troubling. The realisation that what Raditz said is right, and that if he had to do it over, he'd kill Raccoon again. Goku, Raditz and Chi Chi all then run in to wrap the boy in a hug, while Tien and Krillin tend to Yamcha's body, leaving Vegeta and Nappa to finally get the showdown they wanted with Berta and Jace. The red and blue pair then give each other matching grins, and in unison say that whoever kills their Saiyan first gets the top bunk back at 
Freezer Planet 79, before laughing that they had the exact same thought. However, Vegeta and Nappa do not take kindly to being ignored like this, and so open fire on the two Ginyus as they prattle. A volley of key blasts fly towards the fiends, but Berta easily sidesteps this with ease thanks to his legendary speed, while Jace fires off a large energy ball to cancel out the attack. The two Ginyu Force members then taunt that that wasn't very sporting, but if that's how Vegeta and Nappa want it, they can cut to the chase and just kill them already. Berta then zooms over and delivers a right hook to Nappa's jaw, as Vegeta and Jace lunge at each other simultaneously and begin to grapple one another. While their fight is not as one-sided as the others have been, Vegeta definitely has an advantage thanks to his training with Roshi. However, the same cannot be said of Nappa, who is still too much of a brute and is weaker than the other three full-blooded Saiyans by a sizable margin. As a result, he is struggling to keep up with Berta and taking quite a beating for his efforts. Having returned, Krillin and Tien offer to help him out, but the big bruiser outright refuses, saying that win or lose, he must do it alone if he is to keep any semblance of his Saiyan pride. This makes the pair gulp, with Krillin yelling that he's probably not going to like their surprise then. Surprise? Both Nappa and Berta ask in confusion, but before the humans can answer, a new voice replies, Surprise! Berta then howls in pain and drops to his knees as blood spurts from his newly slashed leg muscles. Nappa looks for the culprit and sees a new figure standing behind them with a sword drawn. His first thought is that this guy looks like a shorter, fatter Raditz with less spiky hair. His second thought is that he's going to literally murder this man for interrupting his fight. Yajirobe then sheaths his bloody sword in an attempt to look cool and says he's sorry he's late, but he was busy doing some super secret intense training up at Corrin's. Tien coldly replies that when they arrived to store Yamcha's body, he was napping. Yajirobe brusquely replies that it only looked that way to the uninitiated, but his bluster is silenced when Nappa fires a key blast at him, snarling that he's ruined everything. With a shocked yelp, Yajirobe says that if that's what their allies are doing, he's not sticking around to see what the bad guys do to him. He then yells that this makes them even for not showing up to fight the Saiyans, and flees, abandoning any trace of bravado he might have had. Nappa is still furious, and growls that it's no fun fighting Berta if he can't move anymore, before promptly squishing his head like a bug. A little way over, Jace yells out in anguish at the defeat of his partner, and this distraction is all Vegeta needs to end their tussle. Planting a boot on the branch's back, the Saiyan Prince kicks him up into the air and launches a dirty fireworks before Jace can even look back. As Jace's ashes scatter the battlefield, Frieza snaps at Ginyu to stop standing around and kill these fools already, since they're making a mockery of the Frieza Force. Ginyu bows deeply to his Emperor and steps forth, asking who will be fighting him. Detaching himself from the family hug, Goku says that he will, and so walks over to Ginyu. As he does, the captain taps his scatter and says that Goku's power is quite impressive, coming to about 75,000, though he slightly suggests that based on what he's seen here today, this is not Goku's full power. Goku nods that in truth it isn't, and so Ginyu tells the Saiyan to hit him with everything he's got. Goku shrugs that if Ginyu insists, and so powers up to Kaioken times three, driving his fist cleanly through the captain's torso. As our hero pulls his arm out and wipes some of Ginyu's blue blood on his pants, the captain begins to chuckle that he knew the Saiyan had untapped depths of power, far beyond his own, and that now the foolish simpleton has all but handed that strength over to him and the Frieza Force. Goku looks confused, but the other Saiyans know what this is, and so as Ginyu begins to cry, change now, Raditz leaps into action, grabbing Ginyu by the horn and spinning him so he's instead facing Frieza. The yellow beam of ectoplasm launches towards the tyrant before Ginyu can stop it, but Frieza has no intention of losing his body, and so lazily fires a purple blast which eradicates Ginyu's beam and soars down the captain's throat. For a second, nothing happens, and the purple alien begins to swell rapidly under the force of such raw power. Power. And before the brothers can do anything to stop it, Captain Ginyu's body detonates like a Cyberman. Having both been caught at Ground Zero, Goku and Raditz are sent flying far away, and from what everyone can see, their injuries are quite severe. Dusting off his hands, Frieza cackles that was fun, before mockingly asking who wants to go boom next. A look of panic crosses everyone's faces, then Vegeta and Nappa step up, saying they've been waiting years to put Frieza in his place. 
The prince then tells the humans in Gohan to go find Kakarot and Raditz, sneering that if they're fast enough, there might even be a piece of Frieza left over for them to blast. Frieza superciliously welcomes the duo to try if they really think they've gotten strong enough to challenge him. And so while this posturing is going on, Krillin passes a Senzu Bane to Chi Chi, telling her and Gohan to find Goku, while he and Tien find Raditz. The Earthlings then set about their task, while Vegeta and Nappa approach their former master. As soon as the Earthlings are out of sight, Vegeta reveals the true reason he sent them away, as he launches a power ball. He and Nappa then both transform into great apes and charge Frieza. Even with the significant power loss Vegeta has incurred by using that technique, he and Nappa combined are still enough to take on first form Frieza. And to the Emperor's shock, he is actually overwhelmed by these two giant stinking apes. At one point, a full force Gallic gun from Vegeta even knocks Frieza off his feet, and while he is prone, Nappa barges in and grabs the tyrant, lifting him up and opening his gargantuan jaws wide, meaning to bite Frieza in half and in this battle once and for all, but the vile villain is not willing to go down without a fight, and so fires a pair of eye beams into the ape's face, which makes him relinquish his grip as he clutches his own face in agony. Vegeta lunges for him next, but Frieza is able to evade this attack as he touches down on the ground. Weighing his options, the alien tyrant figures that he might be able to finish off Nappa while he's vulnerable and stand a decent chance against Vegeta, even in his great ape form, but that's assuming that the Earthlings and those other two Saiyans don't come back to help them. And after all, there is a much safer and smarter course of action that Frieza can take, even if it galls him to resort to it against Saiyan monkeys. Frieza then pontificates that very few have ever seen his second form, so he hopes the Saiyans find some pride in that fact. Though he supposes it doesn't matter, since it's not like they'll be around very long to enjoy the knowledge either way. He then begins to bulk up, growing to several times his previous height, as his horns curve upwards into wicked prongs. Vegeta and Nappa are stunned by the power on display, and Frieza uses this to his full advantage, firing off a blast which tears through Vegeta's side and sends him crashing through a copse of trees. Nappa falls seconds later, his vision having returned just in time to see the blast that beats him. Frieza then destroys the power ball, a smug smirk on his face as he declares that there won't be any more monkey business in this fight. As Vegeta and Nappa revert to their base forms, the Emperor stalks towards them, debating which one he's going to kill first. However, before he can reach a decision, a blinding pain in the back of his head makes Frieza double over as Raditz lands, having delivered a flying kick from behind. The long-haired Saiyan declares that he's going to be the one to kill Frieza, which makes the tyrant laugh that Raditz the Runt honestly believes he can win this fight when his two comrades couldn't handle his second form even in their great ape states. But Raditz smirks that Frieza has forgotten the secret of the Saiyan race. Each time they come close to death and bounce back, their powers grow exponentially. And after the explosion Frieza sent his and Kakarot's way, he better believe that they are each dozens of times stronger. To prove his point, he hurls a punch at the tyrant, who cannot even dodge it, let alone the one that comes after, or the one that comes after that. It is incredibly cathartic for Raditz to beat down on his former boss. And as Frieza struggles to even stay standing in the face of such an onslaught, Vegeta and Nappa try to wrap their heads around how much their dog's body has grown in such little time. But alas, just as Frieza forgot about Zenkai boosts, so has Raditz forgotten about Frieza's tail, right up until it snakes up behind him and wraps tight around the Saiyan's throat. Purest glee crosses Frieza's face at the agony on Raditz's, and he sardonically asks if the monkey has any more big declarations he wants to make before he dies. In a choked voice, Raditz replies just one. Shining Friday. Frieza is then smacked in the face by this attack, and as he goes flying, his tail uncoils from Raditz's throat. The long-haired Saiyan then advances on his prey, ready to deliver the final blow, but unfortunately for everyone, he is too busy savouring this moment that he allows Frieza to begin transforming into his third form. The sheer force of this key expansion blows Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa back, and even with most of his energy still intact, Raditz cannot close the distance both physically and in terms of power. When Frieza finishes, his head and shoulder plates have elongated, and spiky protuberances have grown from his head and back. He then proceeds to prove just how deadly these growths are, as he leans forward and charges Raditz like a bull would a matador. Raditz barely leaps out of the way, but this leaves his back exposed to a blast that puts him on the ground. Frieza then maliciously begins to stomp on the downed warrior's back, no purpose in mind beyond causing pain. At this point, the fully healed Goku and the other Earthlings arrive, with the Guardian firing off a Kamehameha 
Kamehameha to drive Frieza back, long enough to check on his brother. As Goku, Gohan, and Chi Chi approach Raditz, Krillin and Tien do the same to the still wounded Vegeta and Nappa, handing them the last two Senzu bins in a show of goodwill that is not lost on the Elder Saiyan. Meanwhile, Chi Chi pulls out half a bean, saying that Krillin gave it to her after Rakum damaged her neck, but she only needed half and wanted to hold on to the other half in case someone in her family was hurt. Reddits gratefully accepts, swallowing the bean and regaining enough strength to get back in the fight, while the Saiyans do the same, returning to full strength with a sizable Zenkai to boot. The four pure-blooded Saiyans then turn as one to face third form Frieza, and against their combined might it is no contest. However, the tyrant is not out of tricks yet, and so when a combo attack knocks him to the ground, he tells them that they can't kill him yet, not if they want to test themselves against his final form. Reddits immediately calls this notion insane, saying they've won so they should just end this, but unsurprisingly Vegeta wants to let Frieza enter his final form. Nappa backs the prince, and to Raditz's shock so does Goku, saying that if they truly want this to be a warning to all evildoers in the galaxy who might want to harm Earth, they have to show that they can beat Frieza at his peak. And besides, based on the jump in power between the last few forms, the four of them combined will have no problem overpowering it just as easily as they did the third. Goku then gives Frieza the go-ahead, and he begins to transform into his final form. The power that blossoms from this transformation is utterly terrifying, and at once the dynamic of this fight shifts massively in Frieza's favour. Even with the brothers using Kaioken, and Vegeta and Nappa going all out, they can do little more than hold Frieza off, and it seems like only a matter of time before he kills them and everyone else on this planet. And it is clear that Frieza has come to the same conclusion, as after he has had his fun striking fear into the monkeys' hearts, he rises into the air and lobs a death ball down at them. Goku's Kamehameha, Raditz's Double Sunday, Vegeta's Gallic Gun, and Nappa's Break Cannon all combine and attempt to push the orb back. But even this is fruitless, and as the Death Ball draws ever nearer, they have to give everything they have just to stop it from overwhelming them immediately. But then a fifth Saiyan enters the fray, Gohan. Having ignored his mother's directions to stay back and let his father and uncle handle this, he fires a full power blast of his own which joins those of his brethren. With the added benefit of Gohan's rage boost on their side, the joint Saiyan attack is finally able to bring Frieza's death ball to a standstill, and then even begin to push it back little by little. This is not something the Emperor can tolerate, and so he petulantly screams that this little band of Saiyans think that together they can defeat him, the unstoppable Lord Frieza? Well he has news for them, they are nothing but monkeys and he is going to watch them burn, like he did the rest of their worthless race, and he will enjoy seeing this planet explode almost as much as he did planet Vegeta, though first he has to deal with this distracting addition for upsetting the balance of things. And then, with a sadistic laugh, the maniacal reptile fires off a single death beam with his free hand, aimed directly at Gohan. As the key bolt rips through his heart, Gohan doesn't even have time to utter a sound before his tiny five-year-old body hits the ground with a soft thud. For Goku and Raditz, it feels as though their own hearts have been pierced as well, such as their anguish this needless tragedy. Their pain then crystallizes into rage, and for a moment the brother's hair begins to lift and flicker gold as their powers spike to push the death ball back. But thanks to them being in Kaioken, their bodies reject this new state, knowing it would kill them instantly, and so this new surge of strength fades as quickly as it appeared, though it does give Goku an idea. Looking back at his friends and family, he knows exactly what this will cost him, but as his gaze returns to Frieza, he reflects on what exactly he has lost already, and how much more he he and everyone else stands to lose if this monster isn't punished for his actions. His course now set, the Guardian lets out a fearsome cry of Kaioken times 100. Goku's red aura massively expands to cover all of his allies, and at once he can feel every muscle in his body begin to shred apart. It is physical agony the likes of which our hero has never known, as his bones shatter and organs rupture inside him. But like he knew it would, it gives him the power to save his world. The Saiyan group attack then multiplies a hundredfold, both in strength and size, and where once the death ball was an insurmountable threat, now it is torn to pieces like tissue paper. The hero's beam then shoots forth unabated, and Frieza is helpless in the face of it. His last action is to curse the name of the Saiyans, and then, in a burst of light, he is gone. 
the battle now over, our victorious Saiyans drop to the ground. Though for Goku this is more literal. Unable to stand on legs that no longer function, he is forced to drag himself towards the others on his elbows, each movement sending ripples of agony through his broken body. Frantically, Krillin cries that he'll go to Korin's and see if they have any last senzu beans, but Goku shakes his head that there's no point, before weakly calling for Gohan. Chi Chi, who had been cradling the boy's dead body, floats over to Goku and lays him in his father's arms. This makes Goku smile, and he thanks her, not just for this, but for everything, even as the simple act causes blood to leak out the sides of his mouth. Then, when he is sure he has Gohan, he rolls over onto his back to look up at his friends and family. He will miss them all terribly, but at least the Earth is safe at last, and now he must do his final duty as its guardian and escort one more soul to the other world. And with that thought, father and son fade away. Goku is dead. His body, along with that of Gohan's, have been transported to the other world, so they may maintain their physical capacities as they embark on this next great journey. Their lives were lost to save the world from the tyrant Frieza, though none of those they left behind are in any mood to celebrate their victory. It is a somber time as the remaining Z fighters contemplate where to go from here. For Chi Chi, her course is clear. She will return to the lookout, and Raditz intends to join her, this being his final tribute to the brother who saved his life and the nephew who saved his soul. As for the remaining humans, they intend to return to their lives, while never dropping their training so that should the Earth ever need them again, they will be ready. The only one who has no plans to stick around is Vegeta. Even with no sign of Frieza, he is not convinced that his tormentor is dead, and so with no rival to tether him to this world, or Super Saiyan state to try and emulate, Vegeta declares his intentions to return to the stars and dismantle the remnants of the Frieza Force, including the holdings of King Cold. He then orders Nappa to follow him onto Frieza's motherships so they can get it flying, but calmly Nappa refuses. This is the first time he has ever done such a thing, and unsurprisingly the prince is taken aback, demanding to know why Nappa would dare refuse a direct order from his liege. But in that same calm voice, Nappa says that he's not his liege. The Saiyan race is gone, and so is Frieza, so it's time they move on, and make lives for themselves like Raditz and Kakarot did. From what he's seen, this world could be a good home, but Vegeta calls the idea preposterous, and denounces Nappa as a soft old man who's lost his Saiyan pride. Nappa sighs that he knew Vegeta would take it this way, but he had to try to convince him for old time's sake. He then wishes the smaller man luck out in space, saying that he hopes he finds whatever it is he's really looking for. Vegeta fumes that he should kill him for such insubordination, but Raditz steps between them, fire in his eyes as if daring Vegeta to throw the first punch so he can vent his anguish on the prince. He then declares that there will be no more killing today, so if Vegeta wants to pick a fight, he will have to wait for another time. Vegeta sneers that he wouldn't waste another minute on this worthless rock if his life depended on it, and so stalks over to Frieza's ship alone. Krillin asks Nappa where he intends to go now, and the burly brute says he's going to return to Roshi's Island to give the old hermit's training a second try. His failure against Bird has humbled him, and after so long as an aimless thug, he wants to see if he can find whatever it was that made Kakarot so willing to sacrifice his life without a moment's hesitation. In short, he wants a sense of purpose and a place to call his own. Krillin sagely nods that he thinks that's all anyone wants, and so offers to guide him back to the island. The pair depart with Tien doing likewise soon after, saying he will inform Chatsu of their friend's passing. Finally, even Vegeta leaves, having managed to get Frieza's ship airborne, and so exits the atmosphere, leaving Raditz and Chi Chi alone in the land of Korin. Meanwhile, in other world, Goku and Gohan are nearing the front of the line at King Yama's check-in station. Though Gohan cannot tire in the afterlife, Goku still carries him like he used to when Gohan was younger, wanting to hold his son close and feel him here beside him. Though deep in his heart, Goku knows that Gohan shouldn't be here. He still had far too much life left to live, and he would have been able to live it, to grow old, to love and one day start a family of his own perhaps, if only his father had not been such a fool. He should have listened to Raditz and killed Frieza when he had the the chance, but he had been arrogant and didn't think that, no, he didn't think, period. And now Gohan must pay the price for Goku's hubris. 
reaching the front of the line at last. Goku greets King Yama without any of his usual exuberance. Yama, having met Goku through work, wonders what is wrong with him, before noticing the halo above his head and realizing that Goku is dead, rather than simply guiding the soul of a departed person to the afterlife. He then pulls up Goku's file and sees that he sacrificed his life to defeat Frieza, a commendable feat indeed. Yoga congratulates Goku for his act of heroism and says that for such a deed he is entitled to go anywhere in the other world he wants. Goku replies that all he wants is for his son to be returned to life, a firmness in his tone that is most unlike the Jolly Guardian. Tugging at his beard awkwardly, Yama blusters that there really isn't any way that can grant that wish, since as far as he knows the only celestial beings that can revive the dead are angels and supreme Kais, and with the universe's only angel not residing in another world, and the supreme Kai being so reclusive, he's afraid that Goku is out of luck. Still serious, Goku asks if it would be possible to find the Supreme Kai somewhere in another world, and Yama says that theoretically it would be, but like he said, he hasn't been seen in centuries, so Goku could spend lifetimes searching and still come up empty handed. Goku doesn't care, and so declares that what he wants is a way to go look for the Supreme Kai with Gohan. Yama sighs that he did technically say Goku could choose his afterlife, and so tells the Guardian that he can board a plane from here which will take him to the Grand Kai's planet, as the next highest Kai under the Supreme Kai, he might know where to start looking, though Yema does reiterate that this quest is likely a fool's errand. This doesn't seem to matter to Goku, whose smile is returned at last, as he thanks the king for everything, and begins running towards the runway with Gohan still clutched in his arms. The trip is a bumpy one, as the plane they travel on is old and rickety, but the father-son duo have fun looking out the window at all the strange worlds that make up this dimension. Though Goku's guilt has not lessened, having a goal again has allowed him to compartmentalize it, and put on a brave face for Gohan. When they arrive on the Grand Kai's world, they are greeted with interest by the inhabitants of the world, especially Alibu, who says that King Yama phoned ahead to say that they were coming, and mentioned that they are from Earth. Gohan smiles and nods that they are, adding that his dad is the Guardian of Earth, which makes Alibu grin that he once held a similar title. He looks forward to getting to know them both during their time here. Goku says he'd love to stick around and maybe even fight Alibu, since he seems super strong, but unfortunately he's only here to get the location of the Supreme Kai's plant from the Grand Kai, so they can see about getting his son revived. Alibu shakes his head that though he admires Goku's noble intentions, no one sees the Grand Kai without putting in 10,000 years of training first. Goku panics that that's like 10,000 more years than he has to spare, asking if there's any way he can get an audience with the Grand Kai sooner. Alibu smiles that though it's not strictly within the rules of this planet, if Goku's able to beat him in a fight, he'd be willing to give him his years. Then he'd only have to train for a few more thousand years rather than the full ten, since he recognizes that Goku's here for a selfless reason. Goku easily agrees, and so the pair take up fighting stances across from each other. Goku is the first to move, going into Kaioken times 3 right off the bat and leaping at Alibu with a punch. The muscular human, however, is easily able to sidestep this blow and drive an elbow into the back of Goku's head. Goku is knocked onto his hands and knees by the blow, but is able to move fast enough that he avoids the follow-up attack by rolling out of the way and firing a Kamehameha. This does knock Alibu back, and so our hero presses his advantage, attempting a leg sweep this time, but once more Alibu avoids it, showing the vast power gap between them, even while the Guardian is in Kaioken. He then drops down onto Goku's extended leg, making the Saiyan cry out in pain, before a gut punch from the toga-wearing warrior knocks the wind right out of him. Alibu then grabs Goku Goku by the shirt front and lifts him into the air with one arm, saying that while he still admires Goku's goals, he thinks 10,000 years of training will do him some good, since as it stands he is far too weak to be demanding an audience with the Grand Kai, let alone the Supreme Kai. The thought of being denied here, the first hurdle, of failing his son before their journey has even begun fills Goku with rage, and like in the battle with Frieza, his hair begins to flick a golden spike up, but unlike then, his body no longer has the same limitations it did while he was alive, and so for a brief moment, Goku enters this new state, feeling his power swell exponentially as he drives a fist into his opponent's face. This time Alibu is not quick enough to dodge, and so is forced to drop Goku as his hands fly instinctively to his wounded face granting Goku the opportunity he needs to knee him in the stomach. This single blow is enough to knock the legendary fighter out cold, and as Alibu falls to the floor, Goku's strange transformation ends just as suddenly as it began, leaving Goku with an incredible head rush and a weird tingling in his lower back. Gohan then runs in to hug his dad, saying that he did it, and as Goku lifts him up, an unfamiliar voice concurs that indeed he did. 
Spinning around, Goku sees that the speaker is a wizened old hippie dressed head to toe in denim with an insane amount of hair and beard. The Saiyan asks if he's another fighter, but the old man replies that no, he is in fact the Grand Kai, and when he heard Goku's story, well it dang near broke his heart. Goku asks that the Grand Kai can take him to the Supreme Kai's world, imploring that he too must see why it's so important to get Gohan revived when he was cut down so unfairly in his prime. The Grand Kai nods and walks over to ruffle Gohan's hair, saying that if it was up to him, he'd give the kid his life back in a heartbeat. But sadly it's not, and nor can he take the pair to the Sacred World of the Kais. Goku asks why not, and the Grand Kai admits that the Sacred World of the Kais is a weird place geographically. It exists beyond the mortal realm, but is also not really a part of Otherworld. This confuses Goku, so in a kindly tone the Grand Kai elaborates, explaining that it's kind of like a satellite dimension that orbits both the living world and Otherworld. So the Supreme Kai can monitor it all. Gohan perks up, saying in that sense it's kinda like the lookout back on Earth, and the Grand Kai nods approvingly, calling Gohan one sharp kid. The boy then asks if there's a special condition one must fulfill to reach the sacred world, like how his dad had to use the power pole the first time he went to the lookout, and the Grand Kai says that there sorta of is. In order to gain access to the world, you have to be brought there by one of its residents, but to be brought there you have to first make contact with them, and the only way to make contact with them is to visit them on their world. Goku frowns that it sounds like the old deity is saying it's impossible, but the Grand Kai touts that it's not impossible, just difficult, since as King Yama no doubt told him, the Supreme Kai is a famous recluse. However, as the Grand Kai, he has a relationship with the Supreme Kai, not unlike Goku had with Yama as guardian. So with a bit of time, and a lot of luck, he should be able to get in contact with him. Goku beams that that's amazing, thanking the Grand Kai for his help, but the bearded Kai chuckles not to thank him yet, as even if he makes contact, there's no guarantee guarantee the Supreme Kai will allow Goku to visit his world and plead his case, since he ain't exactly the type for house guests. Speaking of which, while the Grand Kai tries to make contact, Goku and Gohan are welcome to use his world to train, since they're probably going to be here for a while. Meanwhile, back on Earth, our heroes are forced to settle into a world without Goku. For those wondering why they don't simply go to Namek, my reasoning is that since the Saiyans never met Piccolo and Kami, the news of their Namekian origins never came to light, and as such there is nothing to suggest that there is another planet which might have Dragon Balls capable of reviving their fallen friends. And so as time marches on, Chi Chi continues to watch over the world from on high, but no matter how many times Popo offers her the official position of Guardian, she always refuses, leaving the world without a guardian for the time being. Raditz also remains on the lookout by his sister-in-law's side, but while this isolation is amenable to Chi Chi, it is less so to the Saiyan, who has lived his entire life communally, both on Planet Vegeta and later with the Freezer Force. And finally after seeing how miserable this makes him, Chi Chi takes pity on the long-haired man and tells him to go down to the surface, familiarize himself with the culture and the people, since part of the reason Goku was such a great guardian was that he truly loved Earth and that allowed him to protect it with his whole heart. Reddits gratefully accepts and so heads down to Earth. At first he mostly just wanders, exploring everywhere he can find from bustling cities to lifeless deserts, mountain peaks to ocean depths. At times he is joined by one or more of the Z fighters who are happy to help their new friend adapt to life on Earth. However the human who he gets closest to is one he meets in between journeys, during a stopover in West City. At Krillin's insistence the pair visit Capsule Corp, where Raditz is introduced to Bulma as the woman who invented the gravity chamber. Raditz has always admired ingenuity and a strong will, so he and Bulma quickly hit it off, with Bulma in turn finding him a much more intelligent conversationalist than his brother, while still bearing enough physical resemblance that all the factors she she found attractive about Goku at the 23rd tournament is still present in Raditz as well. And so bit by bit, Raditz begins returning to the lookout less and less frequently, choosing to instead spend his time at Capsule Corp with Bulma. Raditz does still continue to travel like Chi Chi suggested, but now he does it with Bulma, and the pair have immense fun together exploring all the places they've never been, as well as a few places Bulma visited in her youth while travelling with Goku and the gang. This shared morning of Goku also brings them close together, as Bulma is able to tell Raditz about the boy Goku was, while Raditz in turn fills her in on the man he became after they parted ways in the tournament. Everyone in the Dragon Team is happy for them, and it comes as a shock to no one when roughly a year after meeting, the couple announce their engagement, and then a few months later that they are expecting their first child. Even in Otherworld people are raising their glasses to the happy couple, as Goku and Gohan watch them from the Grand Kai's world. For the last year they have been training here with various legendary heroes from across the galaxy and have seen extraordinary gains as a result. By now they can even match a Libu, though Goku has still not figured out how to tap into that spiky head power up he got during their first fight. 
However, training is not the only way the father-son duo have been filling their time. Thanks to not needing to sleep, they're able to utilize every second of each day to the fullest, often spending whole nights together talking or playing. It is at these times that Goku cannot help but selfishly think how much he will miss Gohan when he returns to life. But every time he sees that smiling face looking up at him, it reaffirms that his course is right, and he must follow it through, no matter the cost to himself. Finally, a day comes when the Grand Kai seeks Goku and Gohan out, and tells them that he has made contact with the Supreme Kai, and he is sending an emissary to bring them to his world. The pair are ecstatic and thank the Grand Kai profusely, but just as when he first agreed to help them, he tells Goku and Gohan that he cannot promise them success, since all the Supreme Kai has agreed to as an audience, nothing more. Goku says that will be more than enough, since he knows that if they talk face to face, even the Supreme Kai will see why Gohan deserves to be brought back. And though he does doesn't say it, he mentally finishes the thought with, and why he doesn't deserve to pay for my mistake. The next day a tall figure with pink wrinkled skin and long white hair arrives at the Grand Kai's world. When Goku sees him, he immediately assumes that he is the Supreme Kai by his stern demeanor, and so asks if this is the case. The man replies that he is not. He is the Supreme Kai's bodyguard and attendant Kibito. This makes Goku relax a little, and he sticks a hand out to shake, saying that in that case it's good to meet him. Kibito frowns at the hand until Goku drops it, saying that he personally does not approve of models being allowed onto the sacred world of the Kais, even if Goku was once a minor deity himself. However, he is Lord Shin's loyal vassal, so if it is his will that Goku be granted access to the sacred world, then it shall be done. Goku smiles that Kibito shouldn't be so down on mortals since they're not all bad, but the pink Kai replies that it's not a matter of bad, it is a matter of demarcation between the divine and the mundane. He then extends an arm, instructing the Saiyans to hold on and not let go until they arrive, otherwise they could be lost somewhere in the void between this dimension and the sacred world of the Kais. Goku and Gohan take this warning very seriously, and so hold on tight as the three of them vanish into thin air. In almost no time at all, the trio touch down on a grassy plain underneath a lilac sky, and Kibito tells them this is the sacred world of the Kais, so they should be sure to treat it with the proper reverence. The soft voice then chuckles that Kibito shouldn't be so harsh with their guests, as a small purple skinned man with a shockingly white mohawk steps into view. With a sweeping bow Kibito drops to one knee, pulling Goku and Gohan down with him, ordering them to bow before the Supreme Kai of the entire universe. But Shin just chuckles that this is exactly what he's talking about, humbly asking for the Saiyan's forgiveness for his attendant's overzealousness. Goku grins that Shin shouldn't sweat it, introducing himself and his son with a handshake, which this Kai graciously accepts. Goku then turns serious, saying he's come with an important purpose. He wants to request that the Supreme Kai grant Gohan a second chance at life, since he only died due to Goku making a foolish mistake. The Saiyan warrior then presses his palms and face to the ground in a sign of deference, vowing that he will pay whatever price the Supreme Kai deems necessary. Shin eyes Goku, asking what if he required Goku's soul to be destroyed, trading a life for a life. Would he face total oblivion for his son? Without hesitation, Goku replies that he would. Gohan cries that he wouldn't accept the deal if it meant losing his dad forever, but Shin grins that Gohan need not worry. It was just a little test, and Goku passed with flying colors, proving that he's exactly as pure-hearted as his reputation would suggest. Goku beams that this means Shin will help him, right? But the god sadly shakes his head, saying that though he would very much like to, the only way a Kai can restore the life of a mortal is by giving up their own life, and as it stands he is bound in the life link with another, so he cannot make such a selfish decision with at least conferring with his counterpart. Goku's smile doesn't drop and he says that's fine, since surely Shin can just have Kibito bring the other guy here, they can talk it out, and Gohan can still get revived. Kibito growls how dare Goku give orders to the Supreme Kai, but Shin calms him with a hand, before shaking his head once more, and saying that this won't be possible, since his counterpart has been asleep for 25 years, and will likely stay that way for decades, if not centuries. Goku whines that if he's already slept that long, can't they just wake him up for a teensy wincy little chat? But Shin animatedly gasps that such an idea is out of the question, since if someone were to wake Lord Beerus from his slumber prematurely, he'd be more likely to erase them than revive them. Goku gulps that he doesn't want that, and asks if there's really no chance of talking to him sooner. Shin sighs that there isn't, apologizing for not being able to help. This deflates the Guardian, and so taking Gohan's hand, he tells his son they should probably head back to Grand Kai's world. However, here Shin stops them, saying that while they wait for Beerus to awaken, he would actually like for them to remain here. 
Goku, Gohan, and Kibito all look surprised at this declaration, so Shin elaborates, saying that he specifically wants a chance to study Gohan a bit more closely, since by being born to a parent with godly ki, Gohan possesses an innate god ki quite similar to that of a Kai. Gohan seems even more taken aback by this, looking at his hands as though he's never seen them before, and protests that he's just a kid. There's no way he has the same sort of energy as the ruler of the universe. Shin kindly but firmly disagrees, telling Gohan to try and read his energy, and so the young hybrid along with his father do as they're told. Like Shin said, there is a definite similarity between Gohan and Shin's ki, and when this registers on the Saiyan's faces, Shin grins that now they see what he means. He then adds that if they agree to his request, they will not go unrewarded, since Kibito is stronger than almost any mortal and can train them both to become fighters worthy of legend, while he will aid them as well by showing them both how to draw out their divine gifts to the fullest. Goku and Gohan consider for a moment, then in unison nod their agreement. Back on Earth, another six months pass. Peace and prosperity reign, and over at Capsule Corp, preparations are being made as Bulma enters her third trimester. Though Raditz still trains daily in a gravity room Bulma built especially for him, he is also an attentive partner, eagerly awaiting fatherhood after the bond he built with Gohan. It is therefore an extra deep dread that fills him when in the distance a horribly familiar power level spikes, drawing the attention of him and every other defender of Earth. Having made it their de facto base of operations, the Z-Warriors and Bulma all converge on the lookout, where Chi Chi confirms what they all feared, that Frieza somehow managed to survive the Saiyan's final attack, and is now returning to Earth, this time with a roughly equal power at his side. Nappa sighs that this is probably Frieza's father, King Cold, before adding their presence must mean Vegeta was unsuccessful in his plans to destroy their empire, and so is probably dead as well. No one but him is particularly moved by this loss, and so the conversation turns to how they might stop Frieza and Cold. Krillin suggests that if they all go into their highest form of Kaioken and fire a combined blast, it may be enough to kill the tyrants, but Raditz disagrees, saying that a hundred times Kaioken from Kakarot didn't kill Frieza, so even with all their training he doubts they can. Chi Chi snaps at him to come up with a better plan then, and Raditz feels a chill go down his spine. He does have a better plan, but there's one problem with it. If he goes through with it, he'll die. With all his gains over the last 18 months, Raditz is confident that if he used Kaioken times 100, he'd be able to kill Frieza and Cold. Even times 50 would be enough to end those monsters in a heartbeat. But he saw what that power-up did to his brother's body, and with his first child on the way, he's not sure if he'd be able to make that sacrifice for Earth. Raditz's hands shake and he balls them up into fists, furious with himself. After all this time, he's still a selfish coward. Kakarot died for this world and left behind his family. Why can't he bring himself to do the same? It's the only way to save Bulma and the baby. He has to do this for them. But then Tien speaks up, proposing that he be the one to perform the sacrificial Kaioken, saying that after seeing Goku do it, he's been training himself so he can go up to times 20 on command. So perhaps that paired with a Neo Tribeam will be enough. However, if it is not, he is willing to lay down his life for the good of the planet just like his rival did. Everyone asks Tien if he's sure he wants to take such a risk, but the Triclops grunts that it's not a matter of want, it's a matter of need, and they need to kill Frieza and his father today, or it will mean the end for Earth. Finding some of his courage at last, Reddit's vows that he will fight alongside Tien, with Nappa, Krillin, and Chi Chi promising to do the same. Chiaotzu says he will as well, but Tien implores his oldest friend to stay out of this, since if the worst comes to the worst, he will need to pass on the secrets of the Crane School. Tearfully, Chiaotzu agrees, and so the dragon and team fall into silence, awaiting the arrival of Frieza. It doesn't take long for Frieza's ship to touch down, this time in a wasteland, and so the heroes depart at once to confront the tyrant and limit the destruction he can cause. However, even flying at supersonic speeds, they are not the first to arrive at the scene, and to their shock are greeted by the back of a humanoid figure, with familiar spiky black hair that hangs all the way to his knees. Though they cannot see his face, they can see the sword he draws from his back, and uses to dispatch Frieza's soldier with an impressive level of speed and efficiency. As the dismembered body splattered into the dirt, the long-haired figure issues a challenge to Frieza himself, who is now some sort of grotesque cyborg. Frieza, being his usual condescending self, swaggers towards the swordsman, asking if he really thinks he can defeat the Emperor of the Galaxy as easily as he did some lowly minions. The figure replies that perhaps not as easily, but definitely just as quickly, before his hair turns gold and an aura of the same colour bursts all around him. 
Z fighters are almost blown off their feet by this sudden increase of power to someone who is already stronger than any of them, and so they very nearly miss what happens next, as the figure vanishes from view, only to reappear behind Frieza and run him through with his sword. As Frieza gasps in pain, the warrior takes one hand off the hilt of his weapon and places it onto the small of the alien's back, smirking to give his regards to those other mechanized freaks when he sees them in hell. He then fires a blast which vaporizes Frieza in an instant. Oddly enough, King Cold applauds this brutality, calling the young man most impressive indeed, and offers him a place at his side. The Golden Warrior bluntly declines, advancing on the King with his sword still drawn, and so Cold, with a look of slight worry on his face, asks what he wants instead. The Z Fighters cannot see the long-haired fighter's face, they can hear the smirk in his voice as he answers, for you to know it was a Saiyan who killed you. He then fires off a ball of pink key which engulfs King Cold, the ship, and any remaining Freezer Force soldiers, turning them all into dust in a matter of seconds. For everyone else, an immense sense of relief floods them that this crisis could be so easily avoided, but for Raditz, all he is left with is a sense of puzzlement, since that final attack was unmistakably a Saturday crush. The unknown fighter's hair then reverts back to black, and without missing a beat, he spins round and calls for the defenders of Earth to come out now since the danger has passed. Not sure if they can trust him, but wise enough to know that as it stands they probably can't resist, the group flirt over, and as they do, they get a better look at the young man. He is tall and well built, with dark eyes and hair that on closer inspection bears an even more striking resemblance to Raditz than they had all thought, except without the pronounced widow's peak. When they get close, he smiles and sheathes his blade to show that he means no harm. However, the group is still not fully sure if they can trust him, and so wanting to redeem his previous cowardice, Raditz steps up and demands to know who this young man is. The stranger pauses if caught in a conundrum, and Raditz notes that for a moment his eyes dart to Bulma's belly, making the wary Saiyan even more uneasy as he worries that this boy is thinking of attacking Bulma and the baby as a way to catch them all off guard. But then the young man does something even more shocking. He throws his arms around Raditz, and in a low voice whispers, My name is Trunks. I'm your son from the future. I've missed you, Dad. We find ourselves in the darkest timeline. With no hero from the future to save the day, Tian Shinhan gave his life by using a combined Neo Tri-Beam and Kaioken times 50 to kill Frieza and King Cold. As the Triclops joins the mounting list of casualties in a world without Dragon Balls, his sacrifice buys the Earth a new era of peace. Three years pass in the blink of an eye, and in this time a new life begins. Trunks, born the son of the newlywed Raditz and Bulma, the black-haired babe begins life with every advantage imaginable, and his adoring parents cannot wait to see the life he will have. As he grows, Trunks proves himself to be inquisitive and creative like both his parents, and by two and a half, he is already helping his mother tinker and play sparring with his father. He is also doted on by family friends like his Uncle Krillin and Uncle Nappa, and though he doesn't remember her, he also knows that he is an Auntie Chi Chi who is apparently watching over him from above. Unfortunately, this joy cannot last forever, and one day while father and son are flying over West City, a terrible chill runs down their spines, like a bright flame they had always taken for granted has been snuffed out, leaving a cold void in its place. Reddits knows this feeling, having caused it enough times. It is the feeling of mass death. Forcing himself to exude an air of calm for his young son, Raditz tells Trunks to head home and stay close to his mother. But of course, like any toddler would, Trunks asks why, saying that he wants to stay with his dad. Patience straining under this grilling, coupled with the fear pooling in his stomach and the ringing in his head as Chi Chi telepathically transmits the coordinates of the disaster, Raditz states a little more harshly than he meant to that he just needs a minute to be alone. Tears well in the child's eyes at this rebuke, and he flies away at top speed, leaving Raditz with another unpleasant feeling to add to the rest. Guilt. When he is sure the boy is gone, Raditz takes off towards the location Chi Chi mentioned, all the while scanning for any sign of whatever killed all those people. However, despite his best efforts, he can't sense any energy signatures coming from the site of the disaster. This terrifies the Saiyan, making him feel helpless like he did during those early days training with Kakarot, after his scatter had been destroyed what he wouldn't give to have Kakarot around now. By now he has gotten within visual range of the Calamity, an island nine miles off the coast of South City, and he still cannot sense whatever did this. It worries him to go in blind like this, though at least he can tell that this is not an issue with his ability to sense key, as moments later he feels Krillin and Nappa approaching, followed a few moments later by Chaozu and Chi Chi. 
Reddit greets them all warmly, with Nappa joking that next time they should meet up for a barbecue rather than a world-ending calamity. Krillin quips that he'll bring the largest T-bone steaks they've ever seen, and then a heartbeat later, he dies. A bolt of ki tears through the monk's body, and as it explodes, the remaining Z fighters scatter. Urgently, Reddits calls out to ask if anyone else sensed that, but he receives a resounding no from the others, confirming his fear that whatever did this can't be sensed. Nappa growls that in that case, why don't they just blow up the city and figure out the rest when the bad guy is dead? Chi Chi protests that there might still be survivors down there, but a snarky male voice says there's not. He made sure of it. Heads all turning, they see a boy with black chin-length hair and a bandana around his neck flying just below them, and when he sees that he has their attention, he smirks and fires off a tiny key blast. Once again, everyone scatters, but this time Chiaotzu is too close to the blast, and so the others are forced to watch his charred corpse plummet into the ocean. An equally sarcastic female voice above them then chimes in that it's not like Nappa's plan would have worked anyway, at most all it would have done is singe their hair. She then floats into view, showing herself to be the twin to the boy, though with blonde hair instead. Still sounding bored, the girl asks which of them they should kill next, but her brother's answer is cut off by Chi Chi ripping into her with a bevy of barbs that range from her slovenly tattered vest to her reprehensible actions in attacking a defenseless city. This annoys the android, who says never mind, she's made her choice, causing the boy to grin that in that case he'll take the big bald guy. The twins then rush at their targets, with 18 decapitating Chi Chi with a single kick to the neck, while 17 drives a punch into Nappa's stomach, which she then powers up with Ki to blow a hole in the bald brute's torso. Neither even have a chance to react, and as Raditz watches their bodies fall like Chiaotzu's, he screams in terror. He is going to die here. He will never see Bulmore Trunks again. Oh god, what if they target West City next? He has to get out of here. He has to get to his family and go somewhere safe. Anywhere. He just needs to see them again. The cyborg duo cackle at this display of fear. And so with a sadistic grin, Seventeen pats Raditz on the shoulder, saying that unfortunately, his number's up. The twins then go back to back, each sticking out a hand through which they begin to charge a tandem key blast. However, Raditz refuses to die here, and so through force of will alone, he makes his body move, but instead of firing off a surprise attack, or trying to counter the android's blast, he turns and flees. The teen's mocking laughter ringing in his ears, Reddits flies at top speed towards Capsule Corp, not even daring to look back. When he senses Bulma and Trunks, he doesn't bother going through the door, instead simply crashing directly through the roof to land in front of them. Furiously, Bulma demands to know what the hell is wrong with her husband. First he upsets Trunks, then he nearly collapses the ceiling on them, but is stopped when Reddits croaks out two terrified words. Everyone's dead. Seeing the terror in his eyes now, Bulma picks up their son and runs over to him, asking him to explain. But Reddit says he will explain later. Right now they have to get to the lookout. Bulma looks baffled, a rare sight indeed for the smartest person on earth, and so Raditz, heart pounding, takes the briefest pause to say that though the others are gone, there is a room on the lookout that will grant him the strength he needs to protect her and Trunks. Bulma demands to know exactly what he is defending them from, but Raditz himself doesn't even know, and so he simply pulls her and Trunks close, then takes off at top speed. Even with the encumbrance of Bulma and Trunks, Raditz is able to fly up to the lookout in no time at all. And as he expected, he sees Mr. Popo waiting with a deeply troubled look on his face. Crouching to look his family in the eye, the tall sand tells them to stay with Popo while he goes to train. Then, without waiting for their response, he begins to sprint towards the time chamber door. He still has a year and a half left in the chamber before the door vanishes, so if he makes use of that, he should be able to power up enough to defeat those monsters, whatever they are. Then, just as he is about to lay a hand on the time chamber door, he hears the sound of a key blast, followed by a shriek from Bulma. Whipping around, Reddits just barely avoids a blast that would have killed him like the others. But when it hits the door, it detonates, bowling him over onto his stomach. Looking up, he sees those two smirking teens floating just above the edge of the lookout. The girl sneers that if he's gonna flee with his tail between his legs, next time he should do something to suppress his power, since he basically just lit up their path like a flare, leading them right to this place. The boy then adds it's too bad he's an android like them, since then that wouldn't be an issue, and he wouldn't be about to watch his wife and kid get smoked. He then begins to charge up a blast in his hand aimed at Bulma and Trunks, so Raditz does the only thing he can think of, and fires a double sundae at the bot. This hits and blows Seventeen's attack away, causing the twins' attention to switch over to Raditz. Eighteen then fires a small blast that knocks Raditz over again, this time onto his back. As the sand glances up to see the only entrance to the time chamber destroyed, Eighteen smirks that based on that look on his face, wherever that door led was important. Oh, she hopes it was important. 
Seventeen reminds her that he was the one who actually destroyed it, so he should get the credit. But Eighteen chides him to stop acting like a little kid. What matters is they broke the long-haired guy's spirit, just like they're about to break his body now. However, if anything, Raditz's spirit is lifted as he sees Bulma capitalize on the duo's bickering to pop a capsule containing a small plane and rush onto it with trunks. At least they can get away. That is until 17, without even looking back, fires a blast that makes the back of the plane explode and tumble off the edge of the lookout. He then sniped that he supposes he shouldn't expect any credit for that awesome kill either, when he didn't even look back at the explosion. Raditz doesn't hear what 18 says in response, or anything else for that matter. All he can hear is a ringing in his ears. Bulma. Trunks. They're dead. And they're dead because he brought them here. Anguish unlike anything he ever imagined possible threatens to swallow the Saiyan, and part of him wishes to allow it to do so, to let him die of this heartbreak so he can see his family again. But pride and even stronger rage stop him. He cannot die yet, not until he has made this pair pay for everyone they've killed. And as he embraces his righteous fury, Raditz's hair shines golden, and he truly becomes the Super Saiyan of legend. This transformation catches the android's attention, and as Raditz staggers back to his feet, 18 smirks that he's gone and made himself blonde, but if he thinks flattery will make her spare his life, he's sorely mistaken. 17 meanwhile smirks that seeing that makes him want to go back to his natural colour. After all, blondes have more fun, and he's going to have so much fun beating this yutz to death. Raditz has no counterquip, instead silently lunging at the twins. His fist connects with Seventeen's jaw and actually manages to push his face back, but only slightly. Eighteen laughs at this, saying Seventeen better watch out or Cousin It over here is going to pose a real threat. Raditz then pivots, slamming a flying roundhouse kick into Eighteen's side. Sarcastically she says, ow, then drops an elbow which breaks his leg at the knee, causing it to poke upwards at an awkward angle. Raditz screams, and Seventeen calls this the most annoying sound in the universe, grabbing him by the back of the head and driving it through the thick tile of the courtyard, sending Raditz plummeting into the depths below. Dropping out of Super Saiyan, Raditz lies there and weeps. He failed everyone he loves. Bulma, Trunks, Kakarot, Gohan, his human friends, all of them are gone. Up above, he hears the teens debate how they should destroy this place, before settling on a good old-fashioned beam barrage from overhead. The Saiyan cannot even find the strength to move, as he sees the glowing key orbs through the hole he fell through, and so simply closes his eyes as he hears them fire. However, the natural instinct to survive is not one so easily overridden, especially in someone like Raditz, who has spent the majority of his life thinking of ways to save his own hide. And so as the lookout explodes and comes apart, he uses the last of his will to steer himself out of the path of falling debris, so that when he crashes to the ground, it is a small way away from the pile of rubble that otherwise would have been his tomb. He still cannot sense the androids, so he has no way of knowing if they're gone or not. But judging by the way they haven't come down to finish him off, he has to assume they've either lost interest, which seems unlikely, or whatever key sense they have is more rudimentary than his own. But then Raditz notices another key. No, two keys. They're faint, but he knows them. It's Bulma and Trunks. Forcing his battered body to float, he takes off as fast as he can towards the power signatures, and promptly finds them emanating from inside a crashed plane. Bulma, genius that she is, must have managed a crash landing, even after that psychopath blew up the back of her plane. Tearing off the dented door like tissue paper, Raditz is greeted by a sight of great joy and great tragedy. His family are alive like he hoped, but both of them are badly injured. Rousing herself through force of will alone, Bulma pulls trunks from the wreckage, then disentangles herself before looking over to her husband, and in a serious tone asks what they do now. Raditz can't help but admire her stoicism in the face of pain and loss, and he takes a moment to tell her how incredible she is, and how much he loves her and trunks, pulling them both into a hug. However, peaceful moments like this can only afford to be fleeting in this new world of hell, and so after too brief an interlude, they set to work. To their horror, when they head for home, our favourite family find West City in flames. The androids, having seen this place while tailing Raditz, had decided to raise it for a bit of fun, and so Bulma in particular watches as the place she had lived her whole life, the place where her unsuspecting parents had been, is now reduced to merely a graveyard, and a monument to the sadism of androids 17 and 18. 
With Capsule Corp and the lookout gone, Raditz wants to take shelter at Kame House so he can have his one-time mentor help him and Trunks train for a rematch with the androids. However, Bulma warns that this might be too dangerous since Raditz, Roshi and Trunks are probably the three strongest people on Earth right now, so them gathering might just act as a beacon for the androids. Raditz reluctantly agrees with his wife and so tries to think up an alternative hiding place. Thanks to his deduction about the android's power sensing capabilities not being built for long range scanning, Raditz comes up with the idea to stay far away from urban centers since it seems like these are the mechanical menace's favorite places to torment. Thanks to her adventures, Bulma knows a few places like Grandpa Gohan's house, Yamcha's bandit hideout, and the ruins of Muscle Tower that can serve as temporary sanctuaries. However, they dare not even stay in these places long, lest the androids catch wind of them. Day in, day out, Raditz trains, his single-minded drive being to avenge everyone the androids killed. And in time, Trunks joins him, proving both a smart student thanks to his mother's brains, and in time a decent sparring partner thanks to that amazing half-sand potential. The father and son duo grow incredibly close over this time, and seeing Trunks grow, both in power and into a young man, makes Raditz prouder than he ever thought he could have been. Though he also knows how much it hurts his son every time he feels another city die to the android's cruel whim, and it breaks his heart to see him in such distress. Raditz tries to have Trunks harness these feelings of helplessness and anger, in the hopes that he can become a Super Saiyan like he can, though this form eludes the younger Saiyan at every turn. Raditz then tries coaching his son on how it feels every time he transforms, having gotten a handle on the form over the years, thanks to repeated practice. But this is equally fruitless, and it seems like Raditz is the one and only legendary Super Saiyan. However, Trunks refuses to let this seeming limit keep him from giving his whole heart to the cause, and day by day he grows stronger, desperate to live up to the legends he hears of Uncle Kakarot, Aunt Chi Chi, Gohan, Krillin, Tien, Chiaotzu, Yamcha, Vegeta, Nappa, and most importantly the man he admires most, his father. The young man knows that one day soon, the two of them will stop the androids together and save the world. But no matter how much he trains, no matter how hard he tries or how strong he grows, his father always tells him that he's not ready. And this infuriates Trunks, who believes that his father is just being overprotective. Since the androids cannot be sensed, he has no idea how powerful they are beyond a faint traumatic childhood memory of being shot out of the sky by one of them, but with the overconfidence and impatience of youth, he firmly believes that he could take them on, even if he isn't the Super Saiyan. And when Trunks is 14, he gets the chance to test this theory. While training with his father up in the mountains, Trunks feels the horribly familiar feeling of slaughter, though this time with a dreadfully familiar twist. The massacre is taking place in Jingle Village. Trunks remembers his time there, visiting with his parents while they were hiding out in the ruins of Muscle Tower. He had built snowmen with the other kids, and his mum had let him sneak a sip of her mulled wine. He had been able to be a normal kid that day rather than a saviour in training, and now all those people are going to die. Urgently he looks to his dad and says they've got to go help them, but Raditz shakes his head and grimly says they're still not ready. Fed up with his cautious approach, Trunks finally snaps, calling his father an old fool and a coward, and declaring that he's going to save Jingle Village with or without him. Raditz's breath catches in his throat and he throws out an arm as he urges Trunks not to go, but the boy is already gone, rocketing towards the snow-capped village at top speed. As expected, the androids are there, with 17 proudly declaring that he thinks this is a new personal best for him, while 18 is enjoying herself setting houses ablaze with small key blasts. It is her Trunks attacks first, landing a kick from above that sends her crashing down into the snow. The sight of 18 face down in the slush makes 17 guffaw, and he smirks that whoever Trunks is, he's got a lot of guts to do something like that. However, a fuming 18 snarls that he won't for much longer, since she's gonna rip them out. 17 asks if that's really necessary. After all, they've already killed everyone here, and they haven't had a decent challenger since old Pineapple Head forever ago. He then looks up at Trunks, asking if he's any relation, since he has the same sort of spiky black hair, even if it's not as long. 18 snaps back that what does it matter, he'll be dead soon anyway, which 17 affirms with a shrug, saying he would like to play with him a bit more, but Trunks heard the lady, so he's afraid now he's gotta die. Trunks barks back that they're the ones who are going to die, firing off a double sundae with each hand, which bathes the bot in two large beams of pinkish key. Panting from the exertion of putting his all into that attack, Trunks grins down at the resulting smoke cloud, certain that he just killed the androids. That is until 17 quips that yeah, he's definitely related to the other guy, since he recognizes that attack. 
He then bursts from the cloud and drives a fist into Trunks' stomach, winding him as an elbow to the spine since the young sand plummeting towards the ground. Aetian is waiting there, and she flips in midair to kick Trunks in the side, breaking a few of his ribs and sending him smashing into one of the still standing houses. The twins then converge in his position, smirking that he's weak like the other guy too, but oh well, it's still fun to kill weaklings. However, a new voice has other ideas, as it orders the androids to get away from his son. Raditz, in all his super Super Saiyan glory then slams into 17 and 18, knocking them back just far enough that he can put himself between the murderous machines and trunks. The boy excitedly calls out to his dad, saying that he's so glad he's here, and declaring that together they can win this fight, but sternly Reddits tells his son to go home. 18 sneers, asking if he means that little place up in the mountains, and at Raditz's horrified expression, smirks that he kind of really thought they couldn't sense them. 17 gleefully adds that by the look of it, Pineapple Head really did think that, but no, they never lost sight of them for a second. They just let them live since they were the only fun people left on this planet, and they've been waiting for this rematch. This revelation adds desperation to Raditz's voice, as he orders Trunks to get back to his mother and take her somewhere far away from these monsters. Trunks pleads with his father to let him help, even with all his injuries. He is a Saiyan warrior and wants to fight. However, Raditz remains resolute, saying that he needs him to do what he says and protect Bulma. Tears welling in his eyes, Trunks nods and prepares to leave. But before he can, Raditz pulls him into a hug. Raditz tells Trunks that he loves him and is proud of him and needs him to do one more thing for him. Trunks asks what it is, and with all the effort in the world to keep his tone measured, Raditz replies, don't look back. As Trunks departs, Reddits turns back to face his enemies, who jeer that his little goodbye was vomit inducing, but they suppose appropriate since he's never going to see that kid again. Aitin then lazily fires a blast at Trunks' retreating back, but it's stopped when Reddits Z vanishes in front of it, crossing his arms to absorb the brunt of the blow. This leaves the sand with bad burns on both his arms, and Seventeen demands to know what the hell he thinks he's doing when he knows he can't beat them. 18 adds her own barbed criticism, smirking that he should run away back to his little rat hole, since that's all he ever does. Reddit snarls that now he knows that they can track his family, he can't afford to let them keep on living. So this ends today. 17 reiterates his previous point that this is futile, since Reddits can't win against them, they're just too strong. But Reddits gives the droid an evil grin, saying that he doesn't have to win, he just has to make sure they lose with him. He then flares his aura to the max, and it forms a bubble around him with golden flames swirling over the surface. In that moment, he thinks about his many failures, how he was too scared to speak up against Vegeta and Nappa during their days in the Freezer Force, how he was too scared to make the necessary sacrifice when Freezer returned, and how he was too scared to stand and fight when the androids killed all his friends. Well, he's not scared now. His thoughts then turn to his family, his singular success. Bulma, brilliant, beautiful Bulma. She will guide Trunks now that he cannot, and Trunks, his pride and joy. He will shepherd the world into a new age of peace and hope. Raditz knows it, and there is no one he would rather trust with Earth's future. And so, with his mind on the ones he loves most, Raditz lets out a scream that shakes the entire continent, then expires in a flash of golden light. Raditz's final explosion rapidly expands, and for the first time ever, the androids experience fear. This might be enough to kill them, and so despite having maligned their adversary for doing so earlier, the pair flee. However, even at their top speeds, the explosion continues to gain on them, and at the edge of its blast radius, it even manages to consume them. Alas, being the furthest point from Ground Zero, this lacks the full power of the blast, and so while it does wound the twins severely, it is not enough to destroy them. However, in the opposite direction something is destroyed, the last vestiges of a child's innocence. Despite his promise, when Trunks feels the ground shaking, he had looked back, and in doing so, seen his father's final moments. As Trunks feels the last of Raditz's key fade away, he lets out a blood-curdling scream of his own as tears cascade down his cheeks. This is his fault. If he hadn't run off to fight the androids alone, his dad wouldn't have had to sacrifice himself to cover his retreat. This is his fault! And with that realization comes a power fueled by rage, pain, grief, sorrow, and most importantly, love. For it is only the loss of a loved one that can truly cause this much agony. And as that agony grows, so does Trunks' strength, causing his eyes to turn cyan and his hair to shine gold as it spikes up. He has become the legendary Super Saiyan, like his father before him.
Though she cannot sense energy, on some intuitive level Bulma knows what has transpired. And when she sees her son returning alone, and as a Super Saiyan, she has all the confirmation she needs. Weeping silently, she holds her son, and together the pair grieve the loss of Raditz. However, neither mother nor son allow this sorrow to break them, and while Trunks wants to go back out and fight the androids to avenge his father, Bulma urges him not to, saying that his father's sacrifice will be in vain if Trunks dies too. This wounds Trunks, who still feels responsible for Raditz's death, but Bulma tells him that she may have a way to bring him and everyone else back. The boy looks at his mother with shock at this declaration, but when he sees the old confident grin crossing her face for the first time since Raditz's death, he knows it must be true. Bulma explains that she has an idea for a time machine, which if successful could allow Trunks to warn Raditz and the others of the android's arrival, and perhaps they could destroy them in advance. Trunks beams that this is amazing, the first glimmer of hope returning to him at last. It takes over three years for the mother-son duo to put their plan into action without the resources of Capsule Corp, and they are hampered even further by the fact that more than once, they are forced to pack up and start again elsewhere when the androids attack a nearby settlement, no doubt wanting to see if they can draw Trunks out again. However, Trunks now understands his father's reasoning for not engaging and staying hidden, and so though it tears him up inside each time the monsters decimate another group of humans, he never leaves Bulma's side, and instead funnels his righteous fury into finishing the time machine so he can bring everyone back and it can be like this nightmare never happened. Finally, when Trunks is 18 years old, Bulma announces that the time machine is complete at last. By this point, Trunks has allowed his spiky hair to grow long and shaggy as a homage to his father. And as Bulma makes the final checks to make sure everything is ready for her son's journey, she laughs that he looks so much like Raditz now it's scary. She then adds that she's so proud of him for doing this, and she knows that if his father was here, he would be too. This makes Trunks shed a tear, and as he wipes it away, he vows that he will make sure he is worthy of that pride. He then clips his sword belt onto his back, and with a final wave activates the time machine, rising into the air, and then vanishing into the past. We return to this world as Trunks is finishing up his story. The Z Fighters and Bulma all listen with expressions ranging from stoically trying to conceal their fear, to out and out horror. Bulma sits on a rock in front of the young man, clutching one of his hands and wearing a look of deep sorrow for all that her future son has been forced to endure. She then speaks up, commending Trunks for his bravery through everything, but Raditz is less parental, and so rather bluntly asks Trunks why he didn't come back when Frieza first invaded, since if he had killed him then, they could have had Kakarot, Gohan and Yamcha to help fight the androids. Trunks looks at his feet and admits that his reasoning for that is a rather selfish one. He knew that his parents didn't get together until after Frieza's first invasion, so for the sake of his own existence he couldn't risk going back to any point before that. Raditz still doesn't like this, his own history of deceitful tactics making him question the legitimacy of anything Trunks has told them, but he can't deny that at least physically the boy does look like him and Bulma, so he's not going to dismiss it outright. However, nor will he trust him yet either, especially when in a matter of months the baby will arrive, and that will prove the truth of this newcomer's story one way or the other. For Trunks' part, he is disturbed by his father's reaction to his arrival, after mourning the man for three years, to see him again but be greeted with distrust and lack of recognition is heartbreaking for the youth. However, at least his mother is more or less the same, and so he stays close to her, almost feeling like a child clinging to the only familiarity that he can find. The other Z fighters approach the stranger now that he is done talking, and he takes a moment to shake all of their hands. This is his first time meeting Tien, and he can see why his dad always said he was his favourite of Uncle Kakarot's friends. Aunt Chi Chi is another unfamiliar face to him, despite having met her when he was quite young, and so he gives her a smile which she returns wistfully, saying that she wishes Gohan was here, since he would have been so excited to have a cousin at last. Trunks nods that his dad always said he was an incredible kid, and this makes the de facto guardian happy at least. Next up is Krillin, who quips that he sure takes after Raditz, which Trunks agrees with, not sure what else to say. And then finally he meets Nappa. Compared to the others, Trunks knows the least about him, since though his father had told him that they used to be comrades, and Nappa along with the other Saiyan Vegeta were some of the strongest warriors in the universe, he never liked to talk much about his life before Earth. Nappa seems excited to meet Trunks, and says that he'd like to fight him sometime, since the kid said he was the legendary Super Saiyan. Trunks is surprised by this sentiment, saying that Nappa must have fought his dad as a Super Saiyan plenty of times, but Reddits replies that he's not the Super Saiyan the young man described. 
This shocks Trunks further, since for as long as he can remember his dad's been a Super Saiyan, and so he turns to Raditz asking if he's kidding. Raditz growls that he's not, and Trunks goes pale, saying they have to fix that, since without Super Saiyan there's no way they can beat the androids. Coolly, Raditz asks how they're going to fix that, and Trunks says that he'll have to teach him how to be one, smirking a little bit at the irony that after years of his dad fruitlessly trying to teach him how to become a Super Saiyan, now their roles are reversed. Nappa proudly declares that if they're doing special Super Saiyan training, he wants in, and Trunks agrees, saying the more Super Saiyans they have on their side, the better. And so instead of returning to the future as he had originally planned, Trunks decides to stay in the past and help everyone prepare for the android attack. Though Reddit knows the lookout would be the best place to do this training, he still doesn't fully trust Trunks. And so while Chi Chi, Tien, and Krillin go there, he, Trunks, and Nappa return to Capsule Corp so that they can keep the existence of the lookout secret for the time being. The trio of Sands make good use of the gravity room and see exceptional gains during this time thanks to Trunks' power, Reddit's tactical mind, and Nappa's newly acquired bag of tricks from an additional 18 months training with Roshi, though this is not the only benefit they receive. Due to this being the first time Raditz and Nappa have spent time together since Vegeta's departure, the pair are able to talk openly about their history, with Nappa admitting that he only bullied Raditz to keep Vegeta from turning on him, and Raditz in turn showing his growth by forgiving the big oaf, and saying they were both different men before they came to Earth, so perhaps it's time they bury the hatchet and start fresh. Nappa agrees, and so the last two full-blooded sands on Earth shake hands. Even better than this reconciliation with Nappa is the arrival of Baby Trunks, and with it, Reddits finally accepts everything the youth from the future has told him is true. As a result, when Bulma and Baby Trunks are sleeping, Reddits calls his future son up to the roof of Capsule Corp and apologizes for holding him at arm's length for the last few months. Trunks is just delighted to finally see some semblance of the man he admired, and so the two have a heart to heart, reminding Trunks of the nights he and his dad would spend talking after a long day of training. This conversation ends with a initiated by Raditz, and a promise that he will protect his family from the android menace, and that includes Future Trunks. From here on in, Raditz starts to open up more to Future Trunks, and so in turn becomes more receptive to his teachings. This does wonders for his growth, but also puts a new worry on his mind. If everything Trunks said is true, then everyone will die unless they get stronger than even him. This spurs Raditz to suggest that he and his future son make use of the time chamber, and this amazes Trunks, who never knew such a place existed. Though it breaks Raditz's heart to not see his newborn son for a whole year, he at least takes some solace in the fact that infant Trunks probably won't even realize he's gone, and some one-on-one -on -one time might be able to lift a bit of the weight adult Trunks carries on his shoulders. Going back down to only 10 times Earth's gravity actually hampers their training during the early days, and so roughly three months into their year in the hyperbolic time chamber, Trunks heads further into the void to see if there is anything they can put to use. Raditz is eating at the time, until he hears the boy scream, and more specifically scream in pain. Flying at top speed, he feels the heat rising the further and further he gets away from the entrance, and then up ahead he sees Trunks writhing on the ground, flames lapping over his clothes, hair and skin. The Saiyan warrior calls for his son to hang on, but as if the room itself is acting in defiance of him, a wall of flame bursts between them. Trunks' howls of pain quickly grow louder, and Reddit feels fear and anger pull in his stomach. He couldn't save Kakarot or Gohan. As it stands, he's too weak to save his friends and family, and now his son is burning alive mere feet from him and he's too weak to save him. No, no more, he's tired of being a weakling. And with that new conviction, Raditz's hair burns gold, his eyes glow blue, and a powerful new aura bursts from him. This blows away the wall of flames, so that Raditz may approach his son, but as he lands beside him, he finds that the room is calm and temperate once more. Pulling out a senzu bean, he feeds it to Trunks, who rolls over and coughs from smoke inhalation. But when the younger man opens his eyes, his mouth falls open. His father has done it. He's become the Super Saiyan. Now being able to spar in Super Saiyan, Raditz and Trunks' training becomes significantly more intense, and though it still takes many weeks of hard work before Raditz can tap into the form at will, the change in their power when they step back out onto the lookout is staggering. Nappa and the humans cannot believe how much these two have grown in just a day by their standards, and Nappa eagerly wants to go on with Raditz next. However, the other Saiyan advises him to choose another partner, 
existence thanks to his training with Kakarot, Gohan, and Chi Chi before he and Vegeta arrived. He only has six more months at most that he can spend in that dimension. Nappa accepts this, and so says that in that case he'll go with Trunks, since he's still probably the strongest member of their group. Trunks agrees, but says that he'd like to at least have one decent meal and maybe a quick nap before going in for another year of intense training. Raditz hardly agrees, and so the three Saiyans head off to ask Chi Chi if she's got any leftover food they can have, but when they find her, there is a faraway look in her eyes. Raditz asks his sister-in-law what's wrong, and with the same distance in her voice, she asks if he can sense it too. Raditz looks puzzled, and so she gives him a set of coordinates and he begins to focus his key sense. Suddenly, as if he has been hit over the head, Raditz feels Kakarot's key. Staggering back a little at this shocking sensation, he refocuses and finds that Kakarot is not alone. Gohan, Vegeta, Yamcha, Freezer, King Cold, and the Ginyus are all there too. But how is that possible when they're all dead? And stranger still, he senses Chi Chi and Nappa down there as well, despite each of them standing right in front of him. And then, is that his own key signature? Something truly weird is going on here, and so Reddits decides to check it out. Trunks, Nappa, and Tien agree to accompany the Big Saiyan, and so the four-man squad depart down to the surface. The source of the key is located in a forest not far from West City, and when the group touch down, Reddits bursts into Super Saiyan as a precaution, earning a low impressed whistle from Nappa, who says that if he got that from his time in the chamber, then he's definitely going in when they get back. Trunks gives the two Saiyans a disapproving look, his first instinct being to lie low and not draw attention, which loudly talking, or a sudden swell in power, would both do. He then pokes his head out from around a tree, and is presented with a shock of his own. Though he had only recognised a few of the keys seemingly assembled here, he very much recognised the object at the centre of the anomaly, his time machine. Reaching into his jacket pocket, he finds the time machine capsule still there, which just adds another layer of mystery, and so in a whisper he relays this development to the others. He then tells them to stay down and watch as the hatch begins to open. Rising out of the time machine is a large insect creature, who we all know as Imperfect Cell. Thanks to this version of Trunks being the son of Raditz, who is notable for his height, Bulma designed the time machine accordingly to accommodate a larger frame, which subsequently has allowed Cell to fit without reverting, albeit still somewhat uncomfortably. From their hiding place, Tien asks Trunks if he knows this guy, but the hybrid replies that he was just about to ask them that. The others shake their heads, and this stumps the cautious Trunks as to how they should approach this situation. However, ever the blunt instrument, Nappa feels the best course of action is to be direct, and so he steps out from the trees and demands that the bug man explain why he has all their key signatures. Cursing the bald man, Trunks follows in case this stranger turns hostile, and so Tien and Raditz do likewise. At the sight of Nappa, Cell had taken a defensive stance, but when he sees Trunks, this changes, and something resembling a smile crosses his beak-like mouth. Clearing his throat, the bio-android asks if he is correct in assuming that this is Master Trunks, as he drops into a low bow. Trunks furrows his brow at being addressed like this, though he does confirm that he is Trunks, which Cell calls Marvelous. The young half Saiyan then asks if Cell expects him to recognise him, but Cell replies that gracious no, he supposes Trunks wouldn't. He then introduces himself at last, and says that Mistress Bulma sent him back in time to assist Trunks in his mission. Trunks looks a little doubtful, so Cell elaborates, saying that in his time it's been over ten years since Trunks vanished into the past and never returned. As a result, Bulma concluded that even with all their combined strength, they were not able to defeat the androids, and so modified him from a Red Ribbon Army prototype to become the ultimate android buster. Trunks admits that sounds like something his mother would do, calling her incredibly resourceful, and Sol gives another smile, saying he's glad he was able to run into him so quickly, since he was afraid he'd have to scour the whole planet to find him before the android attack, hence why he came almost three years early. Relaxing a little, Trunks says it's a good thing he did, since by the feel of it, Cell's almost as strong as him, and could be a great asset in their training. Cell bows once more, saying that he lives to serve, and so the group decide to return to the lookout, ready to get on with their training now with a new ally in the mix. Meanwhile, Goku and Gohan are a year into their training with Kibito and the Supreme Kai. Thanks to Shin, Goku has been able to gain access to a host of godly abilities, like a more advanced form of the Kai Kai, and the ability to create objects out of nothing. Gohan, meanwhile, has come to understand his own key much better thanks to having someone like himself to study it with, and Shin has quickly come to like the young mortal for his studious and inquisitive nature. Their combat training with Kibito is just as fruitful, if not quite as amiable, since Kibito still doesn't really like having them here, especially when it may be many years before Lord Beerus wakes up and rejects the foolish notion of a Supreme Kai sacrificing his life for a mortal. 
However, it seems that he will not have to wait that long, as during the second year of training, Goku tries his hand at creating a crystal ball to observe his friends and family back on Earth. Though he cannot communicate directly with them, he can see and hear them, and so through observation comes to learn about the imminent android attack. This forewarning compels him to once more ask Shin to revive Gohan, since by now the boy is probably comparable to Final Form Frieza, and with his rage, he could hold the key to victory over the androids. Kibito, in his usual brusque manner, shoots the idea down immediately, reminding Goku of Lord Shin's lifelink, and how he cannot sacrifice the well-being of the whole universe for one mortal, no matter how unfortunate their demise might have been. But instead of discouraging Goku as Kibito had hoped, it seems to give the Saiyan an idea, and in a sly voice, Goku asks Kibito if he has a lifelink with anyone. Kibito answers that he does not, and this makes Goku leap with joy, saying it's settled then, Kibito can revive Gohan. Kibito recoils a little, saying that he couldn't possibly, but Goku grins that when they first met he did say he would do anything the Supreme Kai willed, and it seems like Shin is at least considering reviving Gohan, which means on some level he wants it to happen, or he would have just sent them away. Kibito growls that this is because Lord Shin is too indulgent of mortals, but Goku pleads with him, saying he'll do anything if Kibito does it. Now it is Kibito's turn to see an opportunity unfold before him, and he has to suppress a smug grin. Lord Shin would not approve of this plan, but it's his job to protect him, and that sometimes means from himself. Yes, this is in the Supreme Kai's best interest. He then tells Goku that he will do this, if Goku can complete a test for him, but he will only get three attempts, and if he fails, he must swear on his honour to abandon this quest to have the Supreme Kai forfeit his life. Goku, thinking that he can handle any test Kibito might have, readily agrees, and so the pair shake on it. A few minutes later, Goku and Kibito find themselves on a plateau overlooking the rest of the world, and planted in the center of the stone is a sword. Kibito smirks that Goku's test will be to remove the sword from the stone, before mentioning blithely that even the Supreme Kai has never managed to achieve this. It is at this moment that Goku realizes he might have been tricked. But no matter, they made a deal, and if he can do this, Gohan will be able to go home at last. Planting his feet and wrapping both hands around the hilt, Goku begins to pull, and nothing happens. Goku keeps tugging for several minutes straight without the blade budging an inch, and when he stops briefly to exhale deeply, the attendant Kai tells him that he has ceased pulling, so that counts as his first try. This frightens Goku, so he tries to put his whole weight into dislodging the sword, standing on the cross guard as a lever and tugging backwards, but predictably, this only causes him to lose his footing and go tumbling over the edge of the mesa. After a splash and a wet flight back up, Kibito grins that this was attempt number two, and asks if Goku really needs to bother with a third attempt, when they both know how it will play out. Fiercely, Goku declares that the other tries were just a warm-up, and now he's ready to pull the Z-Sword out and get his son revived. And Goku means this with his whole heart. Rage bubbles up inside him, both at the possibility that he was tricked into this hopeless wager, but also at being so close to saving Gohan, yet so helpless to take that final step. He feels like he did when Libu told him that he wouldn't be able to see the Grand Kai for centuries, and this reminds him of that form he accessed during that fight that made him crazy strong. That is what he needs right now, though he's never been able to conjure it on command. A fact which only frustrates Goku more. He tries tapping into those feelings of anger and frustration, but just like all the other times, this yields nothing. Meanwhile, beside him Kibito is growing impatient, and so he instructs Goku to take a hold of the sword now, or forfeit his final chance to revive Gohan. Gohan. Each time he's used this form, it has been to do with Gohan. Either grief over his death, or fear of failing him. It's not just anger he needs, it's love. And so as Goku lays his hands on the hilt once more, he thinks of the son he loves, of all the experiences the boy will never have unless he succeeds here, of how it was his own foolishness that cost Gohan his life. And in that moment, Goku finally taps into the nexus between rage and love, his hair beginning to spike up and change color, while his eyes also change their hue. His new golden aura flares, and as he screams, the entire mesa crumbles around him. Kibito floats up into the air, shock on his face, but Goku stays where he is, never letting go of the Z-Sword, and this tenacity pays off, as with one final declaration that this will not be the end for his son, Goku shatters the last of the plateau, freeing the sword from the stone and allowing him to briefly hold it aloft. Kibito is awed by this mighty golden warrior bearing the Z-Sword, and starts to wonder if perhaps he misjudged those mortals. But then the impressive effect of Goku's triumph is somewhat undercut by him dropping the sword on his own head, since even as a Super Saiyan, he cannot hold the blade for long. 
Returning to the remnants of the plateau, Kibito examines the Z-Sword and confirms that it truly has been freed. Being a man of his word, Kibito humbly tells the Saiyan to fetch his son, and he will revive him as promised. However, he wants Goku to make one last promise to him in return. Goku nods solemnly, and so Kibito implores him that if ever a time comes when the Supreme Kai needs a protector, he must use this golden form to be Lord Shin's stalwart shield. Goku swears that he will, and at last Kibito feels ready to fulfill his end of the bargain. Back in the Plainlands, Shin and Gohan are just finishing off a lesson when they are suddenly greeted by a stony-faced Kibito and a Goku who now has bluish-green eyes, spiky blonde hair, and is dragging a sword behind him. It is an odd sight to say the least. Shin asks what has happened, and while Goku de-transforms and drops the heavy sword at the Supreme Kai's feet, Kibito recaps their wager and Goku's result in success. Shin says that Kibito should not have been so reckless in his underestimation of mortals, and the pink-skinned attendant agrees, saying that this is not a mistake he will make twice. He then states that now he must honour his agreement, and that he hopes the Supreme Kai will forgive him. Shin says there is nothing to forgive, since his old friend is doing a noble thing here, and this makes Kibito smile. He then closes his eyes, and with a faint twitch of his facial muscles, Kibito falls over, dead. Above Gohan's head, his halo fades away, and Goku runs over to hug him excitedly. Kibito, who now bears the halo in the boy's place, stands up and offers to take him back to Earth so that he may reunite with his family. But Goku shrugs this no need, since he's actually gotten pretty good at Kai Kai in the last few months. And just like that, the two Saiyans vanish, not even staying long enough for the pair of Kai to warn them what'll happen if a deceased person returns to the living world. Up at the lookout, everyone is trained together with their new ally Cell, who has proven an incredibly valuable training partner over the last few months. His strength and knowledge of their techniques have allowed them all to refine their abilities by watching him, and is therefore a much stronger group that suddenly sends two familiar key signatures materializing on the lookout. Running over, they see Goku and Gohan, and so with Chi Chi in the lead, she Reddits and Krillin tackle hug the father-son duo. Goku smiles and it's great to see them, while Gohan says how much he missed them all, earning him an extra tight hug from his mother, who swears that she's never going to let him out of her sight again. While Gohan tries to convince her that he's fine, Reddits helps his brother to his feet and asks why he has a halo. Goku shrugs that he guesses it's because unlike Gohan, he's still technically dead. This shocks everyone, with Tien asking how Goku is even here then, to which the Saiyan admits that he actually doesn't know. A voice then rings out in all of their heads, one that is unfamiliar to most of the Z fighters, but who Goku and Gohan recognize as Shin. He explains that from what Gohan has told him about the lookout and its magic, it exists in the heavenly realm outside of the normal world, making it quite similar in fact to his own world and its relation to other world. For that reason, he theorizes that the same effect which allows the deceased Goku to exist freely in his world also applies to the lookout, meaning that no matter how long Goku stays in the lookout, he won't be pulled back to the other world. When Goku hears Shin's theory, his face splits into an even wider grin than before, and he asks if this means he can stay here. Shin considers for a moment, that feels like a lifetime to the defenders of Earth, and ultimately says that yes he can, though there are a few ground rules that need to be established first. Firstly, if Goku is to remain here, he will be expected to resume his guardian duties, as the Supreme Kai can only allow this bending of the metaphysical rules in the service of something selfless. Goku says that's no problem, and so Shin moves on to the second point, which is more of a warning than a rule, saying that if Goku were somehow to die on the lookout, he wouldn't return to Otherworld, instead his soul would be simply destroyed forever. Goku gulps at this point, but tells Shin to continue, and so the deity gives his final condition, that Goku is not to leave the heavenly realm of the lookout under any circumstances. What he is doing is the result of a great deal of trust being placed in the mortal, and if Goku breaks that trust, not only will Shin recall him to Otherworld, but he will personally see to it that Goku spends the remainder of his afterlife in hell. Goku says he understands, and so Shin wishes him good luck before fading from everyone's minds. The next few days are spent in non-stop celebration of the return of Goku and Gohan. No one is more overjoyed than Chi Chi, who seldom leaves either of their sides, while Reddits and Krillin are simply delighted, taking a chance to test their respective powers against the Saiyan. Neither can compare, which admittedly for Krillin has been the way of things for years, but Raditz is a little disheartened that even after a whole extra year of training, Kakarot has somehow managed to widen the gap between them to the point where it was when they first met. Goku giggles that he did train with the god of all creation after all, so that's bound to give him a leg up, and Raditz can try it if he wants, though he may have to die first. Raditz mumbles that he'll pass, making the turtle school duo laugh, while from the sidelines, Trunks and Gohan watch. 
Gohan has very quickly formed a close relationship with both the baby trunks of his timeline and his future cousin, and he often trains with the latter alongside their two fathers. However, they are not alone, as Nappa and Cell are never far behind. Though Gohan and Nappa have an amicable if not necessarily close relationship, with the Big Sand preferring to spend his time with the adults, it is Cell who most interests the boy. The bio-android had explained his background in biology early on, and this fascinates the scientifically minded Gohan, who feels that with some research, Cell's genetic makeup could do wonderful things for the world. Sol grins that in that case, before he and Trunks return to the future, he will be sure to leave a bit of biomatter behind for the boy to experiment on. And so with Goku and Gohan now back in the mix, training goes even more smoothly, with their remaining time flying by and seeing massive growth for everyone involved. Finally, the fated day arrives, and so about an hour before Trunks said the androids would attack, the group of Gohan, Raditz, Trunks, Chi Chi, Nappa, Cell, Krillin, and Tien depart the lookout, with a fresh crop of Senzu beans and a burning passion to prevent the hellish reality they have been warned of. Goku sees them off with a sad smile, wishing he could take part in the fight with them, but he knows all too well that Shin meant what he said about pulling him back and sending him to hell. And so the Guardian watches what will unfold from on high, placing his trust in his friends and family to step up and prove that they can save the Earth without him. We resume on May 12th, above an island nine miles southwest of South City. The Z-Warriors have assembled to fight the incoming android menace, and so in an attempt to prevent the unnecessary loss of life, split up into teams of two to hunt the villains down. Cell and Trunks are the first team to depart, with Reddits and Nappa going soon after. After them are Gohan and Chi Chi, and then finally Tien and Krillin. Each group knows what to look for, a pair of teenagers, specifically a black haired boy and a blonde haired girl, and to raise their power level as a beacon if they find them. Though everyone is on high alert, no one has any luck, until almost half an hour later, when an explosion rocks the island. Converging on the side of the Calamity, our heroes find not a pair of teens, but an old geezer and a man-sized porcelain doll, both of whom are dressed in some of the strangest attire they have ever seen. Krillin asks if these are the androids, and the pair say that they are, with the doll man calling himself Android 19, while the old man calls himself Android 20. Trunks says they can't be the androids, he'll never forget the faces of the monsters who killed his dad, and these are definitely not them. Gohan then posits that perhaps the presence of Trunks and Cell in this timeline changed something, to which the Bugman eagerly agrees, saying that his memory banks tell him that Android 20 is Dr. Jiro, his creator, and most likely the creator of the other androids. Jiro confirms this, though when he looks around to see the speaker, his eyes go wide and he demands to know what Project Cell is doing here. Cell replies that he's under new orders now, and so lunges at the Doctor, tail raised in attack position. Jiro narrowly avoids the attack, and before Sol can go in for another, Chi Chi yells at him not to fight here, since there are civilians around. Reddit adds that Kakarot always chose remote locations for fights, so they should go somewhere out of the way. Jiro sneers that he's still using that ridiculous codename for Son Goku, is he? Well, no matter the reason, he is one of Earth's greatest minds cracked that little code years ago, so Reddit can stop it, and Goku can stop hiding and come out to face him. Nappa and Reddit protest that it's not a codename, it's his true saying name, while Trunks, striking upon an idea for a scheme, tells Jiro that unfortunately Goku died nearly five years ago fighting Frieza. Jiro calls this impossible, saying that his surveillance drone scoured the battle site, recovering plenty of technological resources, and at no point during that time did they detect any sign of Goku's body. Gohan, picking up on what his cousin is doing, adds his voice to Trunks's, saying that this is because he was vaporized, meaning there was no body. He then adds that if Dr. Jiro's whole vendetta is against Goku, he should probably just give up and go home since his dad's dead. By now the others have figured out the plan and so begin to nod their agreement, but Jiro laughs that they almost had him convinced for a moment. But no, he will not be outwitted. Goku is hiding somewhere like he said, and when he kills all his friends and family, the hero will feel compelled to show himself. Gohan sighs that that's really the doctor's choice, so be it, but he should remember they tried to spare him. The Z fighters then lift off into the air, telling Jiro and his companion to follow, and so the group depart for a wasteland a little way away. Touching down, Reddit's asks Jiro if he's sure that he doesn't want to leave, since he's pretty badly outnumbered here, but the Doctor sneers that they could bring a whole army, and they would still pale before himself in 19. 
19 then steps up to fight, but now it is Raditz's turn to sneer, and he says that in that case he'll take the first fight, since he's been itching for a chance to prove that no robot can best him. Trunks urges his father not to go it alone, but the fight has already begun, with Raditz transforming into a Super Saiyan and lunging at 19. As the Saiyan warrior swings a fist at the bleached bot's head, 19 ducks underneath and drives his own fist into Raditz's gut. He then states in his high-pitched voice that that is the power anomaly the drones detected at the end of the freezer fight, before firing a point-blank key blast that sends Raditz soaring into the distance. As Trunks goes to get him, Nappa steps up, saying that what Android 19 just described is Super Saiyan, the legendary power of their people. However, unlike Raditz, he has a different form, one those whatchamacallit drones have never seen, since he's never shown it off before. He then throws himself at the android, and as he approaches, there is no difference in his appearance, causing Jiro confidently to declare that Nappa is bluffing. However, at the last second before making impact, Nappa's muscle mass increases tenfold, and for an already bulky fellow, this transformation turns him into a flying ball of muscly death. Nappa's now bulging fist makes contact with 19's face, and such is the force of the punch that the spherical face becomes concave on one side, with one of 19's synthetic eyes shattering as the metallic socket is crushed in on itself. Nappa then flies past the bot, reverting to his normal size and panting a bit from the exertion of that move, as Krillin cheers that Nappa just used Master Roshi's muscle form. Nappa confirms this, then spins around to face 19, declaring that now he'll end things with another of his master's moves. He then fires off a Thundershock surprise, smiling that he's broken enough doohickeys in his time to know that when you overcharge a machine, it goes boom. However, instead of panicking, 19 extends a hand, and from the little red gem at the center of his palm absorbs the attack, cackling to himself all the while. Nappa looks shocked, but Gohan states that this device on the android's hand must be some sort of key nullifier, and so they'll have to destroy it if they want to make use of their key-based attacks. From a way away, Trunks says he's on it, then moving at incredible speed appears directly beside 19, and swings his sword down to take the bot's hand off in one fluid motion. Trunks then prepares a point-blank key attack of his own to end things, but is stopped in his track when 19 gives the boy a real Thundershock surprise, by showing him what happens when his unshielded face comes in contact with a live wire. As Trunks writhes on the ground, Raditz re-enters the fray at the same time as Nappa, and the two Saiyans fire blasts at the round robot. But 19 leaps out of the way, and uses the smoke cloud caused by the two key blasts colliding to grab Raditz over the mouth with his remaining hand. He then grins that he is about to terminate Raditz, and starts charging up a key blast against the Saiyan's face. But before he can fire it, his mouth falls open in a comical O shape. Looking down, Raditz sees something pointy sticking out of 19's chest, and as the smoke clears, everyone sees Cell standing behind 19, his barbed tail having impaled the other android. In his gravelly voice, Cell informs 19 that unfortunately he can't allow him to kill Raditz, since his prime directive is to assist Trunks in his mission, and Trunks' mission is to keep Raditz alive. Cell's tail then snakes upwards, and in one ruthless motion, pierces Android 19 right between the eyes, skewering his central processor and killing him instantly. As 19 relinquishes his hold on Raditz and drops lifelessly to the ground, the long-haired Saiyan coughs his gratitude to the big bug, as his son does likewise, shaking off the last of the spasms caused by his electrocution. Cell smiles that he was only doing his job, and so the trio plus Nappa, Gohan, and the humans all converge on Dr. Jiro. Trunks tightens his grip on the sword, saying this time he's not going to fool around by aiming for the arm, but Cell counsels his fellow future dweller to think carefully about this decision, since they still need Jiro alive to show them where the androids from their timeline are. Trunks shouts that they can't risk letting Jiro get anywhere near the androids, since he might team up with them, but Cell counters that they can kill the Doctor long before he manages that, while on the other hand if they allow the real androids to stay hidden, they could strike at any time, which is a much greater risk, and would largely invalidate all the effort they've put into saving this timeline. Jiro tries to use this moment of discord to escape, but as he flees he feels a sudden pain across his elbows and torso, and looks down to see a sword of key bisect him horizontally. As Jiro's limbless upper half clatters to the ground, Krillin as the person who fired the attack approaches him and smirks that Cell said they need him alive, not intact. Jiro calls this an outrage, but Cell tells him to shut up as he places a large three-toed foot on his crater's face and begins to slowly press down. Sounding a little panicked, Jiro calls out that Cell said he can't kill him, so even now he still has the upper hand. In unison, Trunks, Gohan, and Raditz quip that that's ironic coming from a man who just lost both hands, but ever serious Cell grins that the Doctor is right, he can't kill him, but he has something in mind far worse than death. 
He then lifts Hiro by the head and blasts off into the sky. The others don't know what their friend is planning and so take off after him, and to their shock quickly realize that Cell is taking Hiro the lookout. With his head start, the bio-android and his prey are the first to land. With a startled Goku demanding to know what Cell's doing bringing Jiro here. Menace in his voice, Cell replies, Negotiating. Then storms past the Guardian. When he reaches the door of the time chamber, Cell kicks it open and thrusts Jiro forward, so he has no choice but to stare into the endless void of white stretching before him, and start to feel the pressure of the magnified gravity. In a low voice, Cell then asks Jiro if he implanted all the androids with salvage scatters from Frieza's first invasion, like he did in his timeline. And still trying to sound haughty, Jiro replies that he did. Sol grins that this is wonderful news, since it means the Doctor will have a way to contact him when he's ready to be more cooperative. Then, without a moment's hesitation, hurls Jiro's mutilated head and torso deep into the chamber. By now the other Z fighters have arrived, and they all witness this display, as well as Sol slamming the door and turning to face them with a self-satisfied look on his face. Once more Goku asks Sol what he's doing, and Sol grins that from what he's heard about the hyperbolic time chamber, it will surely break Jiro's spirit in no time, which will in turn lead him to telling them where androids 17 and 18 are. Chi Chi gasps that what Cell's proposing is torture, but Cell growls that Jiro is a genocidal madman trying to initiate the end of the world. If anyone deserves a little torture, it's him. Goku, Gohan, and the humans protest, saying that for all his sins, he's still a person and no one deserves that sort of cruelty. However, Trunks, Raditz, and Nappa admit that they actually agree with Cell on this one. This causes the Z Fighters to all look at each other with reproachful expressions, but Cell speaks up, appealing to Goku directly. He says that Goku made the ultimate sacrifice for Earth, and it's clear that he would go to any lengths for his home, and his friends, so he must understand how Cell feels when he says that he will do anything, no matter how much he may regret it, to prevent the hellish future he and Trunks live in from coming to pass here as well. Goku admits that he does, and so the big bug pats the Guardian on the shoulder in a gesture of solidarity, thanking him, and asking him to trust him when he says that this is in the best interest of Earth and everyone who lives here. Goku gives no response to this, instead simply warning Cell that if Jiro's in there for more than two years, the door will vanish, and they won't be able to get him out. Sol breezily replies that who said anything about getting him out? Let the old monster waste away in isolation. But when even hardened veterans like Raditz and Trunks give him a look of disgust to this claim, he hastily adds that this was a joke, and that he's certain Jiro will crack long before the two year time limit is up. And so the waiting game begins. Sol guards the door, his eyes closed as if waiting for any ping on his indolt scouter, though even in this state he is alert enough to intercept Chi Chi and Krillin when they attempt to sneak into the chamber to check on Jiro. Chi Chi makes the point that he might die in there if left alone, and then they'll be left without their only lead. But Cell assures her that Jiro is alive and will be for a very long time. A look of shame then crosses the bug's face, and he confesses that for all his attempts to be nothing like his creator, at his core they are the same, and so that is how he knows that it is not food or drink that sustains Jiro, it is spite, and the miserable old codger will be stewing in it right now, all alone in the crushing void. Meanwhile, Goku is training with Nappa, having watched the fight with 19 and been quite impressed by the power of the bald man's muscle form. Super Saiyan is vastly superior in the long run, but in short bursts Nappa manages to give the Guardian a run for his money. To the side, Reddits and Trunks are both talking with Gohan. They both praise his quick thinking and analytical mind for not only pulling a fast one on Jiro, but also figuring out all his tricks and tactics as well. Gohan smiles, though when he spots Sol from the corner of his eye, he grows uneasy, still being in two minds about what they're doing with Jiro. And worse, the impact Jiro's appearance has had on their usually docile bug buddy. Thankfully, Unky Raditz is there to calm the boy's furrowed brow, and so he and Trunks offer to train a bit with Gohan, since he's still yet to become a Super Saiyan, and thanks to Trunks they do know it's possible for a hybrid Saiyan to attain the form. Gohan agrees, and so the rest of the day is spent in training. With each passing moment, everyone's nerves strain more and more, as the battle of wills with the not-so-good Doctor stretches into the night, and even into the next morning. The next day is spent similarly, though with Chi Chi now trying to take her family's mind off the tense situation by proposing they all have a picnic in the lookout's garden. Even Bulma and Baby Trunks come up for this, and the other Z fighters join in when it becomes clear that the invite is extended to them as well. The only one not in attendance is Cell, who stays outside the time chamber door, now visibly agitated by Jiro's stubborn refusal to give up. 
Shortly before dawn on the second day, Goku approaches the bio-android and tells him the hyperbolic time chamber is too valuable a resource to lose. So if Jiro hasn't cracked by 9am, which will be almost two full years for the Doctor, then he will enter the room himself and bring Jiro out. This frustrates Cell, but he complies, and so when the others come out to see if there is any news, they find the bug pacing back and forth, muttering darkly to himself. Gohan tries to comfort the bio-android, who gives him one of his odd beak-mouthed smiles and pats the boy's head, saying that he has a good soul for caring so much about him, even though he's an android like the enemy. But Gohan smiles that even if he is an android, that doesn't make him like Jiro or the androids from his timeline, any more than being a Saiyan makes Gohan like the evil Saiyan's Anki Reddit's told him about. Soul was given a chance to be good, and just like his dad and the other Saiyans here, that's what matters. Soul calls Gohan a wise young man, and even when Gohan departs, he seems to mull these words over. 8.55 comes and goes with no word from Jiro, then 8.56, 57 and 58. Finally at 8.59, Goku tells Cell that he's sorry, but time's up, so they may have to accept that Jiro isn't going to tell them where the androids are, and if their energy really can't be sensed, then this might be the end of this fight. Cell growls his annoyance, but then the slits of his pupils shrink to pinpricks, and he calls for silence. The Z fighters agree, and so for a moment there is stillness as Cell listens to something before grinning that Jiro has agreed to lead them to his lab. The heroes are delighted by this, and so Cell collects Jiro before everyone, sans Goku, departs the lookout. When they reach Jiro's lab, Cell grows furious, and Trunks, assuming the bug feels the same anger as him at being so close to the androids that ruin their world, puts a comforting hand on his shoulder. However, Cell admits that that isn't it. It's that this is the lab where he was made, so not only does it bring back painful memories of the monster he was before Mistress Bulma, but also infuriates him that he wasted so much time when he should have guessed the Doctor would be too arrogant to plan for one of his creations turning against him. Jiro doesn't protest this claim. And this twigs something in Gohan. The Jiro has been oddly quiet and self-assured after leaving nearly two years of agonizing isolation. The boy points this out to his allies, and Raditz says he's right, demanding to know what Jiro is planning. Jiro just sneers that a simpleton like Raditz couldn't begin to comprehend his grand design, but he should know that from the beginning everything has played out exactly as he has planned. The Saiyan fumes at this insult, but Trunks mockingly asks if Jiro planned for this, then swings his sword downwards, bisecting the madman and silencing him permanently. As the two halves of Jiro clatter to the ground, specks of purple fluid also fall, and Trunks looks up to see that in his overzealous response, he accidentally cuts Cell's hand almost perfectly in half. The son of Raditz apologizes, but his fellow future dweller says he's fine, before holding the wound with his other hand and allowing his biology to knit his hand back together. However, unlike the cell of Cannon, this is a feat requiring concentration, which takes more time and stamina, thanks to his Namekian DNA making up less of his overall genetic makeup and coming from a weaker version of the source. When Cell is fully healed, the group finally blow open the doors to the lab and step inside to find several pods bearing the designation 17 and 18. Cell gleefully tells his comrades to stand by, since he was designed specifically to neutralize their powers, and so approaches the pods. Piercing through them with his tail, he absorbs 17, followed by 18, and then is overcome with a white aura that radiates power the likes of which the Z fighters have never felt. Not only in terms of its incredible strength, but also because of how as it grows, it becomes harder and harder for everyone but Gohan to read. Soon it reaches the state where only Gohan can read it accurately, and at this point the hybrid Saiyan feels something chilling, the unmistakable presence of evil in Cell's aura. When Cell's metamorphosis is complete, he stands tall, handsome and regal in his perfect form, and as he surveys the others, Gohan feels it again, pure malice. In a worried voice, he asks the bio-android if he's feeling alright, and when Cell sees the concern on his face, he smiles that he's never felt better, and starts walking towards the group to show off his new perfect form. However, before he can even make it three paces, he screams and collapses to his knees, hands clutched around his head. The big bug then yells that the evil android's programming is trying to reset him to his villainous ways from before Mistress Bulma found him, so he needs the other's help at once. The heroes naturally rush in to assist, and only when they get close do they see the sinister smirk on Cell's face, right before he raises his arms to reveal that he wasn't in fact clutching his head, but instead charging an orb of key behind it. He then allows himself the smallest of benign Michael cackles before slamming the key ball into the ground beneath the Z fighters and smirking, just kidding. 
The entire mountain is then flattened into a plateau by this attack, and when Gohan's vision returns, he sees that the humans are all unconscious, with many bad burns afflicting their bodies, while his uncle, cousin, and Nappa are in little better condition, even if they are still standing. Trunks takes the lead, being the first to lunge at Cell. Sword drawn, he swings at the biomechanical villain, but Cell simply extends an arm to shatter the blade cleanly in two, and send the top half spinning into the air. He then gloats that Trunks should know nothing he said about his future is true. Trunks did return in his timeline. He even managed to kill the androids and avenge his dear daddy. But then he, Cell, awoke and slaughtered both him and his mother, making his whole heroic quest utterly pointless. Trunks growls that it's not pointless if he freed the world from android tyranny. And this irks Cell, who says that if the spiky-haired youth is the arbiter of what is and isn't pointless, he should tell him where this falls on the scale. He then grabs the top half of Trunks' blade out of the air and stabs it through Trunks' hand, exactly where Trunks split his earlier. The pain is unbelievable, and as Trunks passes out from it, Raditz rushes in to tend to his future son, while Nappa steps up to face Cell. Like in the battle with 19, he attempts to use a quick switch into his muscle form to batter the bug, but Cell has seen this trick before, and so as Nappa goes sailing through Cell's afterimage, the bio-android appears behind him and delivers a chop just below the neck which shatters Nappa Nappa's spine, completely paralyzing him. Cell then advances on Gohan, and when Raditz sees this, he charges in from behind, becoming a Super Saiyan and firing off a double Sunday. Sensing this, Cell turns around and counters the attack with a lazy Kamehameha, which causes both attacks to detonate. He then looms out of the smoke and delivers a wicked headbutt to the top of Raditz's skull, which not only knocks him out, but causes a large crater to form beneath the long-haired Saiyan, so that when he falls, several small boulders fall in as well to bury him. With the Saiyans now dealt with as well, Cell returns to his original plan and approaches Gohan, kneeling down to cup the boy's trembling face. In an almost fond tone, Cell informs Gohan that he is the only one of the Z fighters he actually respects, since the boy always treated him as an equal, rather than training equipment or a weapon against the androids. For that reason, he intends to give him two gifts, the first of which is that he will allow Gohan to walk away from this encounter unharmed, the second he will give in four days' time to celebrate the boy's tenth birthday. Nervously, Gohan asks what it is, and Cell smirks that the boy really doesn't like surprises, does he? Dryly, Gohan questions if Cell would, if the last one he received was a friend of several years betraying him. Cell retorts that he was never the Z Fighter's friend. He merely got ambushed before he was ready and had to keep up the ruse until they invariably led him to the androids. However, he wasn't lying when he said Gohan possessed a wisdom beyond his years, and so his second gift is one inspired by Gohan himself. A chance. Specifically a chance to defend Earth from him, or a chance to run and live out their last few days off the battlefield. What they do with that chance is up to each of them, but Gohan should tell the others that when the fated day arrives, he will be fighting to the death. And should he still be standing by the end of the day, he will destroy the planet. And then, without another word, Cell departs, leaving Gohan to tend to his friends and family, and share the grim news that in four days' time, either Cell will fall, or the Earth will. We return to our heroes in their lowest ebb. Cell deceived them, betrayed them, and left their bodies and pride broken on the floor. Gohan is the only one to walk away from the encounter unscathed, sets the duty of dispensing senzu beans, his mind racing with Cell's warning. In four days' time, the bio-android will give the defenders of Earth a chance to fight him for the sake of the world. But after the beating they just received, what chance do they have really? Slowly, Gohan's family and friends begin to rise and shake off the scars of defeat. Nappa is the last to get to his feet, the Senzu needing to fix the most trauma, since he was paralyzed from the neck down during the fight. But it quickly becomes clear that he has regained full usage of his hands at least, when he wraps one around Gohan's throat. The other Z fighters roar in shock and fury at this action, with Chi Chi and Raditz flaring their powers in direct challenge to the bald bruiser. But Nappa doesn't even look at them, instead glowering at Gohan that he wants answers. Why didn't he help them fight Cell? Gohan struggles to answer while being choked, so Nappa drops him, and as the boy gasps and wheezes, the adult Saiyan continues his accusations, saying that not only did Gohan not help in this most recent battle, but he also stood on the sidelines during the battle with the androids. Chi Chi snarls at Nappa to leave her son alone, but Gohan tells her that he's right. He didn't help against Cell or the androids and it's because he was afraid. 
Silence falls at this declaration, and Gohan looks up from the ground, though the eyes he meets are not Nappa's, his mother's, or Anki Raditz's. It is Krillin who he looks to. He then asks Krillin if he remembers what it felt like to die. Krillin nods soberly, and a deep sorrow fills Gohan's voice, as he admits that ever since coming back to life, he hasn't been able to get that feeling of dying out of his mind. And then when it came time to fight, all he could think about was the prospect of going through that again, and how he couldn't bear it. It made him freeze up, and he's sorry. Nappa growls he supposes it's not his fault, it's his earthling side giving him this unsane like fear of death. But this is just the wrong thing to say, as Trunks, who is also half Saiyan, steps up for his cousin, saying that what Gohan's feeling isn't a weakness, it's proof that he's got the foresight to properly assess a situation, rather than just rushing in like an idiot. Raditz agrees with his future son, praising Gohan's survival instincts, and promising that they will grant him a long life, while Chi Chi just holds her son, trying to transmit as much comfort and reassurance as she can through her touch. With nothing left to say on the matter, the majority of the group prepare to return to the lookout, The Trunk selects to stay behind and do some research, since even if the lab is mostly in ruins, he theorises that maybe he'll be able to find something they can use against Cell, or even the androids of his timeline. When the rest of the Z fighters arrive at the lookout, Goku is waiting for them. His stony-faced expression tells them that he saw the events of the lab transpire. But unlike the others, there is something like eagerness behind his eyes, as he tells them it's time they formulate a plan to kill Cell. Gohan asks his father if it's even possible at this point, but Goku lays a hand on the boy's shoulder and grins that he knows it is, because he has faith in each and every one of them. This lightens the mood somewhat, with Raditz stepping up to stand beside his brother, and asking what he needs him to do. Goku's grin then turns to Raditz, and with a light chuckle he replies, What we do best? Train. He then lays out his plan for them to split up into groups and use the hyperbolic time chamber, like they did in preparation for Vegeta and Nappa's arrival. Though this time they have a much shorter training window, so they can't afford to waste a single second. He also lays out a few training objectives, namely to get Gohan and Nappa to go Super Saiyan. Though here Nappa declines, saying that he knows he can never catch up to the sons and grandsons of Bardock in terms of power, so he'd rather hone his own sort of power, and work on something he thinks will serve the group better. The other Full Blood Sands can respect this, and so the Guardian gives his blessing, with Nappa departing to do his final training at Kame House. With him out of the equation, the breakdown on time in the chamber becomes much simpler, since Raditz has six months remaining in which he can use the chamber, Trunks when he returns has a year, Goku has a little under a year and a half, while Chi Chi and Gohan have a year and a half each. Here Goku reveals another advantage that they have. Now that he's dead, he can join them in the chamber without need for food or rest, meaning that though he is still limited by his time constraints, he is in essence a free training partner. And so it is decided that the first set of warriors to enter the room will be Goku, Gohan, and Chi Chi, who will use a full year. Following them will be Trunks and Raditz to make use of Raditz's final six months. After that, Goku will spend his last five months training Tien and Krillin to really master their Kaioken. Then when he is gone, they will still have seven months worth of food, so he wants them to use that time to practice and build up power. Finally, Gohan and Trunks will enter for their final six months. Since as the only other hybrid Saiyan, Trunks might be the best equipped to help Gohan unlock Super Saiyan before the fight with Cell. Doing some quick math, Tien points out that they will still have a day left over, and asks what Goku wants them to do with that. Goku smiles that he has something special planned for that final day, and everyone looks at him eagerly, expecting some secret training from Otherworld. However, instead Goku replies that on the final day, he wants to hold a birthday party for Gohan, since his actual birthday is going to be taken up fighting Cell. Chi Chi smiles that this is a great idea, while everyone else face falls, not sure if they'll be able to relax and enjoy a party with the threat of global annihilation hanging over them. And so the training begins as planned, with one group at a time entering the room of spirit and time, while the others train outside, often in the lookout's gravity chamber. During this time, Trunks returns, telling the others that he found another android in a pod labelled 16, and so taking inspiration from Cell's fake story, brought it to his mother to see if she could actually reprogram it so it will fight on their side. Everyone agrees that this is a good idea, though Trunks admits that he would have rather blown the machine's head off, and he only didn't since they're in such dire straits. This gives Goku an idea, and so after a quick telepathic chat with Shin, the Guardian briefly vanishes before returning with the Z-Sword, which he hands to Trunks, telling him to train with it instead of his broken sword. Though Goku also adds he'd appreciate it if Trunks went easy on this sword, since he's only borrowing it, and he's scared of what the Kais might do to him if he broke their ancestral relic. Trunks nods his understanding and so gets to work, even though as it stands he can barely lift the sword. 
Eventually, everyone completes their training in the chamber, and as Trunks and Gohan emerge, all eyes fall on them to see if they've achieved their goal. Though both have grown physically and in power, it takes only a glance to realise that even after all this time, Gohan is still not a Super Saiyan. The boy is smart enough to know that this comes as a disappointment to his father in particular, and so goes to apologise. But Goku tells him not to worry about it, since even Trunks, who was the youngest Super Saiyan, was a few years older than him when he first transformed, so maybe his body just isn't mature enough for the form yet. Gohan says he guesses so, and goes to reunite with his mother, who gushes that she's missed him, but in the same breath also states that he needs a haircut, since he's starting to look like his delinquent uncle and cousin. In contrast to Gohan's lack of success, everyone else has found new heights of power within themselves. Chi Chi, Tien, and Krillin have all mastered Kaioken times 20, to the point where they can maintain it for the duration of a fight, while Goku, Trunks, and Raditz have attained Super Saiyan Grade 4. They have also attained the prior grades, but Trunks, being the smartest of them, promptly recognised the weaknesses and so dismissed them, encouraging his father and uncle to do likewise. Nappa, for his part, doesn't seem especially stronger when he returns to the lookout, though everyone can feel that his key control has improved immensely, which he says will allow him to really deliver the payback he has planned for Cell. The following day is Gohan's 10th birthday party, and everyone makes sure that this is an extra special day for the young man. Bulma even comes up to the lookout with baby Trunks and the android Trunks found. He is a giant of a man, with a red mohawk and a gentle demeanour, who introduces himself as 16. Everyone in the group except Trunks welcomes Sixteen with open arms, even though he is one of Dr. Jiro's androids. And this pleases the big bot, who promises that he will do all he can to ensure that they survive tomorrow. This puts something of a dampener on the mood, but even still, it's a celebration that none of them will soon forget, as everyone parties like it is their last day on Earth, acutely aware of the fact that it might actually be. The next morning dawns too soon for anyone's liking, and the Z Fighters prepare themselves for the final showdown with Cell. Just as with the androids, Goku knows that he cannot join them, and so decides to spend the last few hours with his wife and son. They watch the sun rise together, and before they go, the Guardian pulls each of them aside for a few private words. Goku's sentiments for Chi Chi are what one would expect from a husband to his wife, but when it's Gohan's turn, Goku leads him inside the lookout's central building. As they walk, he tells his son that he is proud of the young man he has become, that he has grown into a powerful warrior while still remaining pure of spirit. Gohan blushes a little at this praise, but Goku says that he means it, and that's why he wants him to have something. He then opens the door to his and Chi Chi's room, and lying on the bed is a white gi similar to Goku's robes, except instead of carrying the kanji for God on the breast, it reads, Successor. Gohan asks what this is, and Goku says that it's his way of saying that he finally thinks Gohan is ready to assume the mantle as his successor, and so after today, he would like to start training his son to properly take over as Guardian of Earth in a few years. Gohan is speechless, and Goku gulps that he thought Gohan would like it, sheepishly asking if he would prefer a different colour gi, but the boy says that it's perfect, and wraps his dad in a hug. When the pair emerge, both dressed in white, Chi Chi has to wipe away a proud tear, and the trio briefly hug. The living two then detach themselves, and go to join their friends, as Goku waves them off with a smile, telling them to look after each other, and come home safe. As the only one who can sense Cell's energy anymore, Gohan takes the lead and guides the Defenders of Earth to the Bio-Android's location. To their surprise, they find that Cell has built himself an arena of sorts, and when he sees them, the Bio-Android smirks that he's glad they found the place, and welcomes them to the Cell games. Trunks snarls that he doesn't have time for games, but Cell tuts that he really ought to listen to the rules of these games, since if the heroes break any of them, he's going to destroy the planet. This puts the brakes on Trunks' attack, and when Cell sees this, he leers domineeringly, before continuing that the rules are simple, and largely based off of those of the Tenkaichi Budokai, so even the slowest among them should be able to understand. Anyone may enter the ring at any point they wish, and there is no limit to the number of fighters who can be in the ring at one time. However, if they are knocked out of the ring, they cannot re-enter it, nor can they interfere from the outside. Killing is allowed, obviously, and when he kills or rings out all of them, he wins, and gets to destroy all of them and the planet. Angrily, Chi Chi asks how they win, and Cell chuckles that they won't, but for argument's sake, if they manage to somehow kill him, then they would technically be the victors. Reddits then asks what happens if they ring him out, Cog's clearly turning in his head as to how they might be able to earn a tactical victory. Cell admits that he hadn't considered that, but he supposes for the sake of a fair fight, if they ring him out, he will concede the games and leave Earth. 
However, they should be warned that such an outcome will only be a stay of execution, so if they think a half-hearted win will be enough, they need to think again and start bringing their A-game, since this tawny is kill or be killed. The bio-android then floats into the air and lands in the center of his arena, telling them that the games are now open, so they should come at him when they are ready. For a moment they all consider rushing Cell at once, but Gohan points out that this is probably exactly what the monster is hoping for as part of his love of mind games, and the reason he set up the ring and the ring out rule in the first place. Since if they're all trying to hit him while avoiding hitting each other and occupying a confined space, it will place the advantage squarely with Cell, who can use the Z fighters against one another. Trunks agrees, and so suggests they act in waves, volunteering to be the first wave alongside his father. But Tien shakes his head, saying that after the humiliating defeat Cell handed him and the other humans last time, he wants to have the first crack, and prove that his training wasn't in vain. Krillin says that he feels the same, and so it is decided that they will fight Cell first. The two humans step into the ring and power up to Kaioken times 20 at once. However, this does little to intimidate the bio-android, who sneers that he was hoping to get to the main course, but he supposes appetizers never hurt anyone. He then vanishes, reappearing in front of Krillin, an elbow raised to drop on the bald man's head. However, Krillin is a slippery one, and so uses solar flare at point-blank range to blind the bot. Cell howls in pain, and this is just the opening Tien needs, charging up a Neo Tri-Beam. Lining up his hands, he gets a lock on Cell, and with a cry of Tri-Beam Ha, fires the Golden Blast. It is only by some perverse luck that Cell manages to regain his sight before this hits, and so the mechanical monster manages to lurch to one side just in time. However, he cannot avoid the attack in its entirety, and so to his horror finds that his left arm has been cleanly cleaved off at the elbow. This terrifies Cell, who realizes that had it hit him head on, he might have died, and not to one of the Saiyans, but to a pathetic human. Tien then readies himself to try again, even though such an attack would surely kill him. And knowing this as well, Reddits calls out from the sidelines for him to stop, saying it's not worth throwing his life away for pride. Tien grimly chuckles that his long-haired friend is one to talk, but before he can go through with the sacrificial blast, Cell appears beside him. For a moment, the two warriors stare at each other, then Cell smirks that Tien didn't really think he'd let him go away with that last attack and not pay him back in kind, did he? Tien isn't sure what the Bugman means by this, but is soon enlightened, when with a swift yank, Sol grabs hold of Tien's bicep and tears his arm off at the shoulder. Tien's tribe is immediately cancelled out, but this is the furthest thing from the bald man's mind as he collapses to the ground, unable to even scream as his body goes into shock. To add insult to injury, Sol then swats Tien out of the ring with the warrior's own severed arm, and with murderous eyes, turns his attention to Krillin. The monk gulps, but before he can suffer a similarly gruesome fate, Nappa tells him to quit while he's ahead, as he steps into the ring with Raditz, Trunks, and Sixteen at his side. The bald ruse then asks if they all remember his plan, and the other three nod, each entering into a fighting stance. Cell taunts that any plan thought up by that oaf Nappa should be good for a laugh, and so invites them to take the first move, since he's busy regenerating his arm. The heroes are happy to accept this offer, and so charge in with Nappa in his muscle form at 16 at the head of the procession. Cell scoffs that he should have expected nothing better than a crude frontal assault, and so counters with a lazy one-handed Saturday crush. However, before it can hit any of them, the pair in front split up, allowing Trunks to come to the fore. Wielding the hilt of his broken sword, which he has completed with a new blade of key, Trunks easily slices Cell's blast in half, dissipating its power. Thanks to training with the weight of the Z-Sword, his movements with the Key Sword are dozens of times faster than anything Sol could have anticipated, and so as he fires a series of follow-up blasts, Trunks cuts through all of them, clearing a path directly to Cell. Now upon him, Sixteen grabs Cell in a bear hug, while Reddit stands in front of the bug and begins to perform the Sleepy Boy technique. It is a good plan, however, Cell as it turns out does not need to sleep, and so is immune to such tricks. The bio-android then wrests himself free of Sixteen's grasp, and blows the other bot out of the arena, scattering pieces of him across the planes behind them. With a cackle he asks if they have a backup plan, and Trunks yells that they do, as he tosses a capsule onto the ground between them. With a pop, the item materializes, and to Sol's surprise, he finds that the hero's secret weapon is… an empty mini-fridge? Then from behind him, he hears a single dreadful word come out of Nappa's mouth. Mafuba. At once, Cell understands their plan, and refusing to be caught off guard again, spins around to face the vortex of green key headed his way. Raising his remaining hand, the bio-android flares his aura, and with an immense effort pushes the Mafuba back. 
With a sound like rushing wind, the Muffma rebounds onto Nappa, enveloping him and sending him hurtling into the tiny refrigerator where he is summarily confined. Salt then cackles that, like he figured, any plan developed by Nappa was doomed to failure from the start, and so with an evil grin, asks Trunks and Raditz if they have any other bright ideas, or if they'd rather he just blow them away now like 16. Standing strong, the duo declare that they do in fact have one last trick, as they fire off a father-son double Sunday. The purple beam is huge, and though Sol raises his hand to stop it, this is all he can do, being pushed to the very edge of the ring. Hope swells in the remaining Z Fighters' hearts. All Trunks and Rats need to do now is apply a little more pressure and the day will be saved. But alas, victory will not be so simple, as hanging by Sol's side, his regenerating arm grows its first finger. This is all the bio-android requires, and so as his uninjured hand holds the double Sunday at bay, he raises his new finger, and with a malicious smirk, fires a dodon ray directly at Trunks' heart. Fear fills the young half Saiyan's face, as he sees this and recognizes that he can't block it. But before it can spell death for the youth, he is knocked off his feet by his father, who shoulder charges him out of the way and takes the blast in his stead. Father and son land outside the ring, and Cell cackles that he's disappointed since they almost had him. But Trunks pays this taunt no mind, his entire attention focused on his father. Due to him moving at the time, the Dodon Ray didn't hit Raditz in the center of the heart, meaning that for the moment, he is still alive. However, it is a mortal wound nonetheless, and with all their Senzu beans used up in the first fight with Cell, there is nothing Trunks can do to save him. Tears roll down Trunks' face, but Raditz in contrast is dry-eyed, and with a weak smile, he tells his son not to cry. After so long fearing death, and living for only his own survival, he's found something worth dying for, and he's happy that his end could save someone he loves. Trunks howls that he can't watch his father die. Not again, but from a small distance away, a gentle voice says that he may not have to. Looking up, Trunks sees the singed head and torso of Android 16 smiling at him. The bot then tells him that if they can get Raditz and him back to Capsule Corp fast enough, Bulma may be able to use his parts to save the Saiyan's life. Weakly, Raditz asks won't that kill 16, but the android replies that with his critical damage, he is not long for this world anyway, so if he is to go, he would rather it be to save a life, rather than to end one as he was designed to. Silence hangs between the three heroes, as Raditz finally slips into unconsciousness, and with time running out, Trunks makes the call, thanking Sixteen for this, and in a move that he never would have imagined possible, calling the android friend. The half Saiyan then lifts off, a warrior in each arm, and as he goes, Sol jeers that Trunks can run if he wants, but by day's end everyone on this planet will be dead, so it seems like a futile gesture to him. He then stares down the last remaining Saiyan, Gohan, and to his immense disappointment finds not anger in the boy's eyes, but terror. Cell had hoped that dispatching his friends would incite Gohan to become a Super Saiyan, so they could have one last truly great fight with the only Earthling he respects. But it seems that he misjudged the boy. Sighing deeply, the bio-android asks if Gohan is even going to step up and fight him, and when the youth does little more than tremble, he sighs again, saying that perhaps Gohan needs yet another push. Or in this case, a pull, as with his inherited Namekian physiology, Cell extends an arm and grabbing Gohan by the gi, pulls him into the ring. Chi Chi cries out her son's name, but Cell snaps her to be silent, smirking that now Gohan is in the ring, he better start fighting, or soon he'll go the way of Raditz in 16. Still shaking, Gohan declares that he doesn't like fighting, but if this is really what Cell wants, then he'll do it. He then begins to marshal all the anger he feels at the bio-android for his betrayal, for hurting his friends, and for threatening his home, and with a mighty scream, Gohan fires a Kamehameha. The blue beam is undeniably powerful, possibly even rivaling the father-son double Sunday, but now that Cell has both hands again, it is nothing to him, and with a simple swiping motion, he swats it away into a nearby mesa. The bio-android then groans that this was really Gohan's best, wasn't it? Well, that at least answers one thing. There truly is no point in continuing to spare him. The green bug then vanishes, reappearing in front of Gohan, and with one hand raised, prepares to plunge it into his heart and end the boy once and for all. In the distance, Trunks feels Gohan's power vanish, and a pit forms in his stomach. It truly is over then, not only just for this time, but for the future as well. How could it all have gone so wrong? Meanwhile, Cell feels the unmistakable warmth of blood and ruptured organs on his hand, and looks down to deliver one last witty quip to Gohan before he dies. However, the person in front of him isn't Gohan, it's Chi-Chi. 
the blasted woman must have put herself between him and the brat. Some foolish maternal instinct, no doubt. But no matter, he'll just kill Gohan next. Selden pulls his arm out of Chi-Chi's stomach, but as the woman falls, he finds not the shaking, terrified wretch of earlier. No, now he is facing a shining golden god. But this is not an ordinary Super Saiyan. Gohan's eyes have gone completely white, and at the center of his golden aura is a core of deep blue god ki. Not only that, but his power has skyrocketed far above the other Super Saiyan states, and become undetectable to those not blessed with their own portion of god ki. This is the culmination of Gohan's rage boosts, his half Saiyan physiology, and his innate godly ki. This is Super Saiyan Rage. Super Saiyan Rage Gohan says nothing instead simply cupping his hands and firing off a second Kamehameha, which far eclipses the first. Cell is swept off his feet by this attack, and blown far into the sky, as all over him, small pieces of his body begin to disintegrate. It is a moment of purest terror, but even still Cell persists, and so doing the only thing he can to survive, cups his own hands and launches a counter Kamehameha. This blast meets Gohan's, and thanks to the rapid Zenkai the boy's attack gave Cell, he manages to hold it at bay, but only through the use of his full power. It is a perfect stalemate, however Gohan quickly finds himself at a disadvantage, as just like Goku theorized, his young body is ill-equipped to handle the stress of Super Saiyan, let alone a godly variant which grants more power, but takes a far higher toll. Such is the cost that all along Gohan's arms, patches of flesh begin to burn away as they are eaten up in order to keep him in this state for a little while longer. It is agony, but beyond that, it is a losing battle, as soon Gohan will run out of energy to maintain this power, and then Cell's Kamehameha will consume him and this world. Realizing this, Gohan comes to a terrible conclusion, that if he is fated to die anyway today, he might as well die like his father, in a blaze of glory to save the Earth. Strangely enough, he is not afraid anymore, and so he readies himself to use up all his reserves in one final gambit. However, before he can burn himself out like a dying star, Gohan suddenly feels a pressure on the small of his back, and as warmth floods him, the strain to maintain Super Saiyan rage is slightly diminished. Looking down, Gohan sees Chi-Chi, mortally wounded but still alive, giving the last of her energy to her son. Tears fill the boy's pupilless eyes, and in a small voice, he pleads with his mother to save her strength and live. But in too much pain for words, Chi-Chi merely shakes her head and continues to pump her key into Gohan. As his aura expands to encase her too, it is now Chi-Chi who burns in her son's place, her body being consumed far faster than his was, as the last bastions of her strength can do little more than hold the line. However, Gohan still lacks the power to break the stalemate, and actually overcome Cell's Kamehameha. And up above, Goku knows that in order to do so, the boy will need a much larger pool of ki to draw upon. Recognizing the deep furrow in the Guardian's brow, Mr. Popo asks if Goku's thinking what he thinks he is. Goku nods solemnly, then hands the genie his staff, imploring him to see that Gohan gets it when he is ready, and thanking him for all his help over the years. And then, without another word, he is gone. Using Kai Kai, Goku appears an instant later in the Soul Games arena, and knowing that he doesn't have a moment to lose, he lays his hand beside his wife's on Gohan's back, and begins to pour his energy into his son's, urging him to keep fighting for just a little while longer. Thanks to the copious amounts of energy Goku has to share, Gohan's strength is restored, and now with his parents bearing the brunt of the ki drain for him, he is able to put all of his power into his Kamehameha for one final push. For a moment, the entire sky burns blue, and when it fades, Cell is gone. Returning to his base form at last, Gohan smiles, the day's saved, and they're together. But then the truth of the situation hits him harder than Cell ever could. His mother lies bleeding out, with tremendous burns coating her entire body, while his father is slowly fading away, doomed now to face the Supreme Kai's punishment for leaving the lookout. This is his fault, both of them are paying for his weakness, and with the last of his strength, Gohan cries for his parents not to go. Goku sighs that it can't be helped, but they want Gohan to know that even if they can't be together anymore, his parents will always love him. And with these final words, Goku fades away, unable to resist the pull of Otherworld any longer, while down below, the last light leaves Chi Chi's eyes. Neither warrior has any regrets as they go to meet their destinies, though the same cannot be said for their son, and as he stands alone in the Soul Games arena, Gohan weeps and contemplates all this victory cost.
It has been three days since the Cell Games, and Trunks is preparing for the voyage home. Thankfully, his injuries were minor, so he needed little recovery time thanks to his hardy Saiyan genes. Sadly, the same cannot be said for his father, who moments later comes limping into his bedroom. Thanks to Android 16's sacrifice, Bulma was able to transplant his mechanical heart into Raditz, saving his life. However, the Saiyan has a lot of rehab ahead of him before he'll be up to fighting like he used to. Even walking proves difficult during this early adjustment period, and that is why the big man's arm is slung over Tien's shoulder. Bulma had offered to give the Triclops one of 16's arms as a replacement, but he had politely refused, saying he would rather keep this wound as a reminder that once he was enough to terrify the greatest threat Earth had ever known. Greeting the two men, Trunks asks how they are feeling, and both stoically reply that they are fine. Reddits then asks if Trunks is done packing, an air of sadness in his voice, and Trunks confirms that he is, saying that growing up on the run taught him to pack lightly. The big Saiyan then mumbles that Trunks doesn't have to go, that is, if he'd like to stay, he would always be welcome in this timeline and at Capsule Corp. Trunks smiles, realising the effort his usually guarded father must have put into exposing himself like this emotionally, and so thanks him for the offer, but says that this timeline already has a Trunks, and because of his father's heroism, he will be able to grow up in a world free of the androids. Reddit says he figured Trunks would say that, but he had to at least try to keep him around, before adding that even if he's not the same Reddits who raised him, he knows that any version of him would be proud to have him as a son. The pair then hug, before Trunks takes his father's weight off of Tien's shoulders, so they can walk down to the courtyard together. Outside of Capsule Corp, everyone is waiting to see Trunks off. The hybrid thanks them all, shaking hands with Nappa, Tien, and Krillin, before turning to Gohan. The boy hasn't said a word since the battle, only surviving thanks to Krillin and a newly released Nappa carrying him to the nearest hospital. Taking a knee so they can see eye to eye, Trunks solemnly tells his cousin that he knows exactly what he's feeling, and maybe this isn't what Gohan wants to hear right now, but what happened with his parents isn't his fault. Gohan says nothing, his only response being to let tears flow down his cheeks. Trunks makes no move to stop this, knowing this is what his cousin needs, and so simply pulls him into a hug and whispers that though Gohan can only see darkness now, one day the sun will rise again. He just needs to hold on and stay strong until then. He then goes to make his final goodbye, that being Bulma. The pair share a deep hug, with even Baby Trunks, who is honestly more of a toddler at this point, pulling on his older counterpart's hair as a gesture of farewell. The adult Trunks smiles at them both to be safe and look after each other, and when Bulma gives her love in return, he floats into the air and lands in the cockpit of his time machine, setting a course for home. It is only a matter of seconds for Trunks, but around him, 20 years pass and he finds himself outside the long abandoned ruins of Capsule Corp from his timeline. So changing the past hasn't changed the future. A shame, but one he was prepared for. And so Trunks flares his key, hoping it will summon the androids quicker, since the sooner he dispatches them, the sooner he can see his mother again. Trunks doesn't have to wait long for androids 17 and 18 to arrive. The pair look unchanged despite three years having passed since he left, but the same cannot be said of Trunks. And so 17 comments that the kid's really been hitting the gym lately. Good for him. Too bad it won't do a lick of good against their flawless android power. Smirking, Trunks asks if the black-haired bot is done talking, and with an annoyed grunt, Seventeen says he guesses he is, since now he's in more of a killing mood. Still smirking, Trunks says he took the words right out of his mouth, then vanishes, only to reappear moments later behind his enemy with his key sword drawn. Six swift slashes of the glowing blade are enough to turn the once insurmountable android into mincemeat, and as the chunks that once made up Seventeen's body hit the ground, Eighteen gasps. However, she is not given long to mourn, as a key blast finishes her off seconds later. And just like that, the world is at peace after two decades of android tyranny. Only now does Trunks allow himself to relax, and with a smile on his face, he flies off in the direction of the last hideout he and his mother occupied. Bulma is waiting for him, and when they see each other again, happy tears run down both their faces as the blue-haired woman throws herself into her son's muscular arms. Mother and son talk late into the night about Trunks' adventures in the past, and while she is sad to learn of the cost of their victory, and the fact that changing the past cannot undo the horrors of this timeline, she is immensely proud of her son. Being an eternal pragmatist, Bulma immediately wants to set to work making preparations for this version of Sol's arrival, but Trunks says that before they do anything else, there is someone he would like to pay a visit, as he pulls a large hard drive from his breast pocket. And then without another word, he takes off into the sky. 
Landing outside a heavy steel door hidden within a mountain face, Trunk steps into the abandoned lab of Dr. Giroux. He is pleased to see that his target is still intact. Firing up the computer, Trunks opens the final undisturbed pod, and from it steps the hulking frame of Android 16. Being newly activated, 16 asks Trunks why he has been awakened and who the young man is. Smiling, Trunks replies that 16 has been activated to help defend the world from a terrible threat. And as for who he is, he is a fellow defender. And in another life, the two of them were comrades and even... friends. A few months pass with Bulma, Trunks, and Android 16 making preparations for the inevitable arrival of Cell. During this time, Bulma is able to transfer all the memories stored in the hard drive Trunks brought back from the past into this future version of 16, allowing the heroic Android to live again. He is pleased to see Trunks, and the feeling is mutual, with the future warrior asking the Android if he would be willing to fight Cell by his side once more. Sixteen smiles that though he's not violent by nature, nothing would please him more, and so the pair set to training, just in case this cell is more powerful than the one they're expecting. Finally, the fated day arrives, and while Trunks is inspecting his time machine out in the open, a sinister insectoid creature pounces, wrapping his pointed tail around the warrior's throat. Imperfect Cell cackles that it looks like it's the end of the line for Trunks, since he'll be borrowing his time machine to go absorb the androids of the past. From behind Cell, the mechanical voice asks why not start with an android from this time, as Sixteen springs his trap and blasts the bug with a hell's flash. Cell screams, and Trunks uses this opportunity to draw his key sword and make two decisive cuts, the first to sever Cell's tail, freeing himself, and the second to take the bio-android's head. As his body flops to the ground, Cell's head demands to know what is going on, since his data indicates that Trunks was weaker than him, and Sixteen was still dormant. Trunks replies that unfortunately for the bio-android, another version of Cell from the future already tried killing him and going back to the past. But together with his friends, he managed to kill that Cell, and prepared this little ambush just in case another version was skulking around, wanting to try the same dirty trick. Cell begins to panic, recognising that he is quite literally up to his neck in trouble, and so drawing on the raddits in him, tries to entice Trunks with an offer. He says that if he understands correctly, Saiyans love to fight strong opponents, so why not let him go? Then he'll go absorb the androids, and come back here so they can have one last spectacular battle, man versus machine. For a moment it looks like Trunks is considering it, but then when the half Saiyan shifts to the side, Sol realises that Trunks' expression was merely because he had the sun in his eyes, and more importantly, that he is doomed. Without a word, Trunks lobs Cell's head into the air, and Sixteen is there to catch it, using a single rocket-powered punch to turn the last fragment of the ultimate life form into nothing more than dust. The pair of friends then depart into the sunset. They still have a lot of rebuilding to do, and many of their scars will never heal. But they have each other in Bulma, and finally, after so many hellish years, they have returned their world to peace. Wahaha! <laughs> Kneel before King Piccolo. The Demon King, who ravaged Earth long ago, now stands before his old enemy, Son Goku, once more. Having fused with all his sinister spawn, Piccolo's power has grown exponentially, so that now even lesser villains serve him. However, the Saiyan warrior is not afraid, and with a lopsided grin, Goku asks his comrades if they think he should do as Piccolo says. A gruff male voice barks that he better not if he has any respect for his Saiyan heritage, while a much silkier voice replies that he disagrees. Kneel, then tear the green man's throat out when he least expects it. The first voice retorts that such a tactic would be disgraceful, but the second speaker laughs he should really take that up with his eldest son, since he learned it from him. The first speaker growls, and Goku chuckles they need to break it up, since they're meant to be fighting Piccolo, not each other. Both voices agree, and so with two swift motions appear at the Saiyan's side. The first of them is a fellow Saiyan warrior, sharing Goku's hair and build, but with a much more callous demeanour, Bardock. The other is Perfect Cell, a smug smirk on the bug's lips, as he scoffs that he can't believe he's been reduced to Hell's janitor, before reminding Goku that he better not be late filling out his work release paperwork this month. 
Goku teases that he knows Cell loves these chances to help fight strong villains, but Bardock snaps at them both to shut up and focus on Piccolo. Piccolo, however, sneers that no, don't stop on his account. Their buffoonery reminds him of a jester he once had before he had the man killed, so he's happy to watch their show before he delivers them the same fate. Goku grins that he's afraid that's not going to happen, so Piccolo can either stop causing trouble or they will stop him and he can spend the next 10,000 years in a prison cell. Piccolo jeers that he would like to see Goku try, reminding him that last time they fought, he left the Saiyan near death, and since then he's grown thousands of times in strength. However, this doesn't phase Goku, who replies that yeah, so is he, as he transforms into a Super Saiyan. Piccolo, unable to sense Ki, is unimpressed by this, right up until Goku launches up at him and with a single punch sends the Namekian flying. This startles Piccolo's followers who begin to flee, but this is why Cell and Bardock are here, and with lightning fast precision, they subdue the baddies as Goku joins them with an unconscious King Piccolo slung over his shoulder. Goku then thanks his two companions for their assistance, but Bardock nods that he's always happy to fight alongside Kakarot. While Cell leers, he's just building up strength for the day when he can finally kill Goku, thus fulfilling his original programming. Bardock growls that if Cell tries, he'll be erased before he even gets within a foot of Kakarot. But Goku laughs that he knows Cell doesn't mean it. He's too smart to still be following Jiro's orders after all this time. And to be honest, he's actually a pretty okay guy, and a fun sparring partner too. Cell storms away, as if the praise of a hero disgusts him, but the Saiyans think they see a small grin on his face as he goes. Returning the captured villains to the Ogre Seers who oversee this part of Hell, Goku takes a seat by the bloody pond. It has been seven years since he was sent here, and not a day has gone by where he hasn't missed those he left behind. In his heart, he knows he made the right choice, but those early days in particular were hard. Hell was... Well, a hellscape, and no matter how hard he tried to stand up to the villains wrecking havoc, he was only one man against an unending tide. Thankfully, after a while he managed to make some allies. At first Bardock was just looking for a fight to entertain himself, but when he learned who Goku was and all that he'd achieved, both in life and here in hell, he was eager to join him. Cell came a while later, initially to avoid being put through the soul cleansing machine, but in time he too became a valuable member of Goku's Hellfighters, using his power and vast array of techniques not only to help them stop bad guys, but also to push Goku and Bardock to always grow stronger. Together the three of them have managed to restore Hell to a relative level of peace, to the point where if Goku is to be stuck here forever, it won't be altogether terrible. Goku's reminiscing is then cut short by a tap on the shoulder from Mez, as the ogre tells him that he has a visitor. Curious as to who this might be, Goku follows the Red Oni over to a nearby cave where a cloaked figure is waiting. Pulling down the hood, Goku is surprised to see that his visitor is none other than Shin. The Supreme Kai greets Goku placidly, and Goku nods his own greeting. Shin then says that he hopes Goku holds him no ill will for banishing him here, since he was simply doing what he had to. Goku says he understands, but he hopes that in turn Shin understands that he was doing likewise when he left the lookout to save his son. Shin nods, and so Goku asks why he is here, saying that he doubts the Supreme Kai came all this way just to check if they're still friends after seven years. Shin sighs that Goku is right. He's come with a proposition. Right now on Earth, a powerful wizard is trying to awaken a terrible threat named Majin Buu, and as it stands, Shin feels that he cannot prevent this alone. So if Goku is willing to use the single day he is entitled to back in the living world to help him stop the revival of Buu, then when they return to Otherworld, Shin will see to it that Goku is released from hell and allowed to come train on his world once again. Goku doesn't hesitate, agreeing as soon as Shin finishes speaking. Shrewdly, the Supreme Kai states that Goku would have agreed even if there had been no reward, wouldn't he? And when Goku confirms this, Shin smiles that this is why he is the best man for the job. He then calls for his associate to come out, and from the shadow steps a figure Goku knows well, Fortune Teller Baba. Baba grouses that time is money, so the Supreme Kai better be paying her handsomely to be wasting her time in a dump like this, to which Shin nods that he will see to it that Baba is properly compensated for her services. This is good enough for the witch, and so with a wrinkly smile she greets Goku at last, asking how he's holding up. Goku says that he's been alright, and Baba nods approvingly, saying that she knows her brother and his students have missed him, so they'll be happy to have him back. In fact, if Goku's willing to give her a little kickback, she'd be willing to notify the other Z Fighters of his return so they can all meet him up on the lookout. Shin tells her to add it to his tab, since if they're going after Babidi and Boo, it would pay to have all of Goku's powerful friends to help them. 
Baba says she'll do it, and then with a wave of her hand, informs the two men that Goku should be able to traverse the living world for the next 24 hours without being pulled back into other world. The Kai politely thanks her for her assistance, as Baba teleports herself away, and as she goes, her parting words are a warning not to tarry when it comes to paying her. Shin then asks Goku if he's ready to go, and the Saiyan says that he is, holding out an arm for the Supreme Kai before teleporting them away with Kai Kai. Moments later, Goku and Shin appear on the lookout, and unable to contain himself, Goku lets out an excited Yahoo after so many long years away. This draws the attention of the lookout's inhabitants, with Mr. Popo rushing outside and gasping when he sees who it is. At a much slower pace comes Gohan, now a man in his own right, and when he sees Goku, tears fill his glassy eyes, and with a hoarse cry he runs up and wraps Goku in a hug. The young man then begins to sob that he's sorry, so so sorry for what happened, but Goku just pats him on the back, saying that it's alright, and he's happy to see him too. Popo then approaches with a smile, saying he doesn't know how Goku managed it, but he's happy to have him back, offering Goku his old guardian staff. Goku looks surprised, saying that isn't that Gohan's now? But Popo shakes his head sadly, saying that the young master continues to decline the position. Goku asks Gohan if that's true, and Gohan pulls away from his father to nod. Only now does Goku get a better look at his son's disheveled state, from the faded baggy clothes, to the messy hair, pallid skin, and even the lifelessness in his heavily shadowed eyes. Heartbreaking, Goku asks what happened, and in a sympathetic tone, Mr. Popo says that the boy never really got over losing his parents. Goku isn't sure what to say, but he doesn't have time to figure it out, as moments later a trio of warriors land on the lookout. Goku goes over to greet Tien and Raditz, who both express their delight at having their leader back, before looking down at the youngest and smallest of the group. After a moment, Goku gasps and staggers back comedically, saying that this kid is Trunks, which the boy confirms, saying that he's really excited to finally meet Uncle Kakarot, and that he wants to fight the man right now. In a stern voice, Tien says the boy's name, and Trunks blushes a little, bowing to both Goku and Tien and apologizing for his impertinence, even going so far as to call Tien master. Goku laughingly asks what that's all about, and Tien explains that after he lost his arm, he thought he'd have to retire as a martial artist, but Bulma and Raz decide to hire him as Trunks' martial arts instructor. Raditz beams that it's great. As well as learning how to be strong from him, Trunks is also getting an understanding of martial arts, so he'll never be outdone like the Saiyans were when they first came to Earth. Even suggesting that as it stands, Trunks might be able to take Gohan in a fight. Goku smirks that his brother is dreaming. Has he forgotten that form Gohan pulled out in the Cell games? Even he couldn't match that. However, this makes Raditz sad, and he admits that he doesn't think Gohan can access that form anymore. In fact, he doesn't even know if Gohan still trains these days. Goku is floored by this, and Raditz hastily apologizes, saying that he tried to be there for his nephew since Goku was sent to hell, but no matter what he tried, Gohan just grew more and more distant. Goku nods that he knows Raditz would have tried his best, and thanks him for being there for Gohan. The former Guardian then looks around as he feels two more strong powers approaching the lookout. It's Krillin and Nappa rounding out the group. When they land, Krillin is the first to act, running up to his best friend. He smiles that he missed him, and Goku grins that the feeling's mutual. He then asks if he's been keeping up in his training, and Krillin says that he has, though he's pretty sure he's way behind all the Saiyans at this point. Nappa grins that he still wouldn't want to run into the little guy in a dark alley, but Krillin chuckles that Nappa's just saying that. Now it is Nappa's turn to greet Goku, and the pair of Saiyans clasp hands, with Goku asking what the bald man's been up to for the past seven years. Nappa smiles that after the battle with Cell, he devoted himself to finding a form of power that doesn't require muscles or transformations, since even when he pushed himself to the max, he was no match for the monster. This led him to studying the spiritual side of martial arts with Roshi, and eventually he remembered hearing of a world Frieza had wanted to annex, that supposedly was inhabited by a race of monks with mystic powers. It took him ages to get there by pod, but it was well worth it, since when he arrived on planet Yardrat, he met a guru named Pabara who taught him to truly master his spirit and channel it into a number of abilities for both daily life and combat. Goku sighs that he wishes he could have undertaken the training with him, but Nappa chuckles that he isn't sure he could handle it, since it required a lot of stillness and meditation, things Saiyans aren't normally very good at. His brow then furrows, and in a solemn voice, Nappa asks if Goku ever encountered Vegeta or any other Saiyans in Hell. 
Goku replies that he did meet Bardock, but that's about it. Though he does admit that in the early days of his team, he did seek out Vegeta hoping they could team up again, but no matter where he looked, he couldn't find the prince. Nappa asks what that could mean, and Goku shrugs that it most likely means Vegeta's already had his soul cleansed and been reincarnated, though it's possible that somewhere out there, Vegeta's alive. This makes Nappa smile, and he thanks Goku for sharing that with him. But before more can be said, Shin clears his throat, saying that now everyone is here, they have no time to waste in stopping Boo's revival. Shin suggests that in order to find the wizard Babidi, they'll need to trick one of the wizard's minions into siphoning some of their energy and leading them back to the villain's base. But Goku says that won't be necessary, since if Babidi and his cronies are on Earth, then his guardian powers should be able to locate them. The Supreme Kai admits that he didn't think of that, and Goku flashes him a grin before closing his eyes and focusing. It takes less than a minute for Goku to find the hideout, simply having searched for the most evil key on the planet, and with a smile, he tells his friends and family to follow him. After so long apart, it is exhilarating for the Z Fighters to fly in formation again, even if several of their number are no longer with them. Before long, Goku, Gohan, Raditz, Trunks, Nappa, Krillin, Tien, and Shin land outside Babidi's ship. It is deadly still, and with a slightly furrowed brow, Raditz asks his brother if he's sure this is the place. With deadly seriousness, Shin replies that it definitely is, since up close he can feel Babidi's evil presence, as well as several other terrifying warriors, including the king of the demon realm, Dabura. Goku grins that Shin shouldn't sweat it, since he's already taken out one Demon King today, so what's another? But the Supreme Kai vehemently tells him that if he underestimates Dabura, it will surely mean death for him and all his friends. Nappa asks why they can't just blow up the ship from out here, but Shin says this is out of the question, since such force might cause Buu to awaken, and then the universe will be destroyed. This shuts the bald man up, and so with the utmost caution, the group approach the ship. As soon as they step inside, a hatch opens up in the floor, and a high-pitched voice that they all assume is Bubbity's speaks to them telepathically. Smugly, the voice welcomes them all to his ship, and says that he is waiting for them at the lowest level of the vessel. However, to reach him, they will have to face three of his strongest fighters. At this, the full-blooded Sands and Trunks grin, saying that this keeps getting better and better, but this just amuses Barbadi, who instructs them to head down the chute when they are ready, promising that their opponent in stage one is already waiting for them. With varying levels of eagerness, the group descend through the hatch as Babidi instructed, and when they land, it is in a circular room with a strange lanky alien waiting for them. The alien proudly declares that he is Pui Pui, one of Master Babidi's top guys, second only to Dabura, before goading them all to come at him at once. Not that they'll stand a chance, even if they all fight together. Goku, however, declines this offer, saying it'll be more fair if they do these matches as one-on-ones, before asking who wants to play him in rock, paper, scissors for the right to fight Pui Pui. In unison, Shin and Pui Pui face fall, while Raditz, Nappa, and Trunks all say they'll play for a chance to fight. On the other hand, the humans step back, saying they don't think they're up for it anymore, while Gohan joins them, mumbling something about just getting in the way. This reaction from his son disappoints Goku, but nonetheless, he, Raditz, Nappa, and Trunks all put their hands in the middle to begin their game. As luck would have it, Nappa wins on the third attempt, and so he is granted the right to fight Pui Pui. The alien jeers that one beefy bald guy can't stand a chance against the mighty Pui Pui, but is promptly proved wrong when a single punch from Nappa turns him into a stain on the wall. Growling with frustration, Nappa requests a redo, since he didn't realise the guy would be so weak and he didn't even get to show off all the cool spirit control powers he's learned. The others laugh that maybe if one of them loses he can step in, but this was his fight, and it's not their fault that he finished prematurely. With a very steamed Nappa in tow, the group then move on to the second level. At first it seems like no one is here, but then from a side hatch, a great green monster with a foul odour steps into the room. In his raspy voice, the creature calls himself Yakon, and demands to know who his next victim will be. And Raditz, who has just won the next game of Rock Paper Scissors, steps up, saying that he was just about to ask the same question. The two warriors then face off, with Raditz leaping forward at such speeds that he seems to vanish, before appearing above Yakon, and dropping an elbow onto the beast's forehead. Yakon recoils in pain, and telepathically Babidi contacts his minion, asking if he would like him to send this fight to the World of Darkness so Yakon can have the advantage. Yakon eagerly agrees, and so moments later, the fighters all find themselves in pitch darkness. Yakon cackles that now the battle is all but won, since only he can see in this gloom. 
Using his surprising speed, he then leaps at Raditz and attempts to decapitate him with one of his extendable claws. The Saiyan is able to duck under this thanks to sensing the monster's energy, and with a note of panic in his voice, Yakon asks how this is possible. Smirking, Raditz replies that darkness means nothing to warriors who can sense energy. However, he would like to see the look on Yakon's ugly mug when he blows him away, so he might as well turn on the lights. He then powers up into Super Saiyan, and as the golden aura flares, Yakon gurgles that it looks delicious. To the side, Tien comments that this is an odd thing to say, but all becomes clear when Yakon begins to suck up the shining Super Saiyan aura. The monster then snarls that how will Raditz beat a foe who can eat all his energy, but instead of panicking, Raditz grins that Yakon can eat up since he's got plenty to spare. In fact, thanks to his android heart, he has infinite energy. Yakon calls this a bluff. No one can have infinite energy, but Raditz smirks that if the beast won't take his word for it, he'll just have to prove it, and with a yell begins to power up to the max. As his Super Saiyan aura floods the room, everyone is able to see their new cavernous surroundings, but this is not what interests Goku. At the last second, just as Yakon is about to burst from all the ki now funneling into him, Raditz's aura takes on an electric quality, with arcing bolts of blue lightning emanating from the long-haired warrior. This makes Goku smile, and though his brother is not looking at him, he gives him an approving nod, impressed that someone else found that level. In a matter of seconds, Yakon explodes, and as the room returns to the way it was when they entered, Raditz allows his Super Saiyan state to drop, saying that all the guys in this ship are pushovers. Trunks beams that his dad is the coolest, and Raditz pats the boy's head, before turning to Goku and Shin, asking if they're ready to ascend to the next floor. Goku nods, and so when the way forward opens up, they head lower into the ship. Waiting for them at stage 3 is none other than the Demon King Dabura, who the Supreme Kai warned them about. In his deep bass voice, the Demon King demands to know the identity of the fool who sees fit to challenge him. And Goku tells him just a sec, before he and Trunks square up for a quick game of rock, paper, scissors. Sweat dropping at being ignored like that, Dabura watches the Elder Saiyan beats his nephew, and so steps up to fight, while the boy goes to sulk in a corner. Or at least the closest thing to a corner one can find in a round room. Goku then grins that he guesses he'll be fighting Dabura after all, inviting the demon to make the first move. Dabura leers that if he's going to underestimate him, it will be the last move, as he lunges at Goku. However, the former guardian is able to catch the blow without trouble, and then retaliates with a knee to the gut. Dabura staggers back, and so Goku presses his advantage, moving in and delivering a few more body blows. Unwilling to be backed into a corner, Dabura waits for a gap between strikes, and vanishes behind the Saiyan, hurling an energy blast which burns his back. Goku howls in pain, then spins around to face the demon again, leaping into the air and hooking a kick under his bearded chin to drag him up with him. The pair then begin a brief exchange of blows in mid-air, before breaking apart in preparation for the next salvo. Using his demonic magic, Dabura summons a wicked curved sword, which he levels at Goku. However, this only makes the Saiyan grin, saying that if Dabura's done with the warm-up, then sure, he's willing to fight him seriously. He then powers up to Super Saiyan, and drives a punch into the demon's cheek, which sends him reeling. Goku next fires off a beam barrage, and as each blast hits, they drive Dabura into the floor where he is pinned helplessly. As the barrage ceases, and the bedraggled demon is finally allowed to crawl out of the crater his body created, Goku whines that he thought Dabura was holding back, but if not, he might as well end this, since he doesn't want anything weird to happen like when it got all dark during Raditz's fight. He then begins charging up a Kamehameha, and though Shin yells at him to stop, since such an attack could wake Boo, it is already too late as Goku opens fire, destroying Dabura, the floor he's standing on, and even Babidi on the next level down. The entire ship shakes under the force of this blast, and when Goku finally floats down to his allies, Raditz lambasts his little brother for getting too caught up in the fight and forgetting why they're here in the first place. Scratching the back of his head and giggling with faint embarrassment, Goku admits that it kinda slipped his mind, but at least Dabura is dealt with. Shin nods gravely at this, sighing that they can only hope that Kamehameha did not wind up unleashing the very evil they came here to prevent. The warriors then descend into the wreckage of Babidi's inner sanctum, bracing themselves for what they might find. Thankfully, all they see is stillness, until a faint rattling from behind a burned doorway catches their attention. Moving as one, they approach the door, and inside they find a large, pulsating egg. A shiver runs down Shin's spine as he breathes that this is really the container of Majin Buu. Nappa asks if he wants them to squash it, but the offer is premature, when the source for the rattling sound makes itself known as Boo's egg rocks back and forth. 
terror in his voice, the lilac-skinned Kai shrieks that it's too late, and at that exact moment, the rim of the egg bursts open. From it erupts a gout of pink steam, and with a scoff, Trunks asks if this is all Boo is, a big pink fart. But Shin, still panicked, tells the youth not to be flippant, since he is about to witness the greatest terror this universe has ever known. And good to his word, the smoke does begin to coagulate, slowly but surely taking a humanoid form, so that soon our heroes are face to face with a terrifying Margin Boo, and as the menace stares back at them, no one can quite believe their eyes. Margin Boo, the destroyer of worlds, nightmare of the Supreme Kai's is... a big pink fatso with a baby face and a floppy tentacle instead of hair? This is it? Hardly what one would call intimidating. The heroes begin to express these sentiments, smiling that Shin got worked up about nothing like with Dabura and Babidi, but the Supreme Kai protests that they must destroy Boo now, before he goes on a rampage. Boo, who has been standing around staring into space since the encounter began, looks over at the Kai when he hears his name, and points to himself with one mitten-clad hand, as if asking whether Shin really means him. Shin shrieks when Boo's eyes fall upon him, and he starts to back away, but Goku laughs that he's overreacting as he steps between them and extends a hand for Boo to shake. After a moment of confusion, Boo obliges, smiling that his name Boo, who Orange Man? Goku introduces himself and his friends, before telling Shin that he should come over and say hi, since Boo's not such a bad guy. Shin, however, will not be convinced, saying that this monster is the one who killed his brethren, and absorbed his friend and mentor, the Grand Supreme Kai. Goku nods that this is pretty bad, but maybe Boo's changed after being asleep for so long. After all, he's always in a better mood after a nice long nap. Those who know Goku laugh that this is such a him thing to say, while Trunks sweat drops that his dad never mentioned Uncle Kakarot was a moron. Nappa then cuts in, saying that he has an idea, why not allow him to try one of the Yardradian techniques on Boo, specifically Force Spirit Fission, which may allow him to extract this Grand Supreme Kai from within Boo. Shin says it's worth a try, but is still uneasy, and so insists that they do it in a controlled environment. Goku offers the lookout, and Shin nods that that would be acceptable. The former Guardian then looks back at Boo, saying that they're all going to go somewhere together and he wants Boo to follow them. Boo asks if there will be candy there, and Goku grins he's sure they'll be able to find him some candy. Boo excitedly claps his hands that he wants candy now, and Goku tells him that he can have some as soon as they arrive, but he has to promise to stay close to them the whole way up. Boo agrees, and so Goku followed by the rest of the Z Fighters, Shin, and Majin Boo head up to the lookout. When they arrive, Goku tells Boo to stand in the center of the lookout's courtyard and let his friend Nappa do his work. Boo petulantly protests that he wants candy now, and Goku chuckles that he guesses he did promise that. Gohan says he'll get it, and so slinks out of sight, even his movements conveying a world weariness that troubles Goku. And so saying that he's gonna get some candy for Boo as well, the Saiyan follows his son. Cornering him in the kitchen, Goku says that he and Gohan need to talk. Gohan cocks his head, and Goku tells him that he can't go on like this, blaming himself for what happened to him and Chi Chi at the Cell Games. Sorrow fills Gohan's glassy eyes, and he asks how he's supposed to not blame himself, when if not for his weakness, his mum would still be alive, and Goku wouldn't have had to throw away his freedom to come save him. Goku lays a hand on his son's shoulder, and with a soft smile says that both he and Chi Chi made their own choices, and they did it because they love him, and want him to have a long and happy life. The last thing either of them wanted was to be chains weighing down his spirit, and if that's what they did, then he's sorry. By the end of his little speech, tears are running down Gohan's cheeks, and so Goku pulls him into a hug, telling him that everything is alright. He's here. Between sobs, Gohan apologizes for losing his way, but Goku just pats him on the back, saying that he's not mad that Gohan got lost, he's sad that his actions caused his son so much pain, and more than that, he's proud that Gohan's finding his way back. Unfortunately, this moment is cut short by Trunks, who pops his head into the kitchen and tells the two men to come outside quick, since he thinks Nappa screwed up. Goku and Gohan follow the black-haired boy into the courtyard, and lo and behold, something is definitely wrong. Boo is emitting a lot of pink smoke, just like the stuff that came out of the egg, and when Raditz runs over to brief them, he explains that the moment Nappa pulled the Grand Supreme Kai out of Boo, the stuff just came bursting out of him like steam out of a kettle. Snapping into leader mode, Goku asks if anyone knows what the steam is, primarily directing his question at Shin as the Margin Boo expert of the group. 
However, the Supreme Kai is freaking out, saying that he never should have allowed this to happen. And when Goku snaps at him to focus, Shin pulls himself together just enough to say that without the Grand Supreme Kai's good influence, Boo will be reverting back to the muscle-bound monster he was when he attacked the sacred world of the Kai's eons ago. By now the pink smoke has completely enveloped Boo, and so everyone retreats to the edge of the lookout so they can get a better look at what's about to emerge. It is only now that Goku sees the rotund figure with a striking resemblance to Shin, who must be the Grand Supreme Kai. This is hardly the time for introductions, and so he keeps his eye on the place Boo must be. Finally the smoke begins to dissipate, and from it comes jolts of pink electricity, as well as the sound of laughter, though this voice is much lower pitched than Boo's childish one. Then, from out of the smoke steps a much taller, leaner, and more muscular Boo. Super Boo has been reborn. Boo then snarls that Goku didn't bring him candy like he promised. But no matter, Boo will just make him into candy instead. The Jin then fires a candy beam at Goku, but the Saiyan is able to power up into Super Saiyan and deflect the beam with a blast of his own. This only infuriates Boo, who screams that if the heroes will not be candy for Boo, then they will be corpses when he destroys them. He then lunges at the group, eager to sate his hunger for battle, even if his physical hunger cannot be yet met. Raditz and Trunks power up into Super Saiyan like Goku has, while Nappy uses spirit control to double his size without increasing his bulk. Krillin tries to join them despite lacking any transformations, while Tien being the sensible one, simply escorts the Kais away from the fighting, so Boo cannot consume them. Gohan tries to power up into a Super Saiyan rage state, but after seven years of trying to numb his own pain, such strong emotions don't come as easily as they used to. This leaves him feeling impotent and useless once again, only feeding into the demons that have been plaguing the young man. Boo spots this weakness, and so targets Gohan, stretching an arm out to deliver a fatal punch to his throat. Thankfully, Goku spots this, and so extending his power pole, smacks into Boo's arm, splitting it in half and saving Gohan. Urgently, Gohan apologizes for being such a burden, but his father firmly tells him to keep his mind on the battle. The Saiyans then all converge on Boo as one, battering him with a coordinated volley of punches and kicks that actually seem to agitate the margin. So much so in fact that he decides to pull out his ace in the hole. From behind them, Boo's severed arm then floats up into the air and shoots at the Saiyans, opening up to become a bubblegum maw eager to consume one of them. As the only one not currently engaged with Boo, Krillin steps up to deal with the pink projectile, and so fires a series of blasts into the part of Boo which was once an arm. However, all Krillin's blasts manage to do is make small pinpricks in the pink goo, and before the human can even scream, the mass of goopy flesh is upon him, coating him, and then consuming him. The Saiyans scream Krillin's name, but it's already too late, as the blob then flies into Boo, melding with him. Boo's power then spikes exponentially, as his form shifts to include an elongated head tentacle and Krillin's turtle school tunic. Now everyone understands why Shin is so afraid of this monster, since by simply absorbing the weakest member of their group, he has grown to a level unlike anything the heroes have ever seen. Nappa knowing that this is a losing battle, splits himself in four and grabs onto Trunks, while his clones grab Goku, Gohan and Raditz. As one, the four Nappas then each use instant transmission to get them all out of there, locking onto Tien's power level and hoping he and the Kais have found them somewhere safe to regroup. As it happens, Tien's chosen hiding place is Kame House, a wise choice all things being equal. When the Saiyans arrive, Master Roshi waddles up and wraps Goku in a hug, saying that he never got a chance to say goodbye last time, or tell him how proud he is of the warrior he became. Goku apologizes for this oversight, saying that he's happy to see Roshi too, though he wishes it were under better circumstances. Roshi nods gravely, then says the Z Fighters are welcome to use his home as a sanctuary for however long they need. Here Shin sighs that hiding won't do them much good, since Goku will need to return to the other world in a matter of hours, and even if he didn't, leaving Boo unchecked will surely mean doom for Earth. Gritting his teeth, Goku says that in that case, there's nothing to do but fight, calling it his last act as guardian. Shin reminds Goku what will happen if he dies while already dead, and the Saiyan proudly states that he doesn't care, he's not going to stand by and let others suffer if he can help them. This declaration heartens the other warriors, with Raditz, Nappa, Trunks, Tien and Gohan all declaring that they're with Goku. Goku smiles that this is great to hear, since he doesn't have a clue how they're meant to beat Boo. Roshi suggests that they try the Mafuba, but the now reunified Nappa sighs that he doesn't think any of them have the power to seal Boo without dying in the process. 
a grim mood sets in among the group, with everyone knowing that if they go with this plan, it'll be a one-way trip for one of them. However, everyone here is willing to give their life for Earth, and so has decided they will try it. Raditz immediately forbids Trunks from joining them in this battle, but the boy has inherited his mother's temper, and so begins to yell at his father that he is a Saiyan warrior just like him, so he should be able to fight. This quickly descends into a screaming match between father and son, and while this is going on, Gohan approaches Shin to request a favour. Shin, who still has a great deal of fondness for the young man after their time studying together, asks what Gohan needs, and Gohan requests that Shin make him new clothes, like he did when they were in the sacred world of the Kais, though this time he would like to have the same outfit his dad is wearing, except with the kanji on the breast changed from guardian to successor. Shin nods that this should be easy enough, and so with a wave of his hand, transforms Gohan's clothes into Goku's blue gi and white robes as requested. Gohan thanks Shin for this, but the Supreme Kai stops him, asking if he would also like him to remove the burn scars lining Gohan's arm from when Super Saiyan Rage tore away at his body. Gohan smiles that he appreciates the offer, but declines, choosing to keep them as a memento of his past mistakes and those he lost because of them. Though, he thinks after years of trying to cover them up, he's finally ready to show them to the world. Shin nods that in that case, he would not dare to change them, allowing Gohan to return to his family and get ready for the counterattack. Ultimately, it is decided that Tien, Shin, and the Grand Supreme Kai will stay at Kame House, while Goku, Gohan, Reddit, Snapper, and Trunks will go to the lookout. However, Trunks will not engage Boo directly, with his job being to provide covering fire from afar. It is also understood that if something goes wrong, he is to return to Kame House and alert Tien and the Kais at once. With everyone clear on their roles, the Saiyans head off to what will be their final confrontation with Boo, one way or the other. Boo is waiting for the heroes when they arrive, having already decimated much of the lookout by turning its trees and cobbles into candy. When he sees them, the pink menace licks his lips that all that candy has made him thirsty, so now he's going to turn them all into soda and drink them up. Raditz growls that he'd like to see Boo try, then with a yell, begins transforming. Like usual, he powers up to Super Saiyan, but this is not where he stops, pushing further beyond to reveal Super Saiyan 2, with arcing lightning now dancing through his golden aura. Goku smiles that he thought he saw his brother reach that form during the fight with Yakon, and with a grunt, powers up to Super Saiyan 2 as well. Reddit's jaw hits the floor when he sees this, demanding to know how this is possible, when he had to strive for ages to unlock this form. Giggling a little, Goku says that after spending the better part of a decade fighting the worst hell has to offer, he has developed a few new tricks to stay ahead of the curve. A little myth that his big reveal was undercut, Raditz admits that he does actually have a form beyond this, and so with a mighty scream begins powering up further. His already wild hair grows longer, his eyebrows disappear, and with a final yell, Raditz reveals Super Saiyan 3. Everyone is awed by this power. Everyone except Goku, who says that yeah, he unlocked this too, though he's impressed Raditz managed without being dead, since he figured it would take the infinite energy of Otherworld to draw out something like that. Positively seething now, Raditz reminds his brother that he has an infinite energy engine thanks to his heart transplant from Android 16. Goku laughs that he forgot about that, then grins that he wonders if it'll allow Raditz to keep up with him in this form. Goku then performs a long world shaking scream of his own, and in a flash of light, he too becomes a Super Saiyan 3, with his new long hair making his resemblance to Raditz all the more striking. The brothers then size each other up, comparing hair length and brow depth, but from behind them, Nappa demands to know why these two knuckleheads didn't use this form in the first fight with Boo. Goku admits that he was worried it might cut his time on Earth, but now that they have a plan, it doesn't really matter. Reddit smirks that at least that's one area he has Kakarot beat, and Goku chuckles that in that case, why don't they make it interesting? Whoever defeats Boo first is the superior warrior. Reddit grins that he's on, and so has won the pair of Super Saiyan 3's leap at Boo. Nappa and Gohan follow close behind, with Trunks doing as he's told and attacking from afar. However, Boo is ready for this, and using some of the new strength and intelligence he gained from Krillin, targets Nappa first, deeming his spirit control power to be the biggest threat after they already radically altered him once. A single punch is all it takes to send the bald sand crashing through the floor of the courtyard and into the bowels of the lookout. However, this leaves the monster briefly vulnerable, an opportunity which both Goku and Raditz capitalize on, appearing behind Boo and each delivering a spin kick to the back of his head. The force is enough to split Boo in two, but even this is not a fatal blow for the margin, as he simply reconstitutes into two smaller Boos and begins fighting Goku and Raditz individually. 
Gohan tries to help here, firing a pair of Kamehamehas at the booze, but in his base form, the blasts do little more than irritate the pink monsters. In this halved state, Goku and Rats are able to fight the boos evenly, even having a slight upper hand. However, this boo isn't just smarter and stronger thanks to absorbing Krillin, he is also wilier, and so puts this to good use by using Solar Flare on the brothers when they least expect it. Goku and Reddits recoil, and in this vulnerable state, Boo prepares to absorb them too. Trunks and Gohan try desperately to save their fathers, combining their strength for a cousin's double Sunday, and for one brief moment they think they have succeeded as the blast blows the Boos to chunks. However, this victory turns to ash in their mouths when the goopy globs immediately reform into a single complete Boo. This Boo has no trouble absorbing the staggered Saiyans, first Raditz, and then Goku soon after. At once, Boo's power skyrockets to a level that makes his previous state seem negligible, as two mighty warriors, one carrying God Key and the other an infinite energy engine, unwillingly lend their strength to the margin. Horror fills Gohan and he falls to his knees, but in contrast, Trunks is filled with white-hot rage, and ignoring his father's orders, he charges at Boo, declaring that he will be the one who kills him. It is a brave effort, a brave, foolish effort. It takes Boo no time at all to extend a hand and absorb the boy as soon as he is in range, and with his cousin now lost as well, Gohan finds himself completely alone. From where he is standing, Boo begins to cackle that victory is his, this world is his, everything is his, since no one can stand against the great margin Boo. However, his monologue is cut short by Gohan, who in a small trembling voice says that he will stop him. This only makes Boo laugh harder, as he declares that he has seen the memories of everyone he has absorbed, and Gohan is no threat to him. He then shifts his face into that of Goku's, and in the former Guardian's voice taunts that in the fight against Frieza, Gohan was too weak, and Goku had to save the day. In the fight against Cell, Gohan was still too weak, and Goku had to save the day again. Goku's gone now, so who's gonna save the day this time? Voice no longer shaking, Gohan replies, I am, as this final insult to his father's legacy allows him to reawaken the fury he had buried under years of sorrow. The young man's hair then shines golden, and as he rises to his feet, his eyes are blank, and his power is immense. He has finally rediscovered Super Saiyan Rage. A drop of sweat forms on Boo's brow at this, but he continues to keep up his bravado, during this is just another Super Saiyan form, and he's beaten stronger Super Saiyans today already, so now he'll do it again. However, it seems that Gohan disagrees. As quick as a flash, he appears in front of Boo, punching clean through him and declaring, No, now you'll die. The Half Saiyan then delivers a roundhouse kick which sends Boo flying, before dashing forward and delivering an elbow drop to slam the Jin into the ground. Boo tries to retaliate, swinging punches wildly in his fury at being humiliated, but Gohan catches each of them and gives a few back in return to really rub salt into the wound. Finally, Boo collapses under the weight of these blows, and in a ragged voice, the Margin demands to know what sort of monster Gohan is. In response, Gohan readies a Kamehameha, feeling the strength of all the people he loves behind him, as he proudly declares that he's a Saiyan, he's an Earthling, and he's the guardian of this world. The young hybrid then opens fire, and Boo rallies the last of his strength for a counterattack. If he can just deflect this blow, then Gohan will be spent and he can absorb him too, meaning that he truly will be invincible. However, before he can act, a gruff voice from beneath him snarls, Not so fast. Looking down, Boo sees that he is on the edge of the hole he made when he punched Nappa, and the bald Saiyan now has a grip on his ankle. That dirty sneak Gohan planned this all along, didn't he? In a ringing voice, Gohan cries for Nappa to do it now, and the Elder Saiyan complies, channeling the last of his strength to use Force Spirit Fission on Boo. Boo feels all the warriors he's absorbed tumble out of him, and begins to panic, not knowing what he'll become next. However, the answer to that is very simple. Boo will become dust, as without the stolen strength of his victims, he is unable to withstand Gohan's godly Kamehameha, and is completely obliterated. It takes only an instant for Boo to die, but the moments that come after feel like centuries, as the Z-Warriors wait to see whether the monster will reform. When he doesn't, smiles and laughter begin to break out among the group. Everyone begins to hug and cheer at the defeat of Majin Boo, and before long, Tien, Roshi, Shin, and the Grand Supreme Kai join them on the lookout to take part in the festivities. 
Alas, all good things must come to an end, and before long Baba appears as well, and tells Goku that because he used his Super Saiyan 3 state, his time in the living world has expired. Goku nods his understanding, saying goodbye to his loved ones for good this time, while behind him, the two Kais urge him not to be sad, with the Grand Supreme Kai even promising to share his secret technique with Goku if he wants. However, before Goku and the Kais can depart, Mr. Popo steps out of the lookout central building and asks if he can do one last thing before Goku goes. Rolling her eyes, Baba says she'll allow it, but he better make it quick. Popo promises that he will, then pulls out the Staff of the Guardian. Goku chuckles that he's flattered, but it doesn't seem right for him to have it since he's not Guardian anymore, a claim which Popo surprisingly agrees with. The genie then turns to Gohan and asks if he meant what he said before destroying Boo. With deep solemnity, the young man nods. Then, in the presence of his smiling family and friends, Gohan finally picks up the staff, beginning his long overdue guardianship and ushering in a bright new age for planet Earth.